Friday is 9 o'clock. If you make sure your cell phones are turned off or on, at least on mute. Good morning, everybody. I am Rob Bizzle, Chairman of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission, and would like to welcome you to our public comment session where you have a unique opportunity to, on the record, give comments in regards to the Marine Fishery Commission's management of the state's public trust, estuarine, and marine resources. I ask you to limit your comments to three minutes. You will be reminded when you have approximately 30 seconds left. Please state if you represent any group. If you addressed the commission last night, you will not be allowed to do so at this time. Remember, remember, this is a time to share a concern or gather information, not to be confrontational. Okay, first up is Ron McCoy, followed by Brent Fulcher. I'm Ryan McCoy from Wilmington. You can hear me okay? Yes, sir. I grew up surf fishing and pier fishing on the Crystal Coast. There were lots of fish. You can tell I'm pretty old. Today I inshore and surf fish around Topsail Island. Not a lot of fish. I attended your marine fisheries meeting in November and ended with, with my comments you should learn from other Atlantic and Gulf states. You spend years and months deciding where to put gill nets in our rivers and sounds. Learn from Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and make gill nets illegal, illegal in our rivers and sounds. You spend years and months deciding where large ocean shrimp trawlers can fish in our sounds. Learn from Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and put large ocean shrimp trawlers only, only in the ocean where they belong. You spend years and months deciding who should own a commercial fishing license. Learn from Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and only sell commercial license to true commercial fishermen that report all, all of their catches on trip tickets. Of the 5,000 plus commercial license you issue each year, less than 50% of them turn in trip tickets. Recreational fishermen too lazy to bait a hook? Stop letting them use commercial gear. Stop. You spend years and months discussing that there are too many recreational fishermen killing too many fish. Learn from Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia. South Carolina and better define who should own a recreational fishing license at what price, what gear can be used, how many fish can be kept daily on a designated season. You must think that these seven states don't know how to manage their saltwater resource. You have it right, they don't. These seven states made hard decisions to protect their saltwater resource in the 80s and 90s. That's 30 years ago, three decades of you, you and me watching our North Carolina saltwater resource seconds. population decline by over 80%. 80%. Stop protecting your user group, stop hiding in your fishery management plans, and make the hard decisions on gill nets, ocean shrimp trawlers, commercial licenses, and recreational fishing. The resource cannot manage itself. That's your job. And oh, your application, for incidental take permit to kill endangered sea turtles, shame on you. Shame on you. Time. Thank you, sir. Brent Fulcher, followed by Lisa McCracken. Brent Fulcher, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Chairman of North Carolina Fisheries Association, business owner, Traven, and 
Carteret County. Laura's giving y'all all a little form here. One of the spreadsheet that came from the division in 2022 strike mullet landings haven't been 100% verified, but I think they're going to be pretty close to that number. And the second sheet is landings from my facility in Beaufort, North Carolina this year from September 1st through the end of the year. And as you'll see, we landed over, over 512,000 pounds of striped mullet at one fish house, just one location in this state. And then on that front page, you see that North Carolina is showing that they've landed 2.7, in excess of 2.7 million pounds, which is the fifth largest year in history. The largest year was in 1993, which was 3,063,000 pounds. So we're basically 10% below the largest historical land as this state's ever had, but yet we're talking about a supplement, which is ludicrous. Uh, the time frame that was put on that sometime early November cutoff date is going to penalize every fisherman from basically divisions, location in, the state, in Moorhead City south to the state line. Those guys aren't going to get the opportunity to catch any fish. Everybody north of them, the fish, they've already harvested the fish, have moved south or they've moved out of the inlets. But that's, you're going to penalize those guys arbitrarily, unfairly. So I would like for all of you all to take a good look at this data and think very hard about making a decision on this supplement. Uh, I think it needs to be shot down. Your amendment's already laid out, uh, moving, going to move forward. Your stock's uh, not in trouble. You can see over the past three years it's been in increasing. In the years prior to that, you had hurricanes in 2016 and, and weather conditions, and also you had vibrant and, and huge amounts of shrimp, which displaced fishermen that might would typically be in that mullet fisherman, mullet fishery into another fishery to begin with, so they didn't participate. So thank you for your time. I know it's hard decisions y'all make. I uh, hope you make the right one. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Lisa McCracken, followed by Glenn Skinner. Good morning. Uh, Lisa McCracken from Havelock, and I'm just a concerned citizen. I'm taking this opportunity to talk about submerged aquatic vegetation. What is submerged aquatic vegetation, or SAV? It includes aquatic grasses and attached microalgae and is crucial to our environment and economy. According to the Albemarle Pamlico National Estuary Partnership, SAV is responsible for maintaining the diversity, health, and sustainability of North Carolina estuaries. A single acre of SAV can support as many as 40,000 fish and 50 million small invertebrates. As a nursery habitat, SAV greatly enhances juvenile density, growth, and survival when compared to other nearby habitats comprised of sand bottom. For the environment, SAV provides sediment stabilization, coastline preservation, and better water quality. Why do I care about SAV? I live on Clubfoot Creek a designated primary and secondary fish nursery area. Clubfoot Creek is a shallow waterway with depths ranging from one to five feet. My concern is that gillnet operators are using bottom disturbing gear in the nursery areas to cause fish to move and become entangled in gillnets. In an issue paper published in April 2008, originated by the Marine Fisheries Commission Chairman, Marine Patrol Field Officers Surveyed reported that the most prevalent Bottom disturbing device was the use of boat and motors to run alongside and inside the net. I have images taken during a recent kayak trip illustrating prop marks in the shallow water. According to the APNEP, major threats to SAV include excessive sediment that blocks sunlight, pollution, and human activities that disturb the bottom. These activities can cause sediment resuspension, which results in increased turbidity and the release of toxins and pollutants into the water column. It has been documented that the increased suspended sediments cause clogging of the gill surfaces and mortality. Not surprising, juvenile fish are imp impacted to a higher degree. I believe bottom disturbing fishing practices are happening in Clubfoot Creek based on my own observations and experiences. This should be a concern to commercial and recreational fishermen since the health and nursery habitat is in direct relation to the fishery stock. In addition, due to the fact that Clubfoot Creek is shallow, it is more prone to SAV and bottom damage. 30 seconds. In the original North Carolina Marine Fisheries 1977 rule, 
that described the scope and proposal of nursery areas, the following language was included. Nursery areas are necessary to the early growth and development of virtually all North Carolina's important seafood species. Nurseries need to be maintained as much as possible in their natural state, and the populations within them must be permitted to develop in a normal manner with Time. as little interference from man as comment. possible. Th thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Glenn Skinner, followed by David Sneed. Hi, uh, Glenn Skinner, uh, commercial fisherman, executive director of North Carolina Fisheries Association. Uh, I want to talk to you a minute about the striped bass, I mean the striped mullet supplement. Uh, I've been looking at the data, and as Brent Falcher mentioned, commercial landings are increasing over the last three years, with 2022's landings being the fifth highest on record, just 345,000 pounds short of the highest we've ever had. It, you take that and the fact that the division sampling, such as it is, is also showing increased abundance in this stock. And I can't understand how anybody would consider a supplement, which is an emergency management measure. You, you adopt a supplement when you're scared that the amendment process is going to take too long and it may jeopardize long-term viability of this fishery. That's not the case here. We're, every sign from recreational fishermen speaking at the last meeting, talking about how many mullets they've seen right here up News River, recreational fishermen in the south and the north, commercial fishermen across the state, everybody's seeing an expanding stock. Unfortunately, the stock assessment doesn't include the last three years' data, and the only data they're using for abundance is this independent gill net sampling. And I can tell you from years of experience in this fishery, the methodology used in the independent gill net survey is not adequate for assessing the overall abundance and spawn and stock biomass of this species. They don't sample in the areas where the mullets are throughout the year. The gear is not appropriate, and the way the gear is deployed is not appropriate. And that's the reason we have an overfished stock, overfishing occurring, and every other piece of data points to an expanding stock. It has to be flaws in the methodology in that survey. And you all need to think real hard before you go and adopt an emergency management measure when you could just go ahead and kick in the amendment process. It's going to take a year and a half. We'll have another year's data before you complete it. If you have four years of increasing data from the division and increasing harvest data in the commercial sector, you know that something is wrong with that stock assessment. So I'll ask you all to hold off on this supplement start the amendment process and see what's going on because there is definitely something wrong and division staff can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not aware of any other time in history where we've had an overfished stock and then three years of increasing division sampling and commercial landings. Seconds. There's just something going on here. Uh, I, I would also like to mention there's been a lot of comments about the incidental take permit. North Carolina is in direct violation of the Endangered Species Act when it comes to the recreational fishery. We've got over 400 documented hook and line interactions in the 10 year period between 2012 and 2021 with no incidental take permit, no observer program, absolutely no measures to reduce those interactions. But yet somebody time. comes in here and wants to penalize the only time. fishery. That's Need to call his time on you. Okay. Thanks, sir. Uh, David Sneed. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I'm David Sneed. I'm the Executive Director for the Coastal Conservation Association here in North Carolina. And uh, first, I'd like to congratulate you on your Tar Heels finally getting a win last night. Uh, not to be confrontational, but... Well, you are. <laughs> um, I was uh, reading through the uh, striped mullet plan. I wasn't planning on commenting on it, uh, but in the decision paper, a couple of questions that were noted in there kind of stuck out to me I thought I'd bring up and under the decision to select preferred management strategy uh, the first question is what is the estimated recreational harvest reduction and the answer is we cannot calculate an estimate for recreational harvest reduction because the data available for the recreational harvest is not captured with enough precision 
to accurately calculate daily landings in the recreational mullet harvest, both white and striped, is for bait. So it's fair to say that we don't know what impact that is. The second question was, why is recreational harvest being closed? And the answer was, to be equitable across all fisheries and to reduce management complexity to improve enforceability. And it hardly sounds equitable to me, it sounds punitive. And on another note, I would like to congratulate the Commission for taking a proactive, a proactive look at managing false albacore. Uh, it's nice to see the Commission do something proactive for a change uh, to conserve the abundance of a fishery and not wait for it to get in the toilet before we react. Thank you. Thank you. Has everybody had a chance to address the Commission this morning that cares to? That being said, our public comment session is closed. There you go. I would now like to call our meeting, February 2023 meeting of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission to order. Would everybody please rise with me and before we recite the Pledge of Allegiance, let's give a, a moment of silence to, for, uh, towards our uh, higher power to express uh, desires for a successful meeting today and any personal needs. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd like to remind my fellow commissioners of North Carolina General Statute 138A-15E, which mandates at the beginning of any meeting of a board, the chair shall remind all members of their duties to avoid conflicts of interest under Chapter 138. The chair shall also inquire as to whether there is any known conflict of interest with respect to any matters coming before the board at that time. Does any of my fellow commissioners see a conflict of interest of what we're going to be discussing this next day and a half? Good. Also, I'd like for you all to reflect on North Carolina General Statute 143B 289.54G2, which takes the conflict of interest issue a little bit further. Okay, time for our roll call. Uh, Laura, would you conduct that, please? Yes, Chairman. Commissioner Huggins? Present. Commissioner Cross? Present. Commissioner Roller? Present. Commissioner Shellam? Present. Commissioner Garter? Present. Commissioner Blanton? Present. Commissioner McNeil? Here. Thank you. And Commissioner Rader? Present. Thank you. And Chairman Bizzle? Present. Uh, we have a quorum. We may conduct uh, business. We do have two of our commissioners uh, coming in remote um, due to some health concerns, so we will try to accommodate them as best we can. If I don't see a hand up or hear you all do, do something to get my attention, please. Okay. For you is our agenda. Are there any uh, corrections or uh, anything that needs to be commented on? If not, I would like to have a motion to approve the agenda, and all of our votes are going to be roll call votes. So is there a motion for us to approve the agenda? Motion to approve the agenda. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Roller. Is there a second? Second. Second by uh, Commissioner Cross. Any other discussion on this? If not, all in favor say aye. I, I, well, roll call, excuse me. I'm, this is a no. <laughs> this is a no-brainer, and I'm. You were hoping. I'm hoping. <laughs> Let's do the roll call. Yes, chair. Commissioner Cross. Uh, yes. Commissioner Blanton. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Huggins. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Gardner. 
Aye. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Commissioner Rader? Aye. Commissioner Roller? Aye. Commissioner Shellum? Aye. And Chairman? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, you should have received your um, copy of our minutes from our last meeting. Are there any corrections, additions, or deletions that need to be made to them? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve them. Anna Shellum, motion to approve. Thank you, Mr. Shellum. Is there a second? Second. Second. Commissioner Roller, further discussion? If not, roll call, please. Yes, Chair. Commissioner Cross? Aye. Commissioner Blanton? Aye. Commissioner Huggins? Aye. Commissioner Gardner? Aye. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Commissioner Rader? Aye. Commissioner Roller? Aye. Commissioner Shellum? Aye. And Chairman Bissell? Aye. Motion Thank passes you. unanimously. All right, moving on into the Chairman's report. Um, everything is uh, in your briefing materials. Um, we are still having some discussion with the Wildlife Resources Commission um, dealing with striped bass, and I included in there, the, we did include in there the last letter, right, Laura, that we got from them? Yes, Chair. Okay, great, thank you. So that's just for your own edification at this time. And that really is all of the report that I need to, to give right now. Okay. Um, we have been asked to be part of a resolution from uh, dealing with stakeholder engagement for the Collaborative Coastal Habitat Initiative. Uh, Director, would you care to walk us through that? Or who, or Laura, are you gonna do that? Um, so, Chairman, Doug Rader was originally scheduled ah, to do that, okay. but as another member of the CHIP Steering Committee, um, Commissioner Huggins is actually um, gonna do Fantastic. that since. Commissioner Huggins? And turning mic on, I believe. Right. It's in your briefing materials. Uh, you probably had opportunity to review it, but uh, just to get to the heart of the resolution, the first and foremost is it's not coming from a state agency. Um, it's it's coming from uh, the collaborative initiative. Um, we're looking to request and for funding to be more funding to be allocated to the cost share programs, um, similar to what the soil and water conservation provides, uh, that targets essentially non-point runoff solutions. Um, looking for uh, to increase funding for implementing BMPs for development or nature-based retrofits to address flooding and resilience. Uh, it's just a so show of support. Um, the resolution is not, like I said, coming from the state agencies. Uh, the CHIP Steering Committee has already expressed their support, and we're trying to decide if we want uh, informal or formal support from this commission. Um, the hope is that the uh, other three commissions involved actually provide support as well, just to kind of go into some of the uh, more, some more the important points here. When, they, when you're talking about water quality degradation, uh, coastal North Carolina non-point runoff is probably the largest source in the northern half is predominantly from agricultural runoff and the southern half is pretty much from urban development. Uh, this resolution is a broad show of support um, for programs like the Agriculture Cost Share Program, Community Conservation Assistance Program, as well as the Living Shoreline Urban Retrofit Cost Share Programs. These programs are all voluntary and include a variety of nature-based methods to reduce runoff. Um, North Carolina has consistently lagged behind uh, the amount of funding that we allocate to these programs uh, in comparison to other states. Um, for example, if you look at Virginia, their cost share and technical assistance programs throughout the, through the Water Quality Improvement Fund have totaled roughly 50 to 83 million. It's reaching as high as 123 million for the fiscal year is 2023. Um, the lowest those that state has reached in the last uh, in 2014 was nine million, and that's nearly five million more than the most North Carolina has ever allocated. Uh, and again, the purpose of the resolution is just to show broad support from diverse stakeholders to increase funding for programs that provide a voluntary means and measures to improve water quality. Uh, it's going to be circulated to the other commissions and. 
I guess I will open the floor for discussion as to whether or not we want to informally support the resolution or we want to formally support the resolution with a vote. Okay. Any questions or comments on this resolution? Commissioner Roller. I just want some clarification on the difference between formally and informally. That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I, we could take a we could obviously take a vote. Well, let's open up to, to, to discussion. Yeah. I, I think there's multiple ways we could do it. We could provide a, a letter uh, as a show of formal support, or uh, we could. I think a letter would be more yeah. of an of an informal, informal correct. and yeah. a real vote would be more of a formal. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Laura. I just have an update. Um, so the CRC are currently also meeting this week and this item is also on their agenda. So they are considering that, I believe today as well. I, uh, this particularly caught my eye because I think uh, environmental issues are, are a real big deal. Um, I think this is a good resolution. I really do. And um, um, how did our uh, committee feel about the resolution as a whole? Uh, they were in support of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Personal support of it. All right. So do we want to make a motion, Commissioner Cross? Well, I was just going to say, yeah. suggest should we... Uh, to begin support of this, perhaps send a letter of support as an informal gesture, and then we can always bring it back before us and vote as in the form of a motion as a formal gesture, or, we, or either way. I mean, either way, I think we're going to support it. I just didn't know we wanted to, which way we want to lead out the gate with it. I think with all the other agencies probably getting on board with a formal approach, that would be have a little more oomph to it from us. So, Commissioner Roller. Well, I mean, just in the sake of time, I mean, I fully support a formal motion to support this initiative. I'd be happy to make that motion. Um, you know, I think they both sort of do the same thing, but I think we, given the importance and concern here, I think we just, if we feel that we support it, we may as well do it formally. Okay. So you're making a motion to formally... I will make a motion to formally support this initiative. Okay. All right. right. To formally adopt a resolution. Anna Shalom seconds that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Shalom. Any other discussion? Let's make sure we got the motion up there. Commissioner Shalom seconded. Hey, that's the motion as you made it, correct? Okay. All right. All right. Any other discussion? If not, roll call vote, please. <clears throat> Commissioner Cross? Aye. Commissioner Blanton? Aye. Commissioner Gardner? Aye. Commissioner Huggins? Aye. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Did you say aye? Aye. Yes. The volume okay, is down. Okay, I heard him. Commissioner okay, Rader? Yeah. Commissioner Rader? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So how the volume got turned down. You heard it. Yeah, I'm okay. Thank you. Commissioner Roller? Aye. Yeah. Commissioner Shellum? Aye. And Chairman Bizzle? Aye. Thank Motion you. Motion passes unanimously. Um, and if we could get the the two absent uh, remote commissioners on the screen, that would be a nice thing so I could see hands raised up. But something did happen to the volume there. All right. Moving on, director's report. Director Rawls. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Um, we start off with this to give a legislative update. There's not much enough. You can check your microphone, gotcha. please. All right, that's a no brainer, too. We'll get going here. All right. Uh, just for the legislative update, the General Assembly did start their long session on January 11th. We have work with the department and their legislative staff to provide uh, any education and information that has been asked of us, and we will continue to update the commission uh, if, at their next meeting and, and throughout if anything um, fisheries-related comes up legislatively that would be of interest to this body. <clears throat> Follow-up, I want to just 
I have a brief update, um, and these this cover this by what Sean has provided me, and I won't step outside this box, but relative to the lawsuit for, by the CCA, uh, in September of 2022, the Court of Appeals agreed with the trial court's decisions to deny the state's motion to dismiss, which was primarily based on sovereign immunity, which is really the state cannot be sued without its consent. Um, the state decided not to appeal the Court of Appeals decision, and the case is continuing in Superior Court. And the state's answer to the complaint was submitted on January 17th, uh, and at this time, that is the only update uh, I can provide because this is an ongoing case. Um, so I'm going to move on from that um, to talk a little bit about the division's uh, social media. So as part of our outreach initiative, and I know you hear me talk about this every time at every meeting, and you probably will until I'm not sitting in this seat anymore because I think it's very critical to what we're doing. Our outreach initiative, we have now uh, dedicated uh, Division of Marine Fisheries social media pages, which is a blessing and a curse. If you've not looked at it, I encourage you to do that. Uh, our staff has worked hard to establish these pages, and we're looking forward to the opportunity to get our message out and share Fisher's information um, with folks. And so I think they're going to try to put um, on the screen our social media addresses. And if none, if you have not had the opportunity to join our social media pages, we're going to give you that opportunity right now to get your phones out if you haven't already. So hopefully we'll see none of y'all getting your phones out because you've already done this. But if you have not, here's your opportunity. And um, if, no, they won't allow us to do TikTok. I think they're about to outlaw that altogether. And they should have done that a long time ago, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Michelle Brodeur is our outreach communications specialist, wherever she, yep, Michelle's here. So if you have issues getting uh, onto any of these, uh, let her know and she'll be glad to help you because don't look at me. I sh she had to do mine too. So just to talk a little bit while you're all messing with your phones and trying to get connected up here, uh, our audience on social media has grown to over 890 followers. Uh, a lot of them are very grumpy and this is... Uh, since we have launched on February the 1st. So the division's content has been displayed to social media uh, users over 84,000 times, and the public has engaged with likes, that's a stretch, comments, sharing, et cetera, over 14,500 times. These are great, I love these statistics. Uh, we hope to use this platform to educate, collaborate, and promote science uh, and factual messages uh, so the division is better to prepare and anticip to anticipate and to plan for uh, managing perception with facts. We're just really trying to put um, the facts out front. And again, just glancing at some of our co some of the comments, it is clear that we have some followers that are not really supportive of our staff, our work, um, or facts for that matter. And that's okay. We're we're okay with that because we're kind of used to that. But one thing that I do encourage is to share our social media pages, and this is for the commission, the people listening online, please share because the information that we are providing is important. They are facts that come from the division's data and just trying to keep everybody informed about fisheries management in the state and the important information that is um, collected, analyzed, uh, decisions that are made in between these meetings as well. So we really are trying to focus on what we do at the commission at the division and also DEQ is always posting about commission's business as well and decision making and we share those items we share those items too so one of the things that I really want to impress upon people listening in uh, and, and to those folks on social media that we have quite a few naysayers if you have never um, made an appointment at the division of marine fisheries office to speak with some of our staff uh, if you're interested in a certain species and you've never taken the time to talk to a species lead, um, please do that. I encourage you to reach out to our staff, um, commissioners, people listening online, people on our social media. Please do that and talk to these folks that collect the data at the Division of Marine Fisheries that analyze it and that put forward the recommendations because we literally do live and breathe this work and we love to talk about it and we may not agree on what we're going to talk about and that's fine too we don't have to agree but I promise you if it's something you've never done and you do that you talk to these people spend 
10, 15, 20, 30 minutes with these folks, you're going to leave with a different opinion about what goes on at the Division of Marine Fisheries. And again, we're never going to be always on the same side of the ball, and that's okay. But I promise you, you will have a better understanding of what we do, how dedicated we are to it, uh, and how great these people are at what they do. So give, give that a chance. I, I'm, I'm really asking, and that includes me. Set up an appointment uh, and, and just talk to us about the work that goes on at the Division of Marine Fisheries. I, I encourage everybody uh, to do that. So just a reminder, again, about a lot of the things that we're trying to work on for our Bicentennial Jamboree. It is June the 10th at the DMF headquarters. Everybody is invited. We've sent out a lot of invitations. We'll continue to send those out. This is a, a big event to celebrate 200 years of fisheries management in North Carolina. Um, we will remind you again at your May meeting that this is coming up. Uh, and for folks listening in, this will be a great opportunity to meet the staff uh, at the division, to meet the commissioners. The secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality will be joining us, and other DEQ leadership will be there as well. And you can talk to folks about our programs, our data collection, how we manage fisheries, uh, and, and, any, and really anything. We've got a lot scheduled for that day, and we're still working on building that event. So please put June the 10th uh, on your calendars, and again, uh, everybody is invited, and we're looking, we're looking very much forward to it. Uh, Director, that's right there at the beginning of Big Rock Week, I believe. Yes, sir, it is. Uh, it might, you might want to think about reaching out to Big Rock to get some publicity, and it might, I'm sure they'd be glad to support this. Yep, so staff has already done that, okay, and we really kind of staff, this, their, that this was their bright idea, to do this in conjunction with Big Rock, hopefully to bring in some more traffic and more folks that may be interested in fisheries, but they aren't in town except for that week most of the time and, and could, could drop by and talk, talk talk to us. So hopefully that, we have already talked to Big Rock and I think we've had a couple of meetings with them already. So we, we have, that's a great idea and we're we're pursuing that. We're trying to get as much publicity as we can because June will be here before you know it. And you know, advertisement is key to getting folks to the, to the uh, Jamboree and I keep calling it a Jubilee, but whatever the thing's called. Um, we're looking forward to it. Commissioner Roller. Uh, uh, Director, I just want to say I, I really appreciate your social media initiative. Um, I know in the past you weren't as nimble to make posts, right? And this is going to give the division a much easier and quicker way to communicate issues to the public. And I've been following it and liked all the pages. Um, I don't love social media. And I have to say I've follow, it's been a little entertaining uh, following the grumpy members of the public. Though the, what I want to point out, though, is I follow a lot of different, you know, government agencies in terms of fisheries and wildlife. And that is not just unique to North Carolina. Um, and I think uh, a quote I've, I've liked from another fisheries agency, they said, you don't have to like us to like us. So, you know. But anyway, I appreciate that. I think you guys are doing a great job. Thank you for that. And we, we take the grumpy faces, too. Um, so let's see. Moving on to uh, ASMFC and Mid-Atlantic uh, Fishery Management Council updates. I believe Chris Bat Savage is going to come up and uh, update you on those activities. Thank you, Kat. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, what I'll uh, do is I'll, I'm going to start with the uh, Mid-Atlantic Council meeting uh, that was held back in December and then roll right into the uh, ASMFC uh, meeting that was uh, just held a few weeks ago. As always, I'll just uh, hit on the highlights from, from both of those meetings. So uh, start off with uh, Summer Flounder, Scup, and Black Sea Bass. Uh, the Council met jointly with ASMFC, Summer Flounder, Scup, and Black Sea Bass Management Board to set uh, recreational management measures for all three species uh, for 2023. <clears throat> Just as a reminder, uh, the species, the management measures for black sea bass and scup only apply to north of Cape Hatteras. South Atlantic Council manages uh, uh, these species south of Cape Hatteras. This was the first uh, year of uh, the first time setting uh, recreational management measures using the new <clears throat> percent change approach, which was approved by the Council and ASMFC last June. Uh, under the new process, uh, measures for the upcoming years will aim to achieve a specified uh, percent change in harvest compared to the expected harvest under current measures. The uh, percent change approach uh, requires a 10% reduction in the recreational black sea bass harvest in 2023, <clears throat> which will be achieved through, uh, regional, uh, through regional conservation equivalency process. Uh, ASMFC's Flounder, Scut, and Black Sea Bass Board uh, will review and approve the recreational black sea bass management measures at their meeting on March 2nd. 
Uh, the percent change approach also requires a 10% reduction in the recreational harvest of SCUP uh, this year. Uh, federal waters uh, management measures uh, for SCUP uh, are a 10 inch uh, size limit, a uh, 40 fish bag limit, and open season from May 1st through December 31st. However, the vast majority of uh, recreational scup harvest occurs in state waters from New York through Massachusetts. So ASMFC's Flinders Scup and Black Sea Bass Board will also review and approve state waters recreational measures for scup at their meeting next week. <clears throat> uh, given the mixed results of the percent change approach for summer flounder, where one run uh, called for a 10% reduction and another allowed for a 10% liberalization, the Council and Board determined that uh, status quo regional measures would be appropriate for 2023 and agreed to continue the use of regional conservation equivalency. <clears throat> uh, next, I'll uh, cover uh, some things going on with recreational reform actions and priorities. Uh, the Council met jointly with ASMFC's Policy Board to discuss uh, priorities and next steps for several recreational reform initiative topics, which cover summer flounder, scup, black sea bass, and bluefish. Uh, of particular note, the Council and Policy Board agreed to move forward with uh, scoping for an amendment to consider options for managing uh, the, for higher recreational fisheries separate from other recreational fishing modes. This is also known as sector separation. <clears throat> and uh, options related to recreational catch accounting, such as private angler reporting and enhanced vessel troop reporting requirements. Uh, they agreed that the development of sector separation through separate recreational management measures would be a higher priority uh, to consider then separate recreational and for hire, or recreational for hire and private shore catch allocations. <clears throat> okay, so um, now I'll move into uh, uh, the ASMFC meeting and uh, start with striped bass. <clears throat> the uh, striped bass management board met to consider selecting management measures and final approval of addendum one to amendment seven to the striped bass FMP. <clears throat> the addendum considers allowing for the voluntary transfer of commercial striped bass uh, quota in the ocean between states that have ocean quota. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the board received a summary of uh, almost 2,000 written comments and 186 public hearing comments submitted on the, for the addendum, as well as input from ASMFC striped bass advisory panel. Almost all the comments and input received supported not allowing quota transfers. However, the board uh, voted to postpone action on addendum one until their May meeting so the technical committee can conduct stock projections to uh, determine how different quota utilization scenarios that have higher ocean landings, commercial landings, than we currently have would impact the stock and the rebuilding timeline. These scenarios would be compared to the baseline scenario, scenario which assumes that the commercial uh, quota utilization uh, doesn't change. And the projections will also incorporate the preliminary uh, 2022 recreational harvest estimates in response to the board's interest in reviewing 2022 catch uh, data as soon as possible. North Carolina opposed uh, this motion uh, to postpone uh, because it already appears that 2022 recreational landings are much greater than 2020 and 2021 landings, which uh, will impact stock rebuilding. Additional management measures to rebuild the stock by 2029 might be needed. <clears throat> so uh, we're concerned that allowing even low amounts of uh, Quota transfer uh, further complicates stock rebuilding. <clears throat> the additional analysis by the technical committee doesn't change the situation, and we therefore think it was unnecessary. And in light of the uh, public comment that was received on the addendum, the decision to postpone final action upset many stakeholders, possibly undoing some of the support that the management board had gained from the public over the last couple of years. Okay, now, now uh, <clears throat> cover American Eel. Uh, the American Eel Management Board met to consider the 2022 benchmark stock assessment. Uh, the American Eel stock is at or near historically low levels due to a combination of historical overfishing, habitat loss, food web alterations, predation, turbine mortality, environmental changes, toxins, and contaminants and disease. They got a lot going against them, really. Uh, the peer review panel uh, found that the uh, stock assessment sufficiently addressed all terms of reference, but recommended that additional uh, work to test the robustness of the I target method for uh, setting catch limits uh, using a simulation approach <clears throat> within the management strategy evaluation framework before uh, it's used for management. The uh, stock system subcommittee indicated that additional simulation work is possible to address several of the peer review comments uh, and would be more informative than a, a full-blown uh, management strategy evaluation. The uh, stock system subcommittee and peer review panel also uh, provided different advice on stock status. So consistent with ASMFC's technical support group guidance and benchmark stock assessment process, uh, the EEL board asked the stock assessment subcommittee to provide uh, justification, 
task of the uh, committee with um, providing justification for deviating from the advice uh, given by the peer review panel. The uh, stock session subcommittee will provide a report and additional analyses to the board at a future meeting. Okay, uh, next, <clears throat> next is American Shad. Uh, the Shad and River Herring uh, Management Board considered and approved an update to North Carolina's American Shad Sustainable Fishery Management Plan for 2023 through 2027. And I touched on a little bit of this, uh, I think, at the last meeting. The plan is similar to in framework to our previous plans, but there are some changes to the sustainability parameters in commercial seasons and statewide <clears throat> recreational bag limit. The Albemarle Sound, Roanoke River, female catch per unit effort and relative fishing mortality metrics uh, were changed to align with the independent gillnet survey methodology. Uh, recreational harvest for the Tar, Pamlico, Noose, and Cape Fear Rivers uh, were at, was added to the uh, relative fishing mortality calculations. A juvenile abundance index was added to the Albemarle Sound, Roanoke River system sustainability metrics, uh, which will trigger management if, ex if it exceeds a threshold for three consecutive years. <clears throat> Uh, commercial uh, season dates, which uh, have changed from uh, fixed season dates to uh, potential time frames uh, in which the fishery can occur to improve uh, management flexibility. So this would be uh, February 14th through, yeah, February, February 15th through um, April 14th, everywhere in the state's riverine and estuarine waters, except from February 20th through April 11th in the Cape Fear River system. The uh, statewide recreational bag limit was changed from a 10 fish aggregate to a 10 fish aggregate, <clears throat> a shad aggregate, with uh, only one of those uh, allowed to be American shad. However, the bag limits uh, <clears throat> specific for the Albemarle, Roanoke, Tar Pam, Noose, and Cape Fear rivers remain the same. Okay, I'll wrap things up with uh, covering uh, the uh, ASMC policy board. Uh, the policy board uh, discussed the increased recreational catch of small Atlantic bonita in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is uh, considering implementing the minimum size limit as a cautionary measure for the species and asked if other states should do the same. Atlantic Bonita aren't managed by ASMFC or the federal councils, so several states, including North Carolina, currently lack the rulemaking authority for this fish. Uh, it was also noted that uh, the South Atlantic Council had similar uh, discussions about false albacore at their last meeting. So ASMFC staff will provide an options paper for developing different levels of management for both Atlantic Bonita and false albacore at their next meeting. So that, uh, that concludes my summary, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Any questions? <laughs> Commissioner Rollo. Thank you, Chris. Um, I got a few things for you here. First of all, when it comes to the discussion of false albacore, I'm going to reserve all my comments for when we discuss the white papers. I assume you'll be here, right, in case I need yes. to come up. Um, First of all, I just want to thank you guys, the division, for your vote on the striped bass. Um, I think you, you had great logic there, right? Um, it was a really, I followed that process. It was very stressful to me because there was so much public comment in support, you know, in support of not, of not doing a transfer. And, and I feel like the way that the, that the, the ASMSC behaved just really is, doesn't do doesn't give the, it really views that they just ignore public comment, right? So like, and I think there was a lot of frustration there. So I think you guys and your logic was really good. I mean, that was a dear fish to me. I haven't caught one in the ocean for 15 years. And, you know, one of the things that we need to think about here in North Carolina is if we want to have those fish again, we need to rebuild them, right? So it's like, we only seem to have them when they're at peak abundance. So in that regard, I appreciate your stance on there. I was curious if you could touch on the sector separation discussion again. I know that's kind of a, a toxic phrase when it comes up, but if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, it's uh, the recreational reform initiative is um, <clears throat> kind of a large process. The, uh, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Council and, and ASMFC have been uh, dealing with for the last few years. That was the first thing that rolled out was this whole percent change approach for dealing with recreational management measures. But there was a, a whole list of other things, including, including uh, potentially looking at uh, you know, sector separation or some form of it. It, it, in terms of management for the different recreational sectors, that already occurs uh, in, in different levels. We have it for cobia and bluefish, for instance. Uh, states north of us have it for black sea bass and scup. Um, even for you know, shore, shore mode fisheries, uh, some states have different size and bag limits for you know, things like summer flounder and scup uh, in, in certain instances. So uh, the, the scoping for, for this amendment is to you look at you know maybe how to how to maybe do this more formally as opposed to the the, the ad hoc approach that um, that the council um, 
the, the council commission and, uh, and and the individual individual states have done over the last several years. What fisheries do you think that would apply to? I know you know this is not to do an ad hoc, but big picture, what is the discussion about when we look at look at it? So right now, this would only apply to summer flounder, scup, black sea bass, and bluefish, and that would be scup and black sea bass north of Cape Hatteras. Um, <clears throat> it's not. It, it doesn't mean it couldn't happen through some ASMC managed species like it already does. Uh, but th this this initiative is really just focused on those four species because they're jointly managed by both ASMFC and the Mid-Atlantic Council and have uh, large recreational components. And, and relatively speaking, they're really the only recreational finfish species the Mid-Atlantic manages as well, correct? So, Essentially, yeah. There, there's an Atlantic mackerel recreational fishery, but it pales comparison with, yeah. with those four, yeah. Thank you, Chris. All right. Anything else? Great, Chris. Thanks for your report. Director? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next, we'll get Trish Murphy, and she'll be giving an update on the most recent South Atlantic Fishery Management Council uh, activities. One day I'll get that right. <laughs> so um, again, I'm uh, Trish Murphy, and I'm the executive assistant for councils and uh, serve on the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council. So I'll go over the latest happenings at the council meeting that we had in Wrightsville Beach in December. Um, the council uh, approved three uh, amendments uh, this past go round: uh, Snowy Grouper, Amendment 51, uh, snowy grouper is overfished and overfishing is occurring. So we made changes. We lowered the catch levels, uh, made changes to allocation, and shortened the recreational fishing season uh, to two months, May and June. Um, Amendment 53, uh, that's the tile fish, blue line, and golden tile. Uh, neither of those are overfished nor overgoing overfishing. Yay. Um, so for golden, uh, we were able to increase the catch levels for that uh, species, and we de decided to delay the commercial longline season uh, two weeks uh, so that that season would last into Lent when the um, um, prices are great. Um, blue line, so if you guys may recall, blue line tile, the recreational sector has been going over its catch limits uh, several years in a row. So in order to try to constrain that, we uh, put a uh, bag limit, we reduced the bag limit, the recreational bag limit from three to two fish. And we also prohibited the captain and crew to, uh, to take bag limits. <clears throat> And then the other amendment was the uh, ABC control uh, amendment, and that's basically acceptable biological catch, and that just uh, provides flexibility in setting and managing our catch limits. Uh, so those are, those three will be heading up to the secretary for uh, formal review by the Department of Commerce soon. Um, so. Uh, let's just go ahead and cut to red snapper, everybody's favorite fish. Um, Regulatory Amendment 35, which addresses uh, red snapper uh, uh, discard mortality and the catch limits. Uh, as you know, red, red snapper are still overfished and overfishing is occurring. So in this amendment, uh, it drops, we're, we're re decreasing the, ex the uh, catch limits red snapper and uh, looking at putting a uh, one hook limit on fishing lines for the snapper grouper complex. Uh, this amendment went out to public hearing last month. This went, had six in-person public hearings. Uh, this was the first um, this was the first time we've had in-person public hearings since before the pandemic. I think they were all fairly well uh, attended. We had one in Moorhead City. Um, so that's going to be coming up for final approval 
in our March meeting. Um, and just to let you guys know, there's lots of other things going on with Red Snapper besides this regulatory amendment to address discard mortality. The overfishing piece is tends to be driven by uh, recreational discard mortality. So um, other things we have going on to try to address that besides Amendment 35 is um, we're looking at a management strategy evaluation, which would be a holistic look at management for the whole Snapper Crouper uh, complex. Uh, we had Amendment 46 that went to public scoping. This is looking at having a recreational permit for Snapper Grouper fishers. Um, we are expanding our outreach and education for uh, fishery, for best fishery practices. And we have some data collecting going on. The Great Atlantic uh, Snapper Count started in 2021. And that, that data will feed into a, a, a research track stock assessment that I think will start the latter part of 2024. So just to let you guys know, this, you know there's a lots of stuff that we are uh, doing to address overfishing of red snapper. Uh, GAG, Amendment 53, GAG is overfished and overfishing is occurring. And that uh, amendment also went to public hearing. Uh, here we are looking at re decreasing the catch limits, uh, making modification to sector allocations, and uh, management strategies to be put in place here is dropping the commercial uh, trip limit from 1,000 pounds to 300 pounds. And this also includes black grouper, because uh, gag and black, I think, get misidentified. So we've put them together in these management uh, strategies. And uh, recreational, we are dropping the uh, vessel. It'll, it'll be under a vessel limit. It'll be a two fish vessel limit for both private recreational and um, for higher uh, vessels. So in that one, it, oh, and also a no retention of uh, the bag limits by captain and crew. Um, that is also going to be up for final vote in our March meeting. Um, other things that I think of interest here, um, as Chris mentioned, we discussed Faults Albacore, the uh, saltwater, the American Saltwater Fishing Guides Association uh, came to the council and requested that we look at added, adding um, the Faults Albacore to uh, as a management unit. So the council uh, with staff reviewed the 10 different criteria that MSA requires to have a, a fishery managed and had a good discussion, but came to the conclusion that we would not add it as a management unit at this time. Um, however, we will monitor the fishery and uh, do a fishery performance report in, th in three years. And then the last thing that um, I thought you guys might be interested in is uh, dolphin fish. Um, you may recall amendment Regulatory Amendment 3 was getting started uh, several meetings ago, and the discussion was had at the council to look at this uh, management strategy evaluation for dolphins. So the Southeast Fishery Science Center and the council have put, held workshops up and down the coast um, to talk to stakeholders about how they'd like to see the fishery managed. Um, we had two workshops held, one in Wilmington and one in Wanchies that uh, Director Rawls and I and other uh, uh, staff attended. Um, we will be hearing the results from those workshops in our June meeting, uh, which will be held in Florida. And so as you may recall, this commission had voted to send a letter to the council in uh, voicing its concerns of additional management of dolphin, because you remember Amendment 10 put in vessel, I mean, yeah, vessel limits, and then after that was put in place, the council immediately started on another amendment. And so um, this this letter, we have the letter, but in discussions with uh, Commissioner Roller, felt like holding that letter until the June meeting and sending it then would probably be the most appropriate way to use this letter at this point. 
um, but it would address, um, um, you know, our concerns about changing size limit, you know, having size limits, changing vessel limits, bag limits. Uh, you know, I think people are wanting us to be like Florida, and we're just not like Florida. So, um, but with that, um, our next meeting is held is going to be held in Jekyll Island, March sixth through tenth. Commissioner Roller. Thank and you. Hold on before we go further. I've lost uh, my commissioners on the screen. If y'all could get them back for me, please. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Trish. I see a lot of you. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> it's great working with you. Um, I just want to touch base on a couple things regarding the dolphin letter. Um, you know, we passed, I think we did that at our September meeting, right? And it's important to note that the way the dolphin management has moved through the council process, there was just some delays, particularly as we went through this MSE process, and I think there was a lot of hope that it would have come out a little bit sooner. So just given how the amendment has come onto the agenda here, that's why we chose to, to, to present it in June. We just think it's, so it just doesn't get lost in the fray. Um, you know, I appreciate you touching on Red Snapper. I, I think, you know, we hear a lot of this from our North Carolina fishermen, and I think it's important to note that you know, it's a coastal stock, and we are a very small player in that fishery. You know, if we think there's a lot of them here, go to North Florida or, or Georgia. That's where the vast bulk of the catch occurs. If I'm, I think the North Carolina harvest is like what 0.6%. It's, it's very low. It's I mean, very less very than 5%, low. For sure, yeah, so. it's 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 like less than a percentage, I believe, and it's it's really difficult. I mean, we have, so it's so small for us. It's really, you know, it's it's kind of a hard discussion for us to have from, you know, from a North Carolina standpoint. So, but um, but other than that, I, I appreciate your report. Thanks, Trish. Thanks. Well, anything else, Trish? Okay, great. Thank you for the report. Tell Steve we said hello. Okay, Director. Thank you, thank you, Trish. <clears throat> so next, we'll have the Marine Patrol update from um, Colonel Carter Whitten. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, no action is needed on this. Uh, the Marine Patrol had a busy year in 2022, including receiving two grants, updating our hiring process, additional training for current officers, and updating our notice of violation process. The grants which we received included 188,000 for our Swift Water Rescue Team and 444,000 in the port security grant. The Swiftwater rescue team used the grant funds to purchase enclosed trailers for storing and transporting safety gear and other gear needed for Swiftwater rescue deployment. The Swiftwater rescue team has officially become a type two team, meaning they can now be called upon by the emergency management in times of need. They were deployed to Marion, North Carolina during Hurricane Ian, which was the first mission as a type team. Additionally, additional activity in 2022 included training for the team members and training which our team provided to 18 other first responders, including Marine Patrol officers, Pamlico Fire and Rescue, New Bern Fire and Rescue, and the Pamlico County Sheriff's Office. <clears throat> the 444,000 in port security funds included a 25% match, and these funds were used to purchase two Metal Shark boat packages. Marine Patrol was impressed with the two Metal Shark boat packages that they had purchased with a previous grant, which led them to purchase the two new packages. Funds were also used to purchase four additional side-by-side -side vehicles, which Marine Patrol has found to be very useful in patrolling the beaches. Marine Patrol leadership worked to update the hiring pro process to be able to sponsor new hires to attend basic law enforcement training, which increased the number of potential candidates for open position. Two rounds of hiring in 2022 led to filling six new positions who are currently engaged in training. We have also had two officers become field training officers and I have become a general, and one officer become a general instructor, which makes the great asset to the Marine Patrol team. All officers also participated in the 24 hours um, in-service training each year. Marine Patrol 2022 accomplishments included checking 10,000 standard commercial fishing license, 9,800 commercial fishing vessel registrations, 
1,500 shellfish license, 63,000 coastal recreational fishing license, 564 recreational commercial gear license, and 24,000 recreational vessels. Marine Patrol also performed 2,000 checks on charter boats, wrote 558 citations, and wrote uh, 1,318 warning tickets. And that concludes my report, and I can take any questions. Uh, those 500 citations that were written, was that to charter boats only? No, that was to, every, to oh, okay. all, that's the citations we wrote in all of 2022. Gotcha, okay. Whether yeah. it's commercial, recreational, littering, okay. everything. All right, cool. Questions? If not, thank you, Colonel. Appreciate your report. Thank you all. Director? Thank you, thank you, Colonel Whitten. Uh, next up is a, we've got some updates from the Habitat and Enhancement section. And first, uh, we're going to get Owen Mulvey McFerrin to update you on some process improvements we have recently implemented in the Shellfish Lease Program. So welcome, Owen. Thank you, Director Rawls, and good morning, Commissioners. Today, I'm going to be providing an update on the Shellfish Lease and Aquaculture Program and going over some changes that we have implemented in an effort to improve program efficiency. <clears throat> As a reminder, we received 85 shellfish lease applications in 2022. 11 bottom leases and 13 water column leases were presented for public hearing in Carteret County this past February 15th. There are also public hearings scheduled for Onslow County on February 28th, Pamlico County on March 2nd, Pender County on March 15th, and Hyde County on March 29th. The 2023 shellfish lease application period will open on March 1st and will close on August 1st. Staff have already been receiving inquiries from folks interested in applying for shellfish leases, and we expect another busy application season this year. I'll now speak briefly on the program efficiencies that the shellfish lease program and aquaculture permits program have been incorporating to address the increased demand for leases and permits and to improve customer experience. You have a one-pager summarizing this in your meeting materials that captures my talking points for your reference. First, the Shellfish Lease Program has consolidated the annual rent notices, production reports, and work authorizations into a single mailing, which is sent to all leaseholders in January. We included a one-pager summarizing the newly adopted rules as well with the mail-out this year, so that leaseholders are aware of any impacts that these rule changes may have on their operations. Shellfish Lease Renewal Packets, which are sent up at the end of the 10-year Shellfish Lease contract period, will now include copies of the original shellfish lease application and management plan for reference to aid leaseholders in filling out the renewal application. On a similar note, we have developed a template form to assist leaseholders with and expedite the shellfish lease transfer process, which is becoming increasingly popular over the past few years. We are also increasing the availability of lease siting, storm preparedness, gear and marine debris management, and technical guidance resources for applicants and leaseholders, developing new resource guides and making our existing resources available on the website. Moving on to aquaculture permits, the aquaculture operation permit renewal packet has been streamlined with a one-page renewal form, fillable PDFs, and digital filing. This has facilitated a 10-day turnaround time for AOPs, as well as a 48 to 72-hour turnaround time for intro and aquaculture seed transplant permits. Lastly, the development of the AOP inspection tool will facilitate expedited inspections and ensure consistency throughout the annual inspection process. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Questions? Right. All right. Thank you for your report. Oh, you, oh raise it higher. <laughs> You're looking that way. I was looking at you. Uh, thank you. I mean, y'all have done an excellent job streamlining a lot of these reports and whatnot and AOPs and whatnot. I know we had a little backlog. A uh, little pause on um, applications for new aquaculture permits and whatnot. Do you see us having an issue with that in the future? There was a lull. I mean, we went through six, eight months. We really didn't make much progress, and I think y'all pretty much cleared that out. But, I mean, do you think you'll, you, we won't have that issue going forward? I, I don't anticipate that, no. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Commissioner Rollo. Uh, did you say how many applications were approved? Um. From this, from from the ones you received last year, so those are still going through the process. They're all, um, nearly all of them are up for public hearing um, in the next month, and then after that public hearing is when they will go to the director for approval. Anything else? All right. Now, thank you for your report, <laughs> director. 
Mr. Chairman, too, and before we leave that topic, I would just like to thank Commissioner Cross for his input to the staff with some working with some of these um, process ideas and then also his work with the stakeholders on this particular subject because we, we, we thank him for that. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Cross, for that help as well. <clears throat> and thank you, Owen, for the report. So we're moving on to the relay program update, and we will ask um, Habitat Enhancement Section Chief Jacob Boyd to come up for that. Okay, not Jacob. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, much shorter, but a little younger, so that's fine. One moment, please. Uh, thank you, Director Rawls, Commissioners. My name is Zach Harrison. I'm the Aquaculture Permits Coordinator, and today I'll be updating you on the Polluted Area Relay Program. At the February meeting of last year, Jacob Boyd gave a verbal update on the Relay Program phase-out. Today I will be giving you a quick look at the Relay Program over the last few years and a report on the 2021 and 2022 Relay seasons. Tomorrow, Catherine will be presenting the relay-related rule changes needed to remove the relay requirements from the Commission's rules simultaneously with the phase-out. For review, the relay program allows shellfish lease and franchise holders to harvest shellfish in designated polluted areas and transport them to their lease or franchise. This is a permitted, ac permitted activity that only occurs between April 1st and May 15th. The program was originally enacted due to major loss among lease and franchise holders because of harmful algal blooms. One major factor in the phase out of the relay program was the production requirement changes for shellfish leases and franchises enacted in the 2019 aquaculture bill. These changes excluded relayed shellfish from being counted in the annual production reports removing the ability of lease and franchise holders from meeting production through utilizing the relay program. Another factor is the National Shellfish Sanitation Program's requirement for all shellfish moved from polluted areas to be monitored by Marine Patrol. Officers must oversee the harvest, transport, and placement of relayed shellfish, and as the Commission has been briefed previously, Filling open Marine Patrol positions has been a challenge, as well as the need for more officers to cover increasing demands. Lastly, over the last 10 years, there has been a continuous decrease in the participation of this program. As a result of these last two factors, in 2019, the relay season was limited to two days per week in two areas. Jacob Boyd announced last year that the division has begun the process of phasing out the relay program with three final seasons, the end date for relay is set for May 1st, 2024, following the season next year. The 2021 relay season included three locations in Carteret County and three locations in southern Onslow Bay counties, New Hanover, Pender, and Onslow. In preparation for the 2022 relay season, the 2021 participants were contacted to provide input on the previous year's locations and if they would prefer additional locations um, sorry, if they would prefer other locations. Based on this input, the 2022 relay season locations were changed to incorporate three additional southern locations that were rotated through. Once the season was planned, the relay application was sent to all bottom lease and franchise holders. 2022 followed the same season schedule as a 2019 through 2021 seasons with two days per week for six weeks. In 2021, one day a week included a Carteret County location and two Southern Onslow Bay locations, and the next day included one Carteret County location and one Southern Onslow Bay location. The 2022 season followed the same process with the additional sites rotated through. As a reminder, a limited fa limiting factor with the relay dates and the number of locations is Marine Patrol officers, as each site requires at least three officers to enable relaying that day. By March 18th of 2022, we received 33 applications back from the relay package mailouts. These applications met the deadline for full participation in the season. 
There were four more applications that were received by the final deadline for participation in the last four weeks of the season. This accounts for the total of 37 permits and 34 applicants included here in the yearly permit and participant data. This season remains on the lower end of relay participation for the last 20 years and nearly half of the average permits over this time. Lastly, you can see the change to two relay days per week starting in 2019. Next, I have a more in-depth look at the relay participation for 2021 and 2022. First, you can see the permits remain similar with 32 in 2021 and 37 in 2022. Next, the number of unique applicants remained nearly the same. The difference in permits versus applicants numbers of 2021 and 2022 is primarily due to the lease work authorization forms, allowing for authorized workers to obtain their own permits instead of in the leaseholder's name. The total number of leases and franchises involved in each season remain the same. And next is the number of permitted transplanters. To clarify, each relay application can include up to six designees and three vessels, each of which can sign in individually and relay to the permitted lease. This allows for extra help in the season, along with enabling subleasees to participate in the season. As you can see from the 32 and 37 permits, we get around 70 unique transplanters total. The total number of unique participants that showed up and relayed at any site at least once was, however, less than a third of those with only 17 and 22 for 2021 and 2022, respectively. Furthermore, the daily average participation across all locations per day was only five and eight transplanters. Remember, one day a week includes three locations at once. And lastly, the daily average participation by location was only three and four transplanters. A concern that was voiced by the commission in the February 2022 meeting was by phasing out the relay program, would we be ridding leases and franchises of one of the main methods by which bottom leases are able to produce shellfish without the prospect of water column amendments for floating gear? In response, I have included a comparison of lease types to those participating in the relay program. First, we have the total number of bottom leases and franchises for the last four years, which have been steadily increasing. Next, the number of water columns, which are also increasing, along with the total numbers for bottom leases, franchises, and water columns combined, which is increasing. As you're aware, a water column cannot be obtained without the underlying bottom lease. So to determine the number of leases or franchises without a water column attached, the water columns are subtracted from the bottom or franchise numbers and leaves the total remaining bottom only leases and franchises. This number is remaining steady or possibly slightly increasing despite the option to apply for water amendments for either. Lastly, we see the total number of leases and franchises involved in the relay season for these years. This group is both decreasing and less than a third to a fourth of leases that cannot use any floating gear. One caveat not mentioned is that leases or franchises with a water column can still participate in the relay season if they choose to. Given this information, the vast majority of bottom-only leases and franchises are meeting production without utilizing the relay program. We will give an update on the 2023 season at the February meeting next year. And with that, I will take any questions. Okay. Questions? Okay. I guess you have a question. <laughs> Jacob, um, when I look at these statistics and we're not, the only thing that strikes me is some of these lifetime bottom leases that some of these people have, you know, the discontinuation of this transfer program is going to affect some of them because they just don't have the funds or the, or the means to get into the aquaculture side. And I hope that y'all take that into consideration, some other caveat of some kind of availability for them to keep producing, even if it's on a small scale, like they've been producing all these years, because I mean, some of them just don't have the means to do it any other way. And this is gonna really cut them back when we stop transferring and whatnot. Certainly, and in response to that, one of the upsides with the change in the uh, production language that came from the aquaculture bill is that it was now a harvest or planting. So while the planting is now specifically seed, the harvest, can be accounted for each year. So if you were planting colch, it doesn't account for your planting, but if you harvest enough, which is 20 bushels per acre per year, 
then you can still meet production without planting seed. But I, I do agree, we, we're trying to make sure that that is accounted for. Good. Anybody else? Great. Thank you, Zach, for your presentation. Director, before we go back to you, um, got to request whoever is in control of my screen here is kind of jumping all over the place. Um, the only thing I really need to see on it is our two remote commissioners in case they have a hand to raise or what have you. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, you got something, Commissioner Cross? Uh, this is for Kathy, and I, 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 while we're on shellfish, I just want to ask you a quick question because I don't need an answer. Uh, I've been made aware of a, that there's a evidently a rather large uh, population of scallops around Sneeds Ferry in the New River area. Oh yeah, they're, but they're not allowed to work on that area at all. Is that correct? Yeah, that area is not open. Why? Why is that? I'm just. I and that's just. We opened the area that is open based on our sampling, and that area is, is did not meet our sampling um, well, triggers. I had a, two gentlemen sent me pictures. Of, that's their piers where the seagulls are getting. There's so many scallops, the seagulls are getting them up and opening them. So you're saying that that's it's low down there? Is that the reason they're not opening that? Yes, it, we <laughs> we have con, we did conduct sampling in that area. Is that correct, staff? But they did not meet the sampling triggers. Okay. That's it. That's it. I we, was we'll, we'll, and we'll, we'll look. We'll take a look. We'll look I, into I that. I was asked to ask that question. So now. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So next, we're going to have the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan update from Ann Deaton. Yes, Ann. All right. Thank you, Director Rawls. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ann Deaton. Rain, rain, Division Marine Fisheries Habitat Enhancement Section. So I'm just going to give you a brief update on CHIP-related activities since your last meeting. Um, there was a CHIP steering committee in December to orient new members. So that was the first meeting with a lot. We'd had a turnover. And so, like, if you recall, your, your two MFC members on the CHIP steering committee are Don, Donald Huggins and Doug Rader. Um, so they had a lot of background, and we went over progress on the recommended actions in the CHIP to date after one year. Um, I wanted to remind you all that the CHIP Steering Committee serves basically as a liaison for your, your full commission back to the Steering Committee. So the committee has two commissioners from EMC, CRC, MFC. So that's a great pathway for you to relay messages of concern. If there's something specific you want them to address about habitat and water quality, you can do so. And then they also, as a liaison, will bring back to you, they will, or, or Jimmy Johnson or I will let you know and keep you informed on things that they are discussing and issues from their perspectives. So I just wanted to, to emphasize that, because um, as you know, coastal development and water quality does impact fish and fish habitat. So it's just a good opportunity to get, to have some discussion on strategies. Um, another item to mention is progress on wetland protection and restoration. So that was one of the key issue papers in the plan. And since we last met, a greenhouse gas inventory report was completed. What's that? I can see it on your face. So a greenhouse gas Inventory is where they can calculate from your plants, because plants absorb carbon dioxide, how much they can sequester, like bind and take out of the atmosphere, which reduces the rate of climate change if you have enough. So the governor's executive order 80, which was about um, developing a climate risk resilience plan, also called for reducing in North Carolina the greenhouse gas emissions to 40% below the 2005 levels, and they're supposed to do that by 2025. So the way you can reduce your emissions is you can have more standards and rules on things that like cars and, and smokestacks, or you can take actions to keep more green vegetation on the ground. And so at the time that plan was, the, the state plan was done, they didn't have data for coastal wetlands or SAV. So a subgroup of that original plan, the Natural Working Lands Committee, 
Coastal Habitat Subcommittee met and they brought in experts and they got calculations and so we now we have numbers and the coastal wetlands and SAV do provide a net sink for carbon in our state. Um, and the reason, why does that matter? Because that shows their value in reaching this goal. So it um, shows uh, why we have, um, might want to for, take more actions to support the wetlands and the SAV, which is what we're trying to do with this plan as well. So it just, it's, um, reinforces the benefit of protecting and restoring those habitats. Um, another, and if, oh, if you want a copy of the report, I have it, you can just let me know. Um, another CHIP recommendation um, that has been worked on is developing updated wetland maps. The maps of coastal wetlands in our state are, are quite old, early 90s, and less resolution. So if you want to do a proactive planning on how to protect wetlands in the future and allow migration with sea level rise, you need accurate maps of elevation and what's there. So we have met and formed a work group and there's a follow-up meeting next week on that. Trying to combine efforts, um, see what are the needs of different agencies so that we can be efficient with funds and then seek out maybe a combination of funds to get these maps produced. So we're also talking to Noah about that. And again, if the reason this is important is because of sea level rise projections. And if the sea level rise rate is too fast, then the wetlands can't keep up, they can't migrate, and they get drowned. And they can drown if there's no uplands to migrate to. So if it's bulkheaded, if it's developed, if they can't move up, then they're gonna go under. And if you're interested, there are NOAA sea level rise protection maps online, and they're interactive, and you can kind of zoom into where you live or wherever you're interested in. You can adjust the rate of the projection, like on the low side or the high side or in the middle, and then go down time and see kind of where things seem like they'll go under, where wetlands could migrate. So I can send you, um, if you're interested, um, the link for that. Um, and then the other issue paper, I was just going to mention progress on the SAV paper. And I know I've said it before, but the Division of Water Resource staff continues to work on the nutrient um, criteria development plan. And they're making progress. And the DMF staff works with them on that. So there is now draft language for a water clarity standard. And a justification paper was written by the Scientific Advisory Council, which is what they needed. So that council or the SAC is meeting actually in two days, Friday, tomorrow, um, to kind of approve that and move forward to the next step. So remaining steps are to develop um, an assessment plan, which the staff will be doing, and DMF has been um, discussing, helping with them on that. And um, then they have to go to a stakeholder group, and then it will go to the EMC. So we, the target is definitely by the end of this year, the draft rule language would go to the EMC. And that would put in place more um, higher standards in any of the water bodies, any of the watersheds that have SAV in them. And I just wanted to mention that Nathan Hall, who is one of your Habitat Water Quality Advisory Committee members, he's been doing research on water quality in the northern part of the coast, Albemarle Sound in particular, um, to refine the bio-optical model. And that, that model is needed um, to determine, okay, if you have this, we know you need this much light. You look at the water quality data and, and it can tell you like where your, um, turbid, your light reduction is coming from most. Is it sediment, is it nutrients, is it nitrogen, is it phosphorus? So it helps you pin down what you have to reduce. And um, if you think about that in fish terms, it's like the water clarity standard is your target fish population. And then you have to decide how to get that fish population up. And you do that through different management measures like your sizes or limits. So in this case, for water clarity, you're gonna do it through reducing your nitrogen, nitrogen or your phosphorus or your sediment from point and non-point sources. So the model will help refine how to do that. 
Um, there's also, I just mentioned, there'll be more SAV mapping this, this growing season, spring and fall. Um, DMF staff does that working with APNEP. They'll, they pay, APNEP pays for um, flights to get the imagery, and then we do sampling to verify species and condition with them. And then last, since you last met, the public-private partnership what we're calling SECI, did meet in October. We knew about that at the summit. And so the outcome of that is two work groups have been formed, subgroups. Uh, one is called Working Lands and Waters, and that is, you know, targeting people that want to work on aquaculture, agriculture, forestry, that type of thing. The other subgroup is Coastal Resilience. Um, and the first thing this Working Lands and Waters subgroup did when they met was they wanted to, they got the idea of doing the resolution that you just passed today so i just want to say thank you for that and i think i know that that group feels very strongly about it and they plan to um, share that resolution with a variety of groups and then you have you know they'll take at some point at some point they would take that to general assembly and say look you know we think this is a really good way to improve water quality and it's voluntary so, um, people like that. Um, that concludes my report, unless there are any questions. Okay. Thank you, Ann. Any questions of Ann? Okay, great. Ann, thank you very much. Director? Thank you. Thank you, Ann, for that report. We're going to move on to a protected uh, resources update. And as you are all aware, the division has submitted an application for an incidental take permit. Uh, at your May... Uh, 2020 business meeting, DMS Protected Resources Program Supervisor Barbie Bird updated you on the ITP permitting process. And I've asked Barbie to come back today to update on the ITP application and to briefly review the call-in system that is being developed as part of the ITP um, requirements. So Barbie, welcome and thank you for coming. Doesn't sound. Oh, hear me? Doesn't sound like it. See if it's if you got a green light. It's on. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you again. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, this should be pretty brief. Um, if I can work out the details of how to go forward. So um, I'd like to provide updates for you this morning on on two items. One is the status of the. Division's application for another Section 10 incidental take permit under the Endangered Species Act, and also to provide updates on the development of a call-in system for the observer program, and that we are calling that the Observer Trip Scheduling System, or ODIS, because, you know, we love acronyms. Um, so I will be trying to introduce that acronym a little bit as well. So as you know, the Division has two Section 10 incidental take permits, one for sea turtles and one for Atlantic sturgeon. And these permits, as a reminder, allow for the legal incidental take of these species in estuarine anchored gillnets. The sea turtle ITP expires this August. So because of that, we've been working with the National Marine Fishery Service to submit the application that you probably have heard about. So I wanted to just update you with where we are now, how we got here, and what the next steps are. So the division has been consulting with National Marine Fisheries Service for um, a long time, actually, even before I started in 2020, to submit this application. And they, NIMS has reviewed drafts of the application. They reviewed our analytical approach to estimating takes in the fisheries. And they've also provided comments on the measures we included in the conservation plan. And as a reminder, that conservation plan is meant to uh, minimize, mitigate, and monitor incidental takes. So. so on December 2nd of last year, the division formally submitted the ITP application for incidental takes of both sea turtles and sturgeon and estuarine anchored gillnet fisheries. And just, aha, hold on a second. I apologize as I try to figure this out. I thought I have my notes here in case I 
mess up. Let's see. Okay. So National Marine Fisheries Service published on December 22nd um, the notice of receipt and opened up the public comment period. And that public comment period was initially set to end on January the 23rd. But in response to, oh, um, well, on January 5th, they published a correction because we had noticed that the original, um, <clears throat> the original notice had included some legacy language about how the observer program was funded, and we asked them to correct that, which they did on January 5th. And then on January 20th, they published um, an extension to the public comment period, and that extension was based on a, a specific response that they had. And that um, public comment period ended yesterday. Okay, so that's where we've been. So where are we going next? So there are several other steps that have to take place before um, NIMS can even issue an, an ITP. And most of those steps are really, they are NIMS's wheelhouse. They are not in our wheelhouse. So um, first, pursuant to the National Environmental Policy Act, they'll develop an environmental assessment on the effects of issuing that ITP. And they'll publish a draft environmental assessment, they call it an EA, and they'll provide a separate 30-day comment period specific to the draft um, EA. <clears throat> the draft EA may include appropriate changes to our ITP application, depending on uh, responses to the public comments that have come in. But depending on the number of those comments, the draft EA may or may not include the responses to the public comments at that stage. Um, so that's, I missed that. Um, in addition, NIMS will start to initiate a Section 7 consultation. So you may remember when I spoke with you, I think August of last year, talking about the differences between Section 10 and Section 7. So as a reminder, Section 7 is an internal federal process. So remember, before one part of the agency can issue an ITP, Another part of the agency has to approve that issuance as an internal process. So that will have to be initiated. <clears throat> and then, um, let me just make sure I get this right, because I can't see the notes on here. But um, if NIMS determines that the takes requested in the ITP do not jeopardize the continued existence of those species, um, they'll publish the final environmental assessment and the Section 7 biological opinion with the issuance of the ITP. And when they publish that, they would publish um, all of the comments and responses to those comments for both the application itself and the draft environmental assessment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if NIMS decides that they are unable to issue an ITP, the next steps really are up in the air because it will depend on why they um, why they decide that they cannot issue that ITP. So it's not worth, you know, really considering it. We would have to deal with that at the time. Okay, I'm going to switch gears. And I'm going to talk about the observer trip scheduling system and the call-in system. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So conversations have occurred for a long time about this call-in system. And there are several reasons why we need one. And one of those, of course, is that um, it'll make it simpler for the observer program to meet required observer coverage of the estuarine gillnet fisheries. And one of the biggest challenges that we have is actually scheduling trips in advance. And so a call-in system should help uh, overcome that. <coughs> Sorry. Um, just making sure what you see. The other part of the call-in system provides an opportunity to randomize the fishermen that are selected to take an observer. And because of that, that coverage should be more representative across the entire fishery and not just the fishermen that return our phone calls. Um, and so that is a better way of collecting data overall. Um, the industry has requested this at times in some form or another and acknowledged the importance of that. And NIMS has encouraged us to use this as a tool to make sure that we meet our observer coverage requirements um, for the current ITPs, but also for the next ITP should we receive it. <clears throat> so to begin this process, we have been meeting with Marine Patrol, fisheries managers, and IT 
just identify internal needs or what you know, IT folks would call business requirements of the system itself. And one of the things we realized right away that during the busiest seasons, there are way too many calls that could come in for us to have a person or people answer those phone calls. So we really need an automated process. So we've started conversations with the North Carolina um, DIT or Department of Information Technology about you know, what are those options for this call-in system um, and, and to have this an automated process. So we have begun those conversations and um, we have contracted the vendor that works for the, with the state to develop this system. And this system will be both a call-in system where fishermen call in and say he or she's planning to fish. And it also includes outbound communication where we would have automated text, email, um, and phone calls kind of like you do with your doctor's appointments and such that says you've been selected to take an observer, you have not been selected to take an observer. So we're working with the vendor to build that system um, and it, there are a lot of moving pieces and I'm very fortunate that we have a DIT staff at the division that helps me because frankly I don't even speak the ling language at times but you know some of the things to think about is you know, where the data are stored, the security of those data, how we um, access those data, and the long-term storage. So it, it can be kind of complicated. Um, so we're grateful for them. And we'll begin scheduling meetings this spring and summer to talk to both the fishermen and the public about the OTIS or the observer trip scheduling system. Um, and while some of things are not going to be changeable within that system, just based on those business requirements, we do want feedback so that we can adapt the system to the extent possible based on the people who are actually going to be using that system. Our current goal is for it to um, go live in the fall, but we hope that we have some time to do some checks um, this summer, and some of that will depend on the vendor building the system, but the goal is to have it live by the fall. And NIMS would like for us to have it sooner than that and so if we can we certainly would so overall there's are several benefits to a call-in scheduling system that I've mentioned before um, but we're not um, we know that it's going to have growing pains it's familiarity with it uh, we're going to still need ad hoc trips alternative platform trips and then you know there inevitably is going to be system and tech glitches that we can't predict all of them, but we'll try our best to predict and do some test runs beforehand so when it's rolled out, some of those are minimized. And I appreciate your time, and I'll take any questions. Questions? Commissioner Roller. So on this call-out, this is really a hail-out program, right? That's what we call it in fisheries management, hail-out, hail-in. So is it going to work by in order to be able to fish in one of these permitted fisheries you will have to call into the system for every trip for the anchored gillnet fishery that's covered by the itp yes. so if you're in an anchored gillnet fishery for this itp you will call into the system and you'll be provided some sort of number or certification and that way you can be randomly chosen to be observed right correct okay um could that system be used for other commercial fisheries um, I, I, I guess so. I mean, NOAA uses something similar to this, um, but let's build one and <laughs> No, I, I'm, just, I'm just asking. I mean, it's a hail-in, hail-out system is what it is. You know, we're, we're calling it something different, but, you know, we've seen this across federal fisheries and other things. Um, and that's just my question, because we've had a lot of debate. There's a lot of people that misuse commercial licenses for personal consumption and whatnot, and it seems like a kind of cut and dry way in order to get a better grasp of what what is actually going on out there for people who say aren't reporting landings. Um, and so this is just going to be in place for the Southern Flounder gillnet fishery, or is this also the shad fishery as well? This so will what be all anchored gillnet trips. For small, small mesh, mesh, large mesh, if you set an anchored gillnet so in all, estuarine all, waters. Okay, you so must you will have to have one of these things if you're gonna set a small mesh net at any point of the year, you will have to, you have to use the system. Yes, and that also goes for recreational commercial gear license holders. Yeah, that's good. So the question I have also is, you know, I remember getting the correction under the funding sources. What is the funding source for the, I, I know it's a rhetorical question, kind of. I know the answer to this. But what are the funding sources for the program? 
Okay. I, so there is an increase in commercial license fees. What else? Um, I, I don't think anything else that I know of. If, if I may, I remember when we passed that legislation, when that legislation was passed, that the program wasn't just funded by the scuffle increase. It was also funded by portions of the increased other licenses as well. Is that not correct? There was like, like everything was increased across the board and portions of those increases went into this fund. I think it is, we'll have to go back and look at the statute, but it, it is commercial um, license increases. Fee increases is what funds well, there, this program. Th there was a lot of discussion about that back in the day because when this was done, a lot of other, a lot of other licenses were increased too. And it's not just scuffle increases that went into this entire program. I know it's not just the observer program, but it was small portions of say like P number increases and whatnot also went into that. We'll have to, I'll have to, we'll have to go back and, and verify that or check on that because I, I, I believe don't. I'm right. So well, we'll, we'll, we can double check and, and let you know. Sure. <clears throat> other questions, comments. All right, great. Thank you for your report. You. Appreciate that. Uh, Director, we, you've got just one more report under uh, your, your section. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. I, I've got an update on Southern Flounder and uh, then just a couple of staff updates, and then I'll be, I'll be done. Okay. What I'm thinking we might do is take up the false albacore before lunch because we are moving a little bit ahead and take a real short break right now. Let's take a 10-minute break and see y'all back promptly in 10. Thank you.
Okay, 10 minutes is up. Let's get our seats back and. Can you see them? We're doing our best to. No, share. see, so, they're not well, there. They're not there now because yeah. their cameras are off. Okay. But when their cameras are on, they should be at the Okay, top. that'll be fine. When we share the presentations, if we don't. Hey, Rob, can you hear me? Okay. My camera's on. Can you see me there? Uh, we cannot see you, but we can hear you. Check your camera. It's on. Your camera's on? Yep. All right. Let me get my hammer and I'll, I'll hit it. Yeah. Yeah, do that. Do that a couple times. Yeah. That'll help. <laughs> Look, if I can't see you or... Doug, if y'all have something to say, just speak out, and I'll, I'll catch you. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. uh, Marine Patrol, would y'all stick your head out in the hallway, see if we got some commissioners out there floating around? Okay, thank you. Where? Thank you. Goldfish. Appropriate. Man. Holding out on us. I don't, but I was just sitting. I, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, I was just sitting there thinking to myself. We'll get y'all together at dinner again. Size of those goldfish. Okay, I think the only one we're missing is Commissioner Blanton. Why don't we go ahead and start your presentation and um, go catch up, I guess, when he comes in. Rob, here. Mr. Chairman, yes. if I could just add one yes, thing please. to Commissioner Roller's question about the funding for the Observer Program. Yeah. On page 229 of your rule book, um, which covers stat statute 113173.1, um, and I'm going to just kind of read off what the – what the increased fees apply to uh, standard commercial fishing license two hundred dollar increase uh, two hundred dollar increase one hundred dollars from each uh, retired um, standard commercial fishing license twenty five dollars from each shellfish license fifty dollars from each fish dealer license two hundred dollars from each land or sale license and thirty five dollars from each recreational commercial gear license uh, is the fee increase and it's in the statute if you want to look at it, but that's, yeah, sorry, sorry, got that back to you. That's good. All right. Okay, let's hear about, well, director. Yeah, so, and so I want, Jeff Dobbs is the species lead for base scallops, and I wanted him to just give um, a brief overview of our sampling uh, directed at C Commissioner Cross's question about uh, scallop abundance down south. Uh, thank you, Chair and Director and Commissioners. So I'm Jeff Dobbs, the Bay Scout Bleed. Um, as you're aware, we had a season in Core Sound this year uh, because we did have an increase in abundance. It's actually the best we've seen since uh, the mid-2000s. So it's really nice. This is a three-year trend that's kind of built on itself. It's been increasing. And the abundance was above the 50% trigger all the way to the 75, which is unprecedented for the past decade. Um, from what we heard from fishermen, it's been really great. The densities are awesome. The grass has kind of died back, so they're not doing a lot of damage with the treading. There's uh, they're just a lot of scallops sitting on bare bottom. So it's been great in Core Sound. We did get uh, calls from fishermen in the Pamlico Sound area. They told us where they were. We went and sampled. There just wasn't quite enough there to, 
to hit the trigger sampling. Areas south of Bogue Sound, um, we heard a little bit that there was some down there. There's no actual um, triggers in place for the amendment. It's a judgment call made by the director. Um, and we saw a modest increase in abundance, but it's really driven by one station. So they weren't widespread, um, pretty patchy, and we just didn't have the numbers that we felt comfortable opening it. But I do want to reiterate that if fishermen are seeing them in areas, we don't necessarily, you know, we're not omniscient. We don't know where they're all at. So please let us know, communicate that to us, and we'll get the sampling done during our trigger sampling. Good enough. Um, I gave it to Laura, but the area I was talking about earlier, I just got the feedback on. Uh, 277 Riverside Drive, Sneeds Ferry, so it's down that past restaurant down there. And, you know, the one thing that happens when you have an unexpected increase like this, there's no preparation for a season or no preparation for buying because nobody expects it to be coming on. So um, it's relatively important to be notified way in advance that y'all are seeing this getting ready to happen because if you don't, this this market doesn't exist anymore because we don't have the capture every year to plan on it. So we have to redevelop, redefine the wheel basically every year to sell this product. So just keep that in mind when you're seeing this kind of data come up because it's, you know, if we don't have an inkling this is going to happen, you can't, you can't develop this overnight. And I just want to respond to that. I just want to say um, when we did our October sampling, we actually had some issues with a lot of the, the grass dying off later. Um, so we weren't seeing the densities that we saw in our January sampling, but we heard from fishermen that they were there. And in response, we resampled in January and we did find them and we were able to open it. Um, and that was due to people communicating with us and letting us know. But that's where the, the short... Uh, notice came from this year. Generally, we would know in October. Also, um, do, do you attribute this increase to the much higher salinity levels we're seeing everywhere, or what do you attribute this increase to? I couldn't say. Um, that would take a lot more study. Uh, it's already, you know, as you know, pretty contentious to say what's driving Bay Scout populations. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Roller? So, I mean, I, I love bay scallops, and I love going and in, in, in collecting them. It's really exciting to have a season in the last couple of years. Um, but I want to go back to Commissioner Cross's comment regarding the predictability of it. I think back to the 2000s, and we had two seasons, one in South Core Sound and one in North Core Sound. Um, and that was, like, very similar to this year in South Core Sound. There's big numbers. But it fell off very fast. Isn't it, isn't it fair to say that they don't live very long, and even a couple, like if you get a really bad cold event, it can kill a lot of them. I mean, that's what we saw, I, it was like 2009 or something like that. So in trying to predict this, that just eats, it, it, it increases the unpredictability of this volatile fishery. Is that fair to say? So Yeah, it's considered a yearly stock. Um, you know, these ebbs and flows are nearly impossible to predict. We have seen a nice trend since 2020 of increasing abundance across the state, um, specifically in Core Sound. But yeah, there's no way to know. In 2009, when we had that opening, um, immediately the next year it crashed off. Have no idea what to attribute that to. Um, but yeah, very unpredictable. And Commissioner Shell. Um, is reporting on our trip tickets enough for these? Like when I see them, I always write it on my trip ticket, anything I see in the marsh. Is that effective enough or should fishermen be emailing someone directly? Like you guys, of I, course. I do get your notes. I appreciate those. Okay. Um, yeah, we, those are uh, given to me and to the other species leads by the trip, tip, trip ticket staff. But um, feel free to call me whenever you see them, especially when we get October is the trigger sampling for core sound, bug sound, and areas back sound in areas south of Bug Sound. And then January is the typical trigger sampling uh, for Pamlico Sound. So leading into those months, um, if anybody sees them and they, they want us to look at an area, please relay that to me and we'll get staff out there. I actually go out in the field. It's one of my few times I get to. Um, <laughs> and we go to those specific locations and look for them. Right. You again. Just one last question, I'm sorry. Is there any correlation between the uh, numbers of cow nose rays and the way this stock fluctuates and whatnot? I mean, is it basically, I mean, I've seen years, that's what, you know, everybody says they predate upon. I'm just curious. 
I mean, as as you're alluding to, there's been a lot of research done about predation on base gallops from cow nose rays, but we don't really have a handle on what, how predation plays into it, especially recently. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Director? Thank you, and thank you, uh, Jeff, for that update. Hopefully that helps with uh, Commissioner Cross's questions. Uh, so moving on with um, Southern Flounder um, landings update from this past season, as you're all aware, we sent out a news release on February the 13th announcing that we would not be opening the spring isolated flounder season in the ocean. We received a lot of questions about how this season is determined, and I've asked Ann to cover that for you today as part of her presentation, and we've also updated our frequently asked questions document on the website to try and help uh, with some of these questions. And now I'll hand it over to Ann and Holly. All right. Thank you, Director. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. My name is Ann Markwith, Southern Flounder Lead, and with me is the new Southern Flounder Co-Lead. Good, good morning, Commissioners. My name is Holly White, and I'm the new Flounder Co-Lead. I'm based out of the Elizabeth City office. So we wanted you to put a face to a name. Um, at the May 2022 business meeting, y'all passed a motion adopting Amendment 3, and today we are here to provide an update on the landings that have occurred since implementation of Amendment 3 and how these compare to what was seen under Amendment 2. We will briefly review the statutory requirements and estimated reductions needed, what landings were, and the associated reductions that were achieved through Amendment 2 in the first year of Amendment 3. For the benefit of the new commissioners, we wanted to provide some background on the requirements needed to rebuild the stock. Amendment 3 built on the seasonal closures from Amendment 2 and directed the division to implement quotas with paybacks to reduce total harvest in the southern flounder fishery by 72% for the North Carolina portion of the stock. This reduction is from the 2017 removals or the terminal year of the last stock assessment and the reduction is greater than the statutorily required minimum in order to increase the chance of success by being more conservative. Whoop. For stocks that are overfished and undergoing overfishing, North Carolina's Fishery Reform Act requires that overfishing be ended in two years and the stock rebuilt in 10 years. For flounder, the reduction needed to end overfishing is between 31 and 51 percent. However, this is not enough to rebuild the stock. The reduction needed to rebuild the stock and end the overfish status is between 52 and 72 percent. The 10-year time period to rebuild the stock started with the adoption of Amendment 2 in 2019 and ends in 2028. So since we will be looking at this table a lot today, I just wanted to orient you to what's going on. This table shows the allowed and actual total removals while under Amendment 2 from 2019 to 2021 and the first year of Amendment 3 in 2022 compared to the 2017 removals. Any overages are reported, as is the percent reduction that was achieved. Additionally, the last column shows the amount of escapement or what was not harvested compared to 2017 that occurred based on the reduction. It should be noted that the Amendment 2 values are presented as the average of the three years of management under this amendment. The purpose of this was so that we can compare how the fishery performed in general under Amendment 2 compared to the first year of Amendment 3. A quick reminder about the values for the 2022 removals, that these are still considered preliminary and may change slightly when final. Also, 2022 marks the first year that allocations in the fisheries were in place, and these allocations changed from the historic values of 72% commercial and 28% recreational to 70% commercial and 30% recreational. When comparing the landings from Amendment 3 to those from Amendment 2, management measures enacted under Amendment 3 better constrain the removals to the reduction needed. In 2022, the first year that Amendment 3 was in place, there was an overall reduction of 70% from the 2017 values. The commercial fishery achieved a reduction of 74%, and the recreational fishery achieved a reduction of 59%. This is the first year that both fisheries, fisheries individually have met or exceeded the 52% minimum needed to rebuild the stock. Highlighted here are the overages for the commercial fishery under Amendment 2 in the first year of Amendment 3 
as well as the percent reduction when compared to 2017. In 2022, the commercial fishery total removals, the harvest and dead discards, were under their total allowable catch or TAC by 10,746 pounds, equating a reduction of 74%. This was greater than the average reduction achieved under Amendment 2. So the commercial fishery is managed under five specific gear area quota combinations. This table shows these areas, the total allowable landings or quota for each, and what was actually landed during these seasons, as well as if there were any overages. During the, the open season, these quotas are monitored daily so that managers can shut down the fishery in the areas as needed. While overall, the commercial fishery was at 97% of their total allowable landings or TAL, two gear area combinations, the central and southern pound net management areas, did exceed their allocations. The overages in these two areas will be deducted from their individual TALs for the 2023 season, and this change in the TAL can be seen in the far right column labeled 2023 allowable landings. So highlighted here are the overages for the recreational fishery under Amendment 2 and the first year of Amendment 3, as well as the percent reduction when compared to 2017. In 2022, the recreational fishery total removals exceeded their, their TAC by 51,666 pounds, equating a reduction of 59%. This reduction is the first time in four years of management that the recreational fishery has met or exceeded the 52% reduction needed to rebuild the stock. This can be attributed to the more comprehensive management strategies under Amendment 3, in particular the one fish bag limit that helped to constrain harvest during the season. The overage of the TAC in the 2022 recreational fishery is, most light, is mostly due to the number of dead discards during and outside of the season. The recreational fishery did exceed their towel by 11,661 pounds. However, the number of discards outside the flounder season was equal, if not greater, to those during the season, contributing to approximately 80% of the overage. The total overage will be accounted for when determining the 2023 fall season. So as Kat said, we did want to take a minute here to kind of explain the difference between TAC and TAL, or Director Rawls said, we do want to take a minute to here to talk about TAC and TAL and how we determine overages in the fishery, um, particularly because there has been some public confusion and we wanted to make sure that you as commissioners understand the process as well. So as you can see from the text boxes on the bottom of the slide, the calculations for the recreational sector are a, a little more, not as straightforward and slightly more nuanced than those for the commercial fishery. As a reminder, the difference between TAL or total allowable landings and TAC or total allowable catch is that the estimated dead discards are added to the total allowable landings which creates the TAC. This TAC value is ultimately is managed to for each fishery and will help dictate what paybacks are for a sector. We do not manage the fisheries in real time to the TAC because estimates of dead discards are not available until after the season, so we manage to the TAL during the seasons. And so I'm gonna apologize for this slide right now because there is a lot going on, but I think it's necessary for you to understand our process. Um, so this is just laying out how we calculate the overages in the recreational fishery if there are any for a given year. And for the recreational fishery, there are estimates for both hook and line and the gig fisheries. Um, the hook and line landings and dead discards come from the MREP sampling, while the gig landings and dead discards are from the gig mail survey that the License and Statistics section conducts every year. Just as a note, these estimates are current as of February 17th, 2023. Um, so they include everything from wave six, so the full year worth of recreational data, um, but are still considered preliminary. Um, so I'm gonna start with the landings as this is the most straightforward part. So the hook and line Southern Flounder landings from MRIP were 163,485 pounds. The lands from the landings from the gig survey were 700, 7,882 pounds. The total combined landings for the recreational fishery for 2022 was 
100,071,367 100, pounds. So the next, so if you look at the total removals column on the right hand of the slide, you can see that 171,000 pounds is above the recreational towel of 159,706. Moving on to the dead discards, um, just as a note, dead discards are in numbers because people don't actually see them, so we don't obtain a weight for them, so we do convert from numbers to pounds for the dead discards. Um, so the value of all, we're gonna start first with MRIP and move on to the gig survey. To determine the hook and line discards, we look at the value of all flounder discards determined by MRIP. These mostly come from the left eye flounder genus, genus but we do also include discards that are speciated. Um, an annual species, and for 2022, this number was 3,200,046 fish. An annual species ratio from the observed catch of southern, summer, and gulf flounder is applied to the total number of flounder discards. Um, so in 2022, when this ratio was applied, this equates to 2,682,727 fish. Um, to determine the weight of the discards, the number of fish is then multiplied by 0.21 pounds, which results in 563,373 pounds of discarded southern flounder. This 0.21 pounds conversion factor that we use was derived from South Carolina DNR tagging data and was used both in the stock assessment and for the FMPs in calculating the dead discard value for the hook and line fishery. The weight of the southern flounder discards is then multiplied by a discard mortality rate of 9%. And the 2022 hook and line dead discard landings or dead discards were 50,704 pounds. So to determine the gig fishery discards, this is a lot simpler. There were 109 uh, fish reported through the survey that were discarded. The, these Fish are then multiplied by 0.23 pounds, an average weight of 0.23 pounds, and the discard mortality for the gig fishery is assumed to be 100%. And again, this, the weight value as well as the discard mortality were used in both the stock assessment and the FMPs. So this results for 250 pounds of dead discards from the gig fishery for a total of 50,951 pounds of dead discards. Um, when you add the landings plus the dead discards together, you get 222,321 pounds, which is over the tack of 170,655. So that is a lot. Um, if there are any questions when we're done, I will take them, but we did want to make sure y'all understood the process for this. So overall, the fishery removed 588,954 pounds or 40,000 920 pounds over the allowed removals. This equates a 69.7% reduction compared to 2017 and is greater than the average reduction achieved through Amendment 2 management. The reductions achieved through the seasonal management under Amendment 2 met the minimum statutory requirements for North Carolina's portion of the Southern Flounder stock to end overfishing, but did not meet the rebuilding threshold. Amendment 2 is a blunt tool needed to curtail harvest, and Amendment 3 built on the process progress started by Amendment 2 and implemented comprehensive and long-term management strategies at a much finer scale. Over the last four years, there has been a reduction of 49%. However, we only expect this value to improve under Amendment 3 management. The reduction from one year under Amendment 3 was the greatest to date, and there are still at least six more years of management under this amendment. Another way to look at this data is to look at the percentage of each group in the relation to the total removals in 2017. These figures represent the reductions achieved under Amendment 2 and Amendment 3 thus far. The gray pieces of the pie chart represent the percentage of reduction which equates to escapement of fish that were not harvested by either sector. You can also see the changes in the commercial and recreational removals and percentages relative to the total removals, the commercial are in blue and the recreational in striped orange. While under Amendment 2, under Amendment 2, while there were, was a reduction in removals by both sectors, there was a 43% increase in escapement overall. 
Perhaps more exciting when you compare 2017 removals to Amendment 3, the amount of escapement that occurred in 2022 is almost equivalent to what had been the commercial removals and the recreational and commercial removals combined have been reduced to just 30% of what they were in 2017. You can see that we are starting to make strides to where we need to be. So overall, the overall reductions have met the minimum statutory requirements for the North Carolina portion of the Southern Flounder stock to end overfishing. While the overall reduction from the last four years has not met the rebuilding threshold, two of the four years were at that minimum or above, including 2022. The reduction achieved in 2022, the first year of Amendment 3, was the highest so far. There is still some work to be done. For example, we had an overage to the recreational tax, which thanks to the one fish bag limit was not nearly as high as it had been the previous year. And there were two overages in the commercial towels, but the tack was not exceeded. With the strategies adopted under Amendment 3, including adaptive management, um, these types of reductions that we saw with amend overall reductions we saw with Amendment 3 should continue and aid in rebuilding the stock by 2028. Additionally, and I think Director Rawls mentioned this in the November meeting, we will be doing an update to the stock assessment this year with data through 2022. And this will act as a pulse check to determine how the stock is recovering. So this completes our review of the 2022 Southern Flounder landings. And at this time, we would be happy to take any questions. Questions, Commissioner Roller. Got a few real basic ones. One may be for the director, so I'll start with you guys. Um, are you seeing any trends in the wreck catch data? I mean, are we seeing less trips, more trips? I mean, how much have you sourced out of that? So currently, we don't have that for 2022. Um, based on the management under Amendment 2, we saw similar, if not higher, numbers of trips in the catch rate go up under Amendment 2 when we had a four fish bag limit, but I, we have not delved into that for the, for amendment three. So I know the catch rates will be down just because we changed the bag limit, but I'm just not sure what the trips look like. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's kind of what I'm getting at. I'm just curious to how angler behavior based off of moving from four fish to one fish, right? Right. So right. It, it, and, among gigs and hook and line and so on and so forth. Yeah. And we can definitely see that with the gigs because the, the gig landings were the lowest they've been in a long time. Um, we can work on getting you the catch, the trip le level information. Um, I'm not exactly sure how long that'll take, but we can work on getting you that. But I think that'd be helpful for us understanding, particularly looking at future management of the species. Yes, I agree. Um, so I know we had talked about that we were going to see if there's a way to have like rec reporting for this. You know, um, where are we at on that? Um, and I may have to defer to Cat or Director Rawls or... That was not my question for the director, but, to go, but okay, go ahead. But I, 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 I am going to defer to her for that. <laughs> just to be clear, maybe we'll stay on that side. So, Yeah, just, just to update on that, we were working with the Wildlife Resources Commission on a way to capture recreational reporting uh, for flounder and... It basically is on hold right now and delayed because they are moving forward with a new um, system, reporting system uh, as well. And with the effort that has taken them to work on their new system for their data collections as well, we're just in a kind of a holding pattern for that particular um, item. On hold, but still moving forward. Yes, we, we, well, it's on hold right now until they get the new system in place, their new system in place, and then at that time, I think, is that correct, Brandy, that we will be, continue to move uh, forward with that. Okay. I'm not sure what the timing on that would be. I don't think we, Brandy might have some more information. Hi, so I'm Brandy Salmon. I'm the section chief for the licensing and statistics section. Um, and so we um, work with WRC on their licensing system um, for Cruffles for coastal recreational fishing licenses. And their system is, um, I don't want to say ancient, <laughs> um, but it needs updates. And so they actually decided last year, year before, that they wanted to go with a developer that will create a new a system for issuing licenses. That same system is what they use for their call-in system for deer tags and things like that, which is what we were piggybacking off of for the flounder call-in system. And because they're developing that new system, which they were hoping to go live in the summer of this year, 
they have put the call-in system on hold because it is going to change with the new with the new product. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I do have one. Okay. So, thank you for that, Brandy. I think that's really important because this discussion about like increased recreational accountability is obviously pervasive at every level of fisheries management. And the one real question that I have here is when it's used as, a, as against the recreational industry, I just always have to ask, are we getting the resources we need to move forward with something better? And typically the answer to that is no, but I'm happy that you guys are doing this. So my last question is, and this is just more, I think, to get it on the record and discuss for the public, you chose to not have the oscillated season and going back to some of those grumpy social media posts, I just think it may be helpful just to get uh, the director to kind of comment on why you can't have that season opening, if that's okay. Yeah, and I think that just covering that in terms of the resource itself and just really erring on the side of the resource. And I understand the issue with the public and the concern from the public, but the plan basically lays out for us that if we exceed the tack for the recreational fishery that we would not move forward with an isolated season. And that's the situation that we are in. So that really was the deciding factor. Um, about that and that we feel feel like that that is a um, a more research friendly approach and again that was discussed in the plan and the adaptive management of the plan that if we were exceeding the the, the tax that we would not have an isolated season just because and, and granted that season date was set that if we could have it in hopes that those dates would prevent a lot of interaction with southern flounder. So we, we understand that. But again, I think it's just uh, to err on the side of the resource and not move forward with opening those seasons if we exceeded the, the tack. And even though that your data said that that picked oscillated season was virtually 100% oscillated flounder and averaged, what, about 1,000 pounds of recreational harvest a year? So it was really, really small. I think most of our debate wasn't on whether it would close due to an overage, but like, wow, this is so small, what's the point, right? Yeah, and, and, I, and I totally understand that. And from the public's perception, I understand that too. And we, we, we struggle with that internally as in developing the plan and talking about this season and uh, the selecting the dates and, and then the, because it really is kind of like, and I get this from the public, it's kind of like you, we dangled a carrot and said, here's a potential, and then it's like, no, nope, I'm not doing that. So I, I totally understand, but I do think that uh, the plan is clear on that, and that was a large part of the discussion about this season and the potential for it. All right. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question? Ah, or, or, right or get in the okay. queue. I'll get in the. I'll get in the queue. Go ahead. You're good. You go ahead. Okay. I, I, I'm interested, as I know we all are, in understanding how. Um, achieving these results will contribute to rebuilding on the uh, statutory time time frame, given the number of years that are left. Uh, and I assume that we'll get a more quantitative response to that once the stock assessment update is done this year. But do you have any preliminary ideas about what could be expected if this kind of performance is continued over the over the next about five seasons or so? You said it would contribute, but I just wonder what whether uh, we are on track to actually hit that rebuilding uh, outcome on the time frame originally required. Um, and that that's a really good question. But as you stated, the stock assessment really is going to be that pulse check um, for how the fisheries operating, because while things look look like they're doing good. Um, indices tend to be up or we've constrained the landings. We d In North Carolina, we do have to remember that this stock is a coastwide stock and also takes into account South Carolina, Georgia, and the east coast of Florida. So until we have all their data and can put it into the model, it's very hard to say how, um, how the stock is doing right now in a quantitative way. A uh, quick response, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, could you comment uh, non-quantitatively on what the contributions towards coastwide management those other states have made and the way they interact with this 
in terms of the likely contribution that the region is making towards rebuilding? Again, I, I know that it all depends upon the quantification through the stock assessment update, but I just wonder where things stand. And again, I'm ignorant of what's been happening. No worries. Um, so currently both Florida and South Carolina have put management in place because they operate, all the states operate slightly differently and this is not under a federal management agency. They're held to how their, their states do management. South Carolina had to go through their legislature and was not able to pass um, management until July of 2021. Um, which where they increased the size limit, decreased their bag limits, and from everything the biologists said um, should meet at minimum that 52% reduction. Florida put management in place in, I think, March of 2021, where they have some closed seasons, they, changed, they increased their size limit and um, changed their bag limit. Um, so, and I, I think they're in the same boat as South Carolina where that those management measures should meet at minimum that 52%. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Blanton, did you have a question? I did. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, Commissioner Rader just touched on partial of what my question was going to be, but Pertaining to the other states, has there been any realized reductions analyzed in solid data since 2021 um, of realized reductions in those fisheries? Um, for the other states, you mean? For the other states. Um, we have not looked at that data yet for the 2020. Like, we did not look at that data to see if they had. Um, but that, again... When we come back with some information for Commissioner Roller, we can see what we can put together, maybe similar to what we have. Um, but but keep bearing in mind the stock assessment's really going to be the end all be all for that. Sure. Yeah, I just would be interested to see if in other states the trend of their action, if it has, you know, produced any amount of reduction um, on paper. I will say just the harvest in South Carolina did increase in 2022 for the recreational fishery, so it did not decrease based on their management action. Um, Florida's, Florida's recreational landings, I think, decreased slightly from 2021. Um, and then both have a minimal component of a commercial fishery. So I, in that regard, you know, the landings did at least in South Carolina, it did increase. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Go, go. Oh, I'm sorry. You, know, you go ahead. I'll, this I'm is real, just a real quick comment, mostly. Um, I, you know, I, I've had some discussions with South Carolina DNR staff regarding the Southern Flounder, and their basic comments were, wow, we're seeing some again. So that's what kind of their surprise. They've really struggled with that fishery, and all of a sudden, the last couple of years, they've started to see a greater abundance, therefore increasing catch. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay, I got a couple for y'all. Um, you say you s assign a poundage for dead discards. What What is that poundage that you that assign? That poundage, and I will go back to that slide so you can see it. So the poundage for the gig discards is 2.3 pounds. How about hook and line? 0 0.21 pounds, so about a quarter pound. Okay. And the reason for that difference just has to do with... Um, the gig fishery, we're assuming if it's discarded, was probably just barely sublegal. Um, and then with the hook and line fishery, there's really no telling what's at the end of your hook. And so the regulatory discards for the hook and line fishery, if you average them over all the size classes of fish you could catch, based on the South Carolina data, it's point okay. a quarter pound. All right. And did I hear it correctly that you said, <clears throat> excuse me, that the commercial town increased, but the tack decreased? No, no, no. Um, so, I'm, I, so I knew the, I couldn't be here now, right? So the tack is going to stay the same for next year um, because we're still at that 70-30 split. The towel will decrease slightly because there were overages for two of the, the area gear combinations. Okay, I got you now. And this is the year we start the stock assessment, correct? Yes, sir. So we will start the stock assessment probably we 
should have all the data by July and it'll include data through 2022. And if there's no issues, we will be coming back to you next February with next the results. Next February. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Commissioner Cross. <clears throat> the two towel overages that were, uh, I believe, pound net overages, will they be, those areas be held accountable for the, you know, yes, sir. it'll be, it, it'll it'll be an area only, overage? It will be an area gear overage. So they will only be applied to where, where the fishery went over. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Great. Thank you for your presentation, Director. Thank you all very much for that. <clears throat> it's always good to get through a flounder discussion. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, just to go back to something that we wanted to include in our Coastal Habitat Protection Plan discussion, and I wanted to just bring that up really quickly before I give a few staff updates. So the division is working with the other, uh, the three commissions that are involved in the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan to schedule a joint commission meeting. And I think September is that what we're shooting for, I think. Anyway, it's still in the works, but we have discussed that with Chairman Bizzle and the, we've contacted other directors to reach out to their chairs as well for the, the EMC and the CRC as well as the MSC, and we would all be meeting uh, in one meeting that is just dedicated to uh, talking about the CHIP and the responsibilities of the various divisions and commissions in implementation of the the, the uh, coastal habitat protection plan. So I just wanted to let folks know that that's in the works um, for later on this year. And, and we're, um, we're reaching out to the other chairs to, to work on scheduling something. <clears throat> so I wanna just finish up with a few staff updates. The first would be to, I think most folks are aware by now, but Mike Leffler has been uh, promoted to the deputy director of the Division of Marine Fisheries. And Mike has been with the division uh, 23 years. He spent most of his career working in the fisheries management section and most of it out of the Elizabeth City office. I think most of you know him from his recent responsibilities as a southern flounder uh, species lead and then recently a biologist supervisor in our Manio office. And Mike definitely has some pretty big shoes to fill in replacing uh, Deputy Director D. Lupton, who retired after 30 years of service with the state, and she was in the Deputy Director position for 15 years. Uh, Mike is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the division and many other things, and I look forward to uh, working with him in his new role. So the Coastal Angling Program, I'd like to welcome Jeff Moore, I think. Jeff is in the office or was in the office, um, I mean, in the, at the meeting. And Jeff has his hands full with uh, the work that's going on with the Coastal Angling Program. And we welcome Jeff aboard and looking forward to working with him as well. Just a report uh, from our age lab biologist, uh, Sarah Pace. She recently uh, had an article published in the uh, Journal of Marine Biology titled Population Dynamics of Ocean Cahog. I'm not going to try to do the uh, scientific name off of Long Island and an analysis of sex-based demographics and regional comparisons. And she and her co-authors investigated the age and population structure of ocean clams and described the recruitment dynamics of this important Atlantic coast fishery. And of particular interest, the research uh, identified the oldest age ever recorded uh, for an ocean caw hog was 310 years old. I had, I'd had no idea that that's how old those things got. But anyway, Sarah, I don't think Sarah's here, but if anybody's interested in that or like to speak with her further, please uh, please don't hesitate to contact her because as most of our staff, they love talking about their published work and they would be more than happy to, to talk to you about that. So a few retirements to mention. Uh, after 19 years of service with the division, Stan Ward of the Manio office retired in December. His career started with the habitat enhancement, working on our oyster barge uh, planting culch material, and then he moved into a full-time position with the fisheries management section, conducting fisheries independent surveys. Uh, he was endeared and respected by his coworkers, and he made a lasting impression on everyone he worked with. And if you've ever talked to Stan, you'd never forget it. I promise you that. Um, he is enjoying retirement with his wife, Susan, and Manio, and he makes sure to send the staff in Manio plenty of pictures of him out fishing uh, during the weekday. So good, good for Stan. Uh, Marty Brill has also retired with 20 years of service uh, in November, and he was the commercial port agent in Manio uh, for the trip ticket program. Uh, most of us know him as Captain Marty. Uh, he was replaced by Haley Clinton, who was hired in January of 2023. 
And the last retirement that we have is uh, Jeff French. He recently retired after 38 years of service. And many of you may not know Jeff, but he worked in both our marine fisheries uh, and public health in our state. He worked with the Division Shellfish Sanitation and Recreational Water Quality Program since 1999. But he also worked with the Division Resource uh, Enhancement Section prior to that. And his most recent duties uh, included extension, outreach, and inspections of shellfish processing facilities in the western part of the state. So many of you uh, may not have known Jeff. Um, he served as a liaison to the local health departments by providing expertise in molluscan shellfish and general seafood safety. And one of his notable contributions has been the continued coordination of the North Carolina Seafood Quality and Safety Workshop, which targets the education of North Carolina Health Department staff. Uh, Jeff was awarded the Richard Deirdrickson Award in 2018, which is an award that recognizes health professionals that made a significant contribution uh, in the design, development, and implementation of programs that enhance and improve the public health practice in North Carolina. Jeff served a very vital role for us here at the Division of Marine Fisheries, and he, he will absolutely be missed. So thank you for all the retirees and for their service to the state. And Mr. Chairman, that's, that's going to conclude my report. Okay, any questions? All right. Um, I was hoping to do our false albacore paper before lunch, but I definitely don't want to rush anything. Why don't we go ahead and take a lunch break? Maybe we can beat everybody to the restaurants and uh, be back here. Yeah, let's say 1 o'clock. That would be a, a good time. Good for everybody. We do have a restaurant here. I was supposed to do a cheap plug for it. Didn't get a free tea or anything, but uh, we got a restaurant here now. Uh, seems like they do a fair amount of seafood stuff and some more conventional stuff. I'll leave a menu up here in case anybody wants to look at it and make it up your minds. So see you all back at 1 o'clock.
Okay, everybody, it's one o'clock. Time for us to reconvene. Grab your seats. Cell phones on mute, please. How was your lunch? Good. I just didn't want to get on the road. Hey, looks like all of our commissioners are in place. Okay. Um, we are now at our false Albacore information paper overview. McLean Seward and Ann Markwit. Good afternoon. Um, can you hear me? No. Check your green light. He's just here. All right, good afternoon. Um, my name is McLean Seward, and with me is Ann Markwith. Today we are here to present to you the update to the false Albacore information paper from 2017. As a reminder, at its August 2022 business meeting, you requested staff update an information paper on false Albacore to frame potential management options for future consideration. Today, during the presentation on this information, we will, be, we will quickly go over the life history of false albacore, followed by the uh, stock status of the species and a brief management history for those who may not be as familiar with it. We will also review landings information for North Carolina, as well as how the state compares to the South Atlantic and whole Western Atlantic coast. And finally, we will review data needs and the division recommendation. Okay, uh, false albacore is one of the most common members of the mackerel tuna family and is typically found in tropical to temperate waters of the Atlantic Ocean, Gulf of Mexico, and Caribbean Sea. It's also found in the Mediterranean and Black Seas. Uh, they're an oceanic schooling species that migrates north in the spring and south in the fall and winter. Uh, it's a fast-growing species reaching sexual maturity in as little as one year or 13.6 uh, inches fork length. And it is cons generally considered fairly short-lived, as most uh, studies estimate the maximum age of false albacore at five years. However, some studies estimate the age to be up to nine. There we go, sorry. Okay, and it should be noted that most of the life history information we have for this fish is from studies carried out elsewhere in their range. Um, there's very little information available for the Western Atlantic. Okay, so little information exists on the status of the species in the South Atlantic, um, and as a result, their status is considered unknown. Until 2011, false albacore was part of the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council's Coastal Migratory Pelagics Fisheries Management Plan. Although there were no management measures under the plan, data collection was an important component. Amendment 18 to the plan removed false albacore from the management unit since data would still be collected through current sampling regimes. And when false albacore was under South Atlantic jurisdiction, 
It was managed in North Carolina through the interjurisdictional FMP, although no limits were put in place. The ability to manage under the North Carolina interjurisdictional FMP ended when the species was removed from the coastal migratory pelagics FMP. And at this time, there are no rules for management in place for false albacore in North Carolina. In 2022, false albacore management has been discussed again at the council level. Um, though the council has chosen at this point to monitor trends in the fishery through fishery performance reports. And additionally, the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council did not include false albacore in their unmanaged forage fish amendment in 2016 because of their large size and higher trophic level. At the same time, the Mid-Atlantic staff recommended the council consider developing management actions in the future, including a small tuna FMP. However, this has not been pursued. False albacore has become a more popular and targeted fishery in recent years, especially for the recreational sector. Participants associated with the fishery have expressed concern over perceived increases in harvest in targeted trips of the species to both state and federal level managers. Coastwide, there are no known commercial or recreational regulations currently in place to, di to directly manage false albacore at the state or federal level. Okay, so moving from management history, we will review a little bit of North Carolina's landings of false albacore. And to orient you to this figure and most of the figures on the PowerPoint, uh, landings in pounds are on the y-axis while years are on the x-axis. And this figure represents the last 25 years of landings, um, commercial landings of false albacore represented by the gray line and recreational landings represented by the black line have historically been low and variable. However, over the last decade, in North Carolina and coastwide, false albacore landings have increased from a low in 2006 and have been above the time series average since 2013. The recreational and commercial time series average, which is represented by the broken black line, um, are almost equal with the recreational average just slightly higher. The next several slides will address the North Carolina recreational fishery. Um, one thing to point out as we go through the next few slides is that these figures will be in numbers of fish um, as we will be comparing recreational landings and discards since discards are only available in numbers of fish. Um, so this figure represents the recre recreational harvest in numbers of fish in state versus federal waters on the y-axis on the left as well as the number of directed trips on the y-axis on the right side of this figure. And since 20, er, 1997, trips targeting false albacore in North Carolina have been variable and mostly occur in state waters. Um, following a low in 2012, total targeted trips represented by the dashed line and the y-axis on the right have steadily increased and appears to be what is driving the landings. As you can see from this figure, the average percent of the recreational harvest in North Carolina has historically occurred in federal waters, represented by the gray bars. However, harvest has increased in state waters since 2014, shown by the black bars. And while we know the economic impact of the false albacore fishery, recreational fishery is likely significant, currently this analysis is unavailable, so the impact cannot be quantified. Additionally, the variance around the data needed to put into an economic impact model is so high that results may not provide a true reflection of the fishery. Okay, moving into released fish. Um, this figure represents recreational releases in numbers of fish in state versus federal waters. And an important thing to note when looking at this figure is the scale when compared to the previous figure is almost double as recreational releases tend to be much higher than the numbers landed. As we see, as was seen with harvest, the number of releases in state waters has increased in recent years. In the past 10 years, releases have, av releases have averaged about 76% of the recreational catch. The figure in this slide represents recreational catch rates and landings and releases in state and federal waters calculated for North Carolina anglers from 2012 to 2021. 
As you can see from this figure, recreational anglers land less than one fish per trip, regardless of where they are fishing, though landings per trip range from zero to 12 fish, and recreational releases range from zero to 30 fish per trip during the same time frame. Harvest from state and federal waters tends to be the same, but more fish are released in state waters. So now let's talk about the commercial sector. In North Carolina, false albacore is incidentally caught by commercial fishers pursuing other species. This figure represents commercial harvest in pounds of fish in, in state versus federal waters on the y-axis on the left, as well as the number of trips landing false albacore on the y-axis on the right side of this figure. In the early 2000s, landings tended to be higher in federal waters. This shifted in recent years with more landings coming from state waters. And it should be noted, however, that for most of this time series, regardless of the area, landings tended to be similar. The number of trips landing false albacore represented by the dashed line um, vary over the time series with little trend, indicating value and availability could be driving the landings. The price per pound of false albacore has ranged from a low of 16 cents in 1999 to a, uh, a high of a dollar per pound in 2021. Landings per trip of false albacore in North Carolina have been low but variable, and um, over the past 10 years, 60% of all commercial trips landing false albacore landed less than 50 pounds per trip. Um, However, while rare, occasionally multiple thousands of pounds can be, per trip can be landed. And while we don't have uh, estimates of discards currently available for the commercial fishery, discards are likely low due to the increase in the market value of this species. Um, the two figures on this slide show the size of false albacore caught by North Carolina fishers. Fork length is on the y-axis, and the size of the bubbles on the plot represent the proportion at size. The size of false albacore has remained stable over the past 25 years, uh, with an average length of 23 inches for both sectors. Looking at, this, at these plots, there's no evidence of size truncation occurring in the false albacore fishery in North Carolina. Um, additionally, it is important to point out that the average size of the fish caught is well above the length at maturity of 13.6 inches, which is re represented by the horizontal line um, in the figures. Okay, now that we've reviewed North Carolina landings, the question is, where does North Carolina fall compared to the rest of the Atlantic coast? In the past 25 years, North Carolina has averaged approximately 6% of the coastwide recreational landings, represented by the figure on the left, and 35% of the coastwide commercial landings, represented by the figure on the right. North Carolina's contribution to the coastwide landings are represented by the black portion of the bars on the graph. When viewing these figures, it's important to note the difference in scale between the landings on the, on the y-axis. The recreational landings are in millions of pounds, while the co commercial landings are in hundreds of thousands of pounds. And just to give you, just for context, this is where the commercial landings would fall out on the recreational figure, right about here. Okay, and just to point it out again, with this figure from earlier in the presentation, um, the North Carolina recreational and commercial time series average landings uh, represented by the broken black line are almost equal with the recreational average just slightly higher. When looking at the recreational landings coastwide, recreational landings of false albacore are driven by the South Atlantic region. Uh, which is represented by the white portion of these bars, followed by the mid-Atlantic in light gray and the North Atlantic in black. The South Atlantic landings are represented in this figure by the black bars. Uh, Florida is shown by the dotted gray line, accounts for the majority of the landings in this region, 
followed by North Carolina, the solid gray line, which has averaged 13% of the recreational landings in the past 10 years. Landings from South Carolina and Georgia are not shown individually in this figure due to their low volume. Um, this slide shows the coastwide commercial fishery. Uh, and to orient you to the commercial figures, these are arranged the same as the previous slides. Um, uh, with the regional landings in the first figure followed by a figure of the South Atlantic landings. And regionally, we see the same pattern in the commercial fishery as in the recreational fishery with the South Atlantic um, represented in white, making up 89% of the coastwide landings. Okay, so in the South Atlantic, Florida is responsible for 56% of the commercial landings, followed by North Carolina with 43%. South Carolina and Georgia combined only make up about 1% of the landings in the South Atlantic. So there is a lack of life history uh, data for this species in the Western Atlantic, which would be beneficial for informing any management decisions, not just for North Carolina, but for coastwide management. Age, growth, sex, maturity, tagging, and stock structure studies would help address these needs. Currently, the American Saltwater Guides Association, in collaboration with Cornell University, the New England Aquarium, and NOAA Fisheries, has started several studies with the aim of addressing some of these coastwide data gaps, including stock structure and migration. Lack of funding outside of collaborations like those just listed makes studies like these difficult to pursue at the state and federal level. And at this time, the division feels that it is best to con continue to monitor trends and collect additional life history data that may better inform management and therefore not pursue state level management at this time. North Carolina accounts for a relatively small proportion of the overall coastwide landings. And due to the coastwide nature of the stock, any management at this time would penalize North Carolina fishermen if no other states are implementing re regulations. Further, there is no evidence of size truncation in the commercial and recreational fisheries, and the vast majority of fish caught are well above the length at maturity. And the final reason for the division's recommendation is that in December 2022, a white paper was presented at the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council business meeting that examined if false albacore meets the Magnuson-Stevens Act criteria for a stock in need of management. Um, following the uh, presentation of the white paper, the Mackerel Cobia Committee voted not to pursue management, but to but instead directed council staff to have a Mackerel Cobia advisory panel develop a fishery performance report for false albacore every three years. The report will include international landings, as well as landings along the Atlantic coast, in federal and state waters, catch per unit effort, and link distribution. Additionally, false albacore was brought up at this year's uh, this year's winter Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission meeting during discussion about Atlantic Bonito. Staff are directed to provide an options paper uh, for developing different levels of, of management for both species. And this concludes the presentation, and at this point we will take any questions. Questions and comments? Tom Rollo. First of all, guys, I just want to thank you for putting this paper together. I know there was some doubt whether it would be available for this meeting, but you were extremely thorough and you did a great job. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I understand your conclusions and um, I understand why you got there, but I think it's just kind of time to comment on some of the history of the management of this fishery from my perspective. Um, I mean, it's, it's been extremely frustrating for me for someone who really relies on this fishery, for someone who is very concerned about a fishery with zero regulation. I feel that every state agency is simply pointing fingers at another one with no long-term solution at hand. So, I mean, I, this, I, I feel like I have been, been trying to figure out the word to use, but I think misled or delay or, or intentionally delayed by just about every fisheries management body in this East Coast, right? 
Um, I spoke to the South Atlantic and our council members, as well as other people in the fishing industry, when they removed them from the complex. And I spoke with the fisheries director here at DMF at the time and commissioners, and they talked about doing something to put some general bag limits in place to prevent a large fishery from growing. Obviously, that never went anywhere. Um, it was discussed at length to have it in the Mid-Atlantic's uh, unmanaged forage fish omnibus amendment, which was removed at the last minute. They then, as you mentioned, did a small, they passed a motion to do a small tuna's FMP, which is my understanding was delegated to the back of the work list and is ne or the work thing has never gone anywhere. This has come up at the South Atlantic multiple times and it is typically derailed with the idea that we don't have any data, we're not collecting any data and quite frankly, for a recreational fishery and commercial fishery that is so valuable, it's really disappointing that no further data is being collected. But it doesn't surprise me. I mean, we look at the ASMFC right now, you're doing a simulation stock assessment for red drum. If we can't gather enough data to do a real stock assessment on red drum, one of the most valuable fisheries in, in, the, in the US, we're not gonna gather enough data to do a stock assessment for this fish. And even with the projects you mentioned for the American Saltwater Guides Association, we're still gonna be a decade plus away from any sort of um, any sort of stock assessment or management, right? And so pardon me for being extremely skeptical that the ASMFC process at the policy board is gonna enact something coast-wide, right? So from everything I've seen, I'll believe it when I see it and it's put out in front of me. Does that make sense? So I have to operate in my mind that nothing's gonna happen because nothing has ever happened. Right, And when I got involved in the, in the rulemaking side of fisheries management, I always wanted to do something proactive. I wanted to look for circumstances where we had a great situation and say, what can we do to keep this situation in a good place? And I think this is an example for that, right? Because we are one of the biggest players in this fishery outside of Florida in the East Coast. So. Um, if we have any, I'd like to see debate or concerns from other commissioners, but you know, I will propose some statement, some uh, you know, rulemaking for this fishery, and I'll offer plenty of justifications to move forward. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, Doug, uh, right, Commissioner Ryder. Uh, you, you may recall that I seconded uh, Commissioner Roller's uh, recommendation about this before, and I, with him, agree that the staff has done a good job of presenting where things stand with the species. But I also want to pile on a little bit to his comments if he will accept that, because I too was involved in the process working regionally on fisheries um, management architecture through that time and, and, and was personally very strongly opposed to the removal of little tuna, as we called it, and other similar species from those management units at that time moving backwards away from the idea, fundamental idea of precautionary management. And, and, and in fact, it sets us up for blindsiding fishermen and being blindsided by all user groups uh, when we stray away from precautionary management up front, meaning before the crisis develops. And so I, I fear, um, and I think I'm just echoing your words, Tom, but I fear that this is is one of those resources that could be easily shifted onto, and given the architecture of the fishery, it wouldn't take that much for a crisis to develop. And so while I also understand the conclusions that staff have reached, I would um, hope that we could find a path forward that would guarantee that the resources that are needed to begin building that management architecture could be invested now instead of waiting for that to ha happen. So just, just as a for instance, and in fact, I would go up one layer up to ICAT, the International Commission on the Conservation of Atlanta, Atlantic Tunas, which also has this set of fishes in their small tuna group, that the, the overall lack of information about stock structure is, is gonna bite us in whatever another, another region you prefer, just because we don't know where the stocks are and who really ought to be on the hook to manage these things. And so until we start investing in the basic the basic management science, and not, we are not never going to be in a good position to prevent that emergency from happening down the road. 
So I agree completely with you, Tom, and uh, and would love to find a pathway that doesn't wait, that doesn't uh, deprioritize resources that we know have to be spent on other things, and yet that can begin recognizing that we need to be investing in these and other less in trouble resources. Thank you, Commissioner Rader. Uh, Commissioner Roller. Thank you for your comments, Commissioner Rader, and I appreciated your debate when we did this, I believe, at our, at our August meeting last year. Um, what I want to propose are some state-level regulations to put guardrails on this fishery, fully understanding that it is a bigger fishery. I view it kind of in a couple ways, sort of as an insurance policy against an ASMFC process that I personally don't have much faith in. Um, and the way I see it is we're still several years away from anything. And given that we're a big player in this fishery, I think some very simple guardrail pr proposals in this state could serve sort of as a, um, a way in which to show what we think a fishery could look like, right? And so what I'd like to see in, 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 in absence of a stock assessment that gives us you know, clear ideas of what harvest could, could, can biologically look like, I'd, I'd like to see us do, um, I'm going to propose something, unless there's some more debate, that kind of tries to freeze this fishery in sort of where we are here in the state. So, I mean, do you want to do this now, or does anybody else any comments? I'd like to hear from people on this issue. By, uh, Commissioner Garner. Well, I, I do uh, agree with, uh, with Commissioner Rader and, and how he's thinking about this in a proactive way. But I do, and I also respect the, the expense and the time that goes into a management full-on management plan for this, but I do, it's also a primary fishery for me, and I would like to see some sort of watchdog, um, some sort of way, guardrails, if you may, to, to follow this fishery, and while keeping it fairly accessible to every user group involved in it, and it does, it is a good news to me when I see the information out here, it's a good news. It's, it's nice to see a fishery that does, on the surface, appear to be in good shape. And I would say, based on my on the water observations, that that is the case. But like Tom says, I'd really like to see it stay that way and, and be managed okay. or at least looked at. Yeah, I'm sorry. Commissioner Cross. Uh, <clears throat> without the ASMFC or any other governing body now presently having any controls on it, I'd, I'd like to hear what council has to say what our position should or should not be on this particular issue, Philip. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, uh, you may, please. I, I'm not entirely sure, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, what, what you mean, what, what I think your position should be in terms of... Well... From a, we're it's currently we're, you got ask, you got these other larger governing bodies offshore, and we are mm -hmm. we're part of that also. So what what should our role be in this? Where should we be falling in line in this particular process? Well, that's a good question, uh, and and having looked at the paper and understanding the range of these fish and where the activities are occurring, I mean clearly in North Carolina waters you have the authority to regulate marine and estuarine resources. That's not a question. Uh, generally speaking, species of this nature are, in fact, uh, regulated with our federal partners and councils and commissions, as, as uh, Commissioner Roller uh, noted. Uh, they haven't uh, taken action on it to this point. Uh, I believe, and I'm sorry, I, I forget your name. Uh, McLean. McLean. Uh, mentioned that, that previously it's been done through the IJFMP, uh, and that makes a lot of sense, but if there are, are no FMPs through any of the federal councils on those species, uh, and there's no uh, conservation equivalencies that are required for us to adopt, then the commission has its original authority to to do what um, it it sees best from a policy perspective, which is obviously up to the to the non-members who have a vote. Uh, uh, from a rulemaking standpoint, which I believe Commissioner Roller had mentioned his intent to, to pursue that, 
I mean, the process, and that's sort of where where, where I come in is, is making sure that the process is followed for that. Uh, but knowing full well that we don't know in the future if those federal par partners, either in the near term or long term, are going to uh, take up management of those species. Um, all I can tell you is right now that, that they don't. And so if you were to pursue rulemaking, you would have to do that through the process, including the regulatory impact analysis and, and identify the issue uh, that, that uh, you want to address through the rulemaking. Mr. Chairman, can I, I'm sorry to pile in. But I think there's another, another issue to consider the Commission to consider is the fact that uh, you know we have a tendency to think about fisheries management planning as being driven principally by overfishing, and uh, as with in, with the federal uh, equivalencies, uh, there are other lots of other reasons to get into management, and particularly in a precautionary way, including fairness and equity and use of the resource and access, and even even cultural and other reasons like that, and. It just seems to me that there's a, a role for North Carolina as a you know, leadership capacity here to help steer some of those other bodies towards that, that idea of getting ahead of the catastrophe in fisheries. And I'll just add to the, to the council's list the fact that one of those bodies needing steering in this case is actually NIMS itself, which operates, as you all know, the Atlantic Highly Migratory Fishery Management Plan where that that also seems like an instrument that into which something like this could fit very well, knew we a little more about stock structure. And so I just, but they're not going to do it by themselves is my point. And so it just seems to me like this uh, commission getting ahead of that process could help steer it in a proper direction, again, without usurping uh, resources that we don't need to spend. Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Commissioner Rader. Um, you actually made my next point was that I think it's time for North Carolina to take a leadership role here. We are one of the biggest players in East Coast fisheries, and I think hopefully some of the other states which have been more reticent to offer management for these fisheries will follow us. And I would point out that I've been one of the people among many trying to get the council system to do something. And it's, I don't want to call it an utter failure, but it hasn't gone anywhere. So with that, I think I'm going to offer a motion to begin rulemaking on false albacore, so and I'm just going to sit here and wait. I would second that. Let's first off get the motion up here and see. <laughs> That's okay. See what the verbiage is. So we're going to begin rulemaking on false albacore to include the following provisions. Um, you ready? We're going to cap commercial harvest at 350,000 pounds a year. With a 1,000 pound trip limit. And keep allowable gears at gillnet and hook and line. And with recreational, put in a bag limit of five per person. In addition, make sure that the rule provides adaptive management by proclamation if more conservation is needed or new data is available that can inform management. And that's what I have. And if I get a second, I will offer some rationale. Okay. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner um, McNeil. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Discussion. Offer your rationale. Thank you. Um, I looked at the overall catches, and my idea isn't to in any way imperil the current commercial fishery or the recreational fishery. I have a concern that this fishery could really get away from us 
commercially and recreationally, right? So it's really kind of a question of what is fair. The 350,000 pounds, we have not hit that level at any point since I think like 1995. Most years it's under 200, uh, under 200,000 pounds. So that allows for plenty of movement in this fishery. The 1,000 pound trip limit by your data is more than 99% of trips and gill nets and hook and line are currently the majority or if not all of the current gears. With um, the recreational side of things, I mean, let's be frank, it's mostly a catch and release fishery. There is a huge bait component to it, so it is important. Um, I guess one of the things that, 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 that drives me there is it is really one of the hot new baits. If you go to any of the tackle shops, you can buy them whole, you can buy them by the case. Uh, people are keeping them used for swordfish bait and whatnot, and there's been a lot of concern from Florida fishermen that there's a new bait market that's going out of control. And I think that offers some guidelines, and you know, when we look at a, catch, a fishery that's mostly driven by release mortality, I think in the future, if, if harvest gets too high, we can look at adjusting the bag limits. But I think that's a good starting point when you're going from nothing to something. So. Any further comments, questions? Who, who, uh, I would just be, a, a, my question would be, how do we get information on how these fish are being used in North Carolina? Um, because I think the use in North Carolina is probably different than it is in other states. And I think that would help with with rounding this out. And, and I am curious as to um, personal limits, recreational limits, why, why so high? And, and just, those would be just two questions like, how do you go about getting information on use within the state and developing fisheries or developing markets for it for them in the state? Okay. Director, would you care to address that? So I think potentially we could, um, through a survey, de determine how people may be using um, false albacore when they keep them. Uh, that would be, the, I think, the main thing that we could do or to, to look at that. Uh, and fr from our perspective, you know, just to comment on, on the things that um, Commissioner Roller has got. Commissioner Roller, just a question about the rule providing adaptive management. You just, as we're developing, I mean, we've talked about this, the need that the staff would have to go back and develop an issue paper with associated rules. And are you just wanting us to explore what, what type of adaptive management you might be considering? Do you have a, a thought on that or something that might give us a little bit more guidance on that? I'm looking for guidance there. Um, what I wanted to do is make sure the language, if we were to put this rule into place, would allow the director to have proclamation authority to adjust what's in there. That was my, my guidelines. I didn't want something set in stone that we have this fishery to be a beneficiary of climate change and we see a lot more, something like that, right? So if you have any suggestions to language to make that clear, I'm all ears. Okay, and we, we can certainly evaluate that as we're putting the issue paper together and include some things that we think may be um, items that we would potentially make a management move on through Proclamation Authority. Okay. Other questions or comments? Ms. Ms. I have two, Mr. Chairman. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Rader. I think the first has to do with um, whether there's a way to um, identify a target tack of some sort or some other benchmark um, goal that would in some way memorialize, if not uh, translate into enforcement requirements, the approximate 50-50 or overall catch. Uh, you know, that's what I'm concerned about a little, Commissioner Roller, has to do with the, the changing nature of the fishery reacting to a five-person bag limit and whether or not that actually operates as trying to keep something you know, more or less in the water at about the same level. And so I don't know if there's even, uh, if there's a history of doing that or if it's prudent to do that, but having something on the order of a seven, and I'm making this up, you know way more about this than I do, you know, whether a 700,000 pound overall catch um, um, target uh, might be an interesting addition. And then this, well, I'll come back to the second issue. Okay. So, so to answer that question, um, the problem with, you know, we had a lot of debate about 
what a record, I've discussed this for years with people, like how do you manage a recreational fishery that people don't eat, right? There's really no culinary appetite for these fish. Well, some people in the U.S. do eat them. There really isn't that much for it, right? So it's kind of mostly a pre predominantly a bait fishery or for people who are just trying to kill stuff, right? So let's be frank, right? I mean, it's like you, how many offshore charter boats where they put all the fish up on the board and there's like two albacore in each end. I think that's part of it. And I'm not going to say, I mean, it's, to be honest, there's a lot of ideas that were thrown around like 10 fish or five fish or three fish. It just seemed to be a starting point, right? To have some sort of, some sort of regulatory apparatus there. Um, yeah, but don't get me wrong. I'm not arguing against your language. Yes, what, what I'm suggesting is, in addition, is there a way to create a trip line uh, when the overall harvest gets out of control so, so that we then would would have an obligation to come back and, and review in addition to the adaptive management are you, uh, pathway? Are you suggesting something like have like a trigger in there that if we reach 200 percent, I'm just throwing a number out here, like 150 yeah, yeah, percent of long-term mortality that we have to go back and reanalyze the recreational limits? So something like that. Okay. I don't have, I, you know, more than I do, but I think maybe a, a rulemaking process in itself and the staff reaction to this will give us the answer. But I, I would, in the same way that you uh, inserted a, a commercial limit, uh, I would be interested in a, at least a target limit on the recreational side just to try to maintain the status quo while we advance this issue then it, it, maybe that maybe it doesn't need to be in the motion but just for the record and then the second thing has to do with um, you know I would like to see I, I don't have a strong personal opinion about the numbers and things in here uh, but I think the idea is important and I would like to accompany that with a commitment to clarifying the key scientific uncertainties and priorities that would be required to translate this initial rulemaking uh, into a longer term effective management structure. And that we have that somehow formally on the table, whether part of this motion or secondarily, we would be asking staff to have, um, to translate the existing white paper into a set of key uh, needs and findings building from the existing uh, information needs that are in there um, that we can help drive this body and other rulemaking bodies towards through time. Again, an idea, an idea, not a specific comment. I don't think on the met, on the motion. I, I mean, I, I love your 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 way of thinking. I'm just trying to process it and hear how we could add it into language. I may need a minute or two to think. Commissioner Cross had a question for you. I would ask division based off of the numbers of five fish per person on average over the last capture over the last few years. What would that be in pounds? Do you, can you correlate that? Sorry, we could get back to you with an answer, but right now we wouldn't be able to give that to you sitting up here. We'd have to look at the data to figure that out. Um, but we could get back to you with an answer. Well, I was just, and I'm not trying to throw no water on cold water. I, I just, you know, I, I'm with uh, Dr. Rader and whatnot, and, you know, I know where he's coming from on both sides of the numbers. I just, I would hope that it equals out is what you're looking for, equilibrium or something like that. And I saw, I saw, that's the only reason I'm asking what would five fish be based on the last few years' capture, and that's what I was looking for. Um. So I do want to point out that right now the catch rates for the recreational fishery, whether they're discarding them or keeping them, whether it's state or federal waters, is less than one fish. So by default, the landings, if people were to keep those five fish, those landings would go up. So just, just something to keep in mind. If they were to keep those fish, not saying that behavior will change, just if. Of course, they could keep those fish now anyway if they wanted five. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a comment you want to make? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Bizzle. Uh, Steve Paul and Fishery Management Section Chief. I just wanted to respond to um, Commissioner Rader's first point. Um, in explore, in, in, if y'all pass this motion in exploring um, the PROC authority as part of this rule, um, that can certainly 
be considered as far as, you know, giving the division director um, proc authority over, you know, methods and means and trip limits and that kind of stuff. And um, in that issue paper, um, you know, we can certainly articulate what may be some variable conditions that trigger the um, director's authority for proclamation. So, you know, if the commission is interested in looking at, you know, some type of trigger in the fishery or some type of change in the fishery to um, give the director authority to modify trip limits, I mean, that's certainly within the um, scope of the authority. So. Commissioner Roller, is it possible to memorialize that statement by saying, by just saying as part of the motion that the intent um, of this action is, is not to this not not to alter the approximate status quo uh, balance among sectors or some some you come up with the right language or something like that that it doesn't make it look like a you know uh, an allocation grab one way or the other Ab absolutely and I mean I am amicable to that language and I'm sitting here sometimes I don't talk and think well at the same time so I'm trying to think of the best way to capture our discussion here um, I, you know, and the, the five fish per person, I, I go back to Commissioner Cross's that it's kind of it's it's kind of a challenge, right? Because people don't really keep them anyway. But I feel that there needs to be some sort of bag limit on them. Um, it's just, and we talked about. I mean, the way I see it is either people don't keep them or they keep them for bait. So we were, you know, just trying to. Eat. It's sometimes it's harder to ease into something from nothing, right? And so that's kind of where I was going on there. Um, if you want to help me wordsmith, I'd be, um, I'd be willing to add to the into the motion. If my second is okay, that the intent of this rule is to is to capture the status quo of the fishery. Is is that fair? Okay. Yeah, so maybe ma right. maintain the status quo in terms of maintain sexual this, allocations the and structure quo. or something. Yeah, something like that the status quo of the fishery. Okay, there was, uh, the motion has been, I guess it's been amended. And so, uh, Commissioner McNeil, do you accept the change in the motion? Yes, I do. Okay, all right. Further question, Commissioner Cross. Would, would what Commissioner Roller just put on there, would it be prudent just to put a recreational bag limit per person and take the number off and let the latter sentence take care of that? I'm, I'm just asking. Take a number off of it? Because that's basically what you're doing at the bottom. I mean, it's nothing now. I mean, the bag limit's nothing now. I feel pretty strongly that I like something in place there. I don't want to I don't want to be saying, hey, look, we're putting, you know, this commercial regulation on it and not do something recreational. I mean, it's hard to manage a almost purely catch and release fishery, let's be frank, right? So, but I mean, at the same time, I do have concern that a bait fishery could go out of control. So. Okay, other question, Commissioner Blanton. Um, just trying to gather some thoughts here. And, uh, there's a lot of assumptions going on right now that um, without hardly any information on this species, if it were of such a large concern, one or multiple of any of the federal or interstate councils would have taken this issue up. They would have researched it quite a bit more. And we would have some sort of, of guidelines to go off of based on their recommendations. Because the range of this fish is the, North Carolina is a pinprick, a, a pinprick based on the range of this fish. So based on a conversation or two I've had of, of some, of some long liners and, and guys who fish quite a bit offshore, they say at times you can walk across these things offshore. They avoid them. They don't care, care much for them. They, they have, little or no value of, uh, to them because, you know, longliners are after the larger tunas that are worth quite a bit much more. But, you know, there, there are interactions with this species. 
uh, in the inshore fisheries commercially. Um, and I don't know that, that putting a cap on something that you really have no honest clue as to how large this, this, this stock of fish is throughout the greater Atlantic and North Carolina's a pinprick with no other state, no other state concerned about putting anything or implementing anything like this is a concern to me and to the users of the, of the commercial fishery. Now, fisheries expand, that's okay. It, it's okay that a fishery expands every once in a while because, you know, life is full of opportunity. It truly is. And, and, and people are allowed to, to, to take advantage of opportunity at times, and, and this may be an opportunity to expand the fishery a little bit. It can go the other way. It doesn't have to, you don't have to minimize this. You know, there's, a, there's another way of thinking that can go around this. So to, to agree to just put some willy-nilly number out there and officially cap something with, with little to no information, I can't get behind that. It's just, I can't agree to that. It's, 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 it's impossible for me to justify it in my own mind. And, and so with that being said, if, you, if you're worried about, about capping a, a fish on the recreational side because you're concerned that people are keeping ki fish just to kill them, that's fine. You know, because I, I, can't, I can't say whether or not, you know, they're valuable recreationally other than, than just to take a picture with. But I do know that it's a protein source. It, is it desirable to eat? I don't know. But, but we're losing bait fisheries, right, all along. Um, it's harder and harder to get, you know, menhaden because of, of reallocation in the markets. Not, not regulatory, but in the markets. Um, fish houses are becoming quite a bit, it's become aware that fish houses are unable to, to produce and put up bait through conversations with, with fish dealers and, and processors. And so to make so many assumptions and to start a rulemaking process on, on these firm numbers, I just can't get behind that. Now, if, 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 if this were to read, this, this motion were to read something like explore the opportunities and what them impacts would be and to further understand the stock, and to gather data, if that's something division feels like is needed and they can take on that, I, I just don't know that it's, it's of interest to the division because they are piggy, and I can't speak for the division, but I know that what the recommendation was was to, was to do nothing at this moment. And to task the division to go through all of this, I just can't agree with that. You know, we, we, got, we got to take our time and, and, and work on what fish we have in our state and how we can improve those fisheries. We have many different issues, water quality, this, that, and the other, that we could sit here and discuss, but we're, but we're further discussing putting a cap on a, on a commercial fishery and putting a, 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 what sounds like to be a fairly liberal bag limit on the recreational fishery when they hardly land one per trip. And so this right here is more or less ludicrous to me. And I understand where the other councils are coming from. If they ha it, these fisheries managers are prioritizing just as we are. And right now we're putting something toward the front of the line that really has been looked at for years and years. And no other council has determined that implementation of management measures is extremely necessary because of the nature of the fishery. So what are we really doing here, honestly? Because this is, this, when I look at this, this isn't fair. This isn't fair at all to the commercial industry because if, God forbid, that that, that, that number goes over 350,000 pounds and it gets thrown in the commercial fisher's face, that that happened, when they will never understand where this even came from and why they're getting persecuted for it. And the general public will, will not, not do that either. 
So this is how I perceive it. Not as a stopgap measure, not as, not as anything else, but, but, a, but another ding, another strike at a commercial fisher just trying to make an opportunity for himself and his family, as you hear in public comment after public comment. So I can't agree with this. I, I, I would not support this motion. And, and, you know, at the best, I would support more research and, and more, more, more looks into what, what the impacts would possibly be. But without a stock status, and, and with the range of this fish, and, and, and additionally the life history, five, your fish lives five years, blue crabs live five years. They don't live long. You either catch them or they're going to die. One of the two. The, 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 the fishery is healthy. We're, those fish are getting a chance to spawn once or twice, easily, based on the characteristics of the catch. So what are we really doing here? Honestly, what are we really doing? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Roller. Thank you. Um, one of the reasons I put this forward is I, I, I did not get that take from the federal system. I got the take that there's too many fires to put out and no one really wants to concentrate effort on, on something like this. And that's been one of the frustrating aspects because this is an extremely valuable recreational fishery not just in North Carolina, but up and down the East Coast. And unfortunately, we have not done a good job of managing for and providing abundant recreational fisheries. And I view this as an opportunity to take a fishery that's in really good shape and hopefully keep it there and do our little part because no one else is stepping up to be a leader. And I'm gonna hold my comments back on that. And Anybody else? Question? Yes. We have a for hire survey that's coming out that is, is gonna, uh, I, I got the, the form on the for hire survey, um, economic impact is not to kick the can down the road, but could some questions about false albacore be added to that survey to get a sense of the value of that particular fishery to, to, um, to for hires and because my sense is being by island in this state is that this fishery is completely different in just like striped mullet just like everything else it's very different from one end of the state to the other and 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 how it's valued too not how how, how they're used but how they're valued um, the economic impacts out of Oregon Inlet are vastly different than they are out of Beaufort Inlet and Barden's Inlet and, and further south. And I, it, it could be a sense, it could be also give us a sense of not only how it's valued, but how much it's valued in different places too. And I think we tend, to, to Tom Roller's point, we eat, sleep, and breathe these fish for certain times of the year. And so they are our world, but so to us, it's precious and it's, it, it, it's, you know, potential danger. But in other parts of the world, in North Carolina, it, it's not seen that way. And so I think for us, it could give us a better sense of how the resource is being used without putting caps on it for the commercial guys or for the recreational guys. Does that... Would that be a possibility just to get some, to, to gather some information from the charter community when, when this impacts, this survey is taken? Uh, so this is Brandy Salmon, uh, Licensed and Statistics Section Chief. Um, so one of our programs within our section is the Socioeconomic Fisheries Program. Um, and you're correct, we did just establish a uh, for hire uh, economic survey that um, we may be a day late and a dollar short, <laughs> literally, um, because we just got them in the mail this week. Um, so the survey was developed, um, and it was put in the mail to all uh, for hire license holders. Um, and so uh, there is some questions in there about 
uh, targeted species and, and economic value to some of those species. And I think uh, false albacore was probably one of the species that were, that were mentioned in there that people can comment on. Um, so I don't remember the specifics of the questions, um, but there is some information trying to be gathered on that species too. Okay, great. Commissioner Roller? And that's a, Brandy, that's a one-time survey too, right? This is a one-off, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. That, that wasn't my original question, but to uh, Commissioner Gardner's point, I mean, yes, they are valued differently, but this encompasses all of this. That doesn't, this doesn't change anything. I mean, one of the things that we discussed, and we brought it up at previous council meetings at the, or previous commission meetings, you know, fishermen have mentioned at the council, and this started back in, you know, with the omnibus forage fish up at, at the Mid-Atlantic, was that the value of this fish has been increasing for years, and there are new markets developing for them. I, I spoke to fishermen in Wanchi, said they get $4 a pound for small, uh, small Philippine markets, but it's mostly an export market. And the idea for this is to prevent a large-scale fishing fishery developed that we have to chase from behind. And at the same way, start to allow some potential regulation on recreational fisheries if in case something changes or happens. I don't know what that is. It's a, like I said, it's hard to manage a catch and release fishery that no one really eats. So, I mean, I think you view it as starting somewhere, but. Okay, anybody else? Commissioner Blanton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I'd be a lot more comfortable with a motion that, that, that more, more described what y'all are saying other versus what's written here in firm black and white numbers. You know, the motion could definitely read something different saying that if the commercial fishery were to land 500,000 pounds or something of the like, some number that's a little more extreme than we've ever seen, that we could come back and take a look at, at, at putting a cap or, or, or assessing what the expansion looked like. But this is going a lot further, a lot quicker than it needs to be. You know, we, we have no clue what we're putting a cap on. We truly don't. This could be, this fishery could be a 50 million pounds of this stuff running around the greater Atlantic. And we're putting a 350,000 pound cap on our fishermen. And there could be endless supply of this stuff circling around the ocean. You know, it, this is just taking away opportunity still from fishermen in this state, particularly the commercial side. If this is a character, if the characteristics of this fishery is rec, on the recreational side is hooking, uh, catch and release, then what's the concern? Seriously. You know, you saw a spike in 2020 of, of, of landings of this fish. It happened in every fishery. People got bored, they sat at home. They said, well, what can we do? The only thing they could do was go outside because they couldn't go anywhere else. And when they did that, they wanted pictures with things they'd never got pictures with before. So, oh, well, we're going to charter a boat. Good. The charter industry benefited from that pandemic probably more than any other industry did because people wanted to get out and they wanted to go do something. That's great. But to do something as such so firmly right now is not just. It truly isn't with, lack, with the lack of information, the life history, the, the, the stock range, it's just it's too much. So I would offer a supplemental motion. Go ahead. I move to investigate, further investigate, the impacts and management actions that could be considered if this if the commercial industry
lands more than 500,000 pounds Further, if the recreational industry continues to expand at a rate that is double what landings are currently, then further management action could be considered. I, I, as I understand what you're trying to do, uh, you're not trying to do a supplemental motion, but a substitute motion. Substitute, sorry. Okay. Thank you for the By striking the language. Substitute motion by striking the language of the previous motion. Right. Okay. All right, is that motion up there as you have made it? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, is there a second? Second, Commissioner Cross. Okay. Further discussion on this? Uh, Director. I've, I've got, just made, I got something. Hold, hold, hold on a second. Director's got something to say. Just one clarification that um, if this were to pass and considering further management action, there would still need to be rulemaking involved with that at the end of that, if, if this were to pass. We still, there is no, we can't take action without rulemaking at this point. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, Commissioner McNeil, I believe it was. Um, yeah, my, my question kind of shifted when, when Kat said that. Um, I was going to say maybe a, it's a friendly amendment or something, but since you said the, the recreational industry continue to expand at a rate of double what the landings currently are, wouldn't it be easy just to say double the landings for both sectors? Um, and then after that, it gets back to the question that Kat brought up. Um, that brings me back to what Tom was saying with allowing the division to have proclamation authority to, um, I can't see what the previous amendment said, but you see what I'm saying? Like it's an adaptive measure that proclamation might could have. You're saying to try to include adaptive management measure in the substitute motion. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, Mike, I was just curious what your thoughts are on, on that kind of thing. Commissioner Blanton, you got any thoughts on that? Or does your motion stand as is? My thought here is that putting, this is just a trigger, more or less. So that our policy would be, if this motion is implemented, if we meet this trigger, if this trigger is met by either then we would stop, we would investigate why the expansion, what the expansion was doing, instead of assuming that this fishery is gonna expand at a rate that we cannot control, that we would adapt this as the policy, as the trigger, which would then initiate another conversation, and, and therefore we could have a more confident and serious talk as to when or if it ever happens what we should do then. But now we're just assuming that something is going to happen bad because we were to land 350,000 pounds of fish in a stock that the range is a, a ridiculously large and where we're just a pinprick on the map of their range. So this would be more or less a trigger, a policy trigger, a policy, or however you would like to, to outline that to further open up discussion beyond where we're at today. Director, if uh, harvest data showed a huge increase 
wouldn't you, isn't that just your, what you normally would do would be look into what's going on here and why? I mean, we, we can certainly look at that, but I think just to get back to our, where we landed on our position, and I understand Commissioner Roller's frustration with the process or the lack of other management entities uh, wanting to take up managing false albacore, but this is really, to me, not managing the fishery per se, but trying to cap the fishery, which I understand that, but also ASMFC is considering, it is looking into this. Now, granted, this was kind of tacked on to their discussion. They weren't even talking about false albacore. They were talking about Bonita, so they just kind of said, well, we're going to do this. Let's look at this. But at any rate, I think there are some northern states that seem to express some interest. So at their next meeting, they will be receiving some information from the states on uh, both of these um, fisheries. So, and I know Commissioner Roller doesn't want to want to kick this down the road, and that's not what I'm trying to do, but I do think that if ASMFC picks this up, the management of that through our um, interjurisdictional fishery management plan is the way to go. And then we can, if they pick it up and add it as part of management, then it's an easier way for us to adjust management. And back to the comments that Commissioner Blanton made, again, the date we don't have a whole lot of data to go on. We can certainly look at the data that we do have. And if this commission is interested in capping this fishery, we can certainly go back and tell me if I'm if I'm misspeaking, but we can certainly go back and look at what that might look like uh, pound wise and you know, as Commissioner Cross pointed out, is this going to be kind of equal or something like that if that's what this commission, you know, wants to do. Uh, but we really are kind of hemmed up with needing rulemaking or either ASMFC picks it up in, an, in a fishery management plan and then we would manage accordingly. Okay. Other, Mr. Roller? So this motion is just deja vu to me for my career of involvement in the fisheries management practice. I mean, it sounds like basically every discussion we've ever had. Hey, you know what? Maybe if something happens, we'll look at it. Let's do a fisheries manage uh, performance report in five years. Let's look at landings every three years. This is just another rendition of more delay in order to make any sort of actual action on this fishery. I understand the concerns that it's a that it's a coastwide fishery and we don't know the depths of it, but there hasn't been really any information gathered outside of some private recreational groups starting their own stock, um, starting their own um, peer reviewable science. Right. The only constant thing I've seen is that council chairs turn over their makeup changes, presidential administrations change, governors change, parties change, commission makeups change. And this stuff is continually forgotten. You can make a motion, but that doesn't mean anything's going to happen. And until something is on the books to look at managing this fishery, it's just going to be more of more debate. And I mean, the way I see the rule that I proposed before this substitute motion was an insurance policy against an ASMFC system that I view very skeptically, just like other aspects of the system, because I don't believe that they're going to pick it up until they actually do. So, well, I I understand your frustration with the lack of action. I do. I mean, but this is just a slight rise in the commercial landing side of it, and really doesn't, in, in any way, shape, form, or fashion, hamper the recreational side because y'all are catching less than one. So this is not just a stopgap. This is somewhere you start. And, you know, uh, I, who knows what two fish, three fish, four fish, five fish, wh whatever limits you've got on the recreational side comes out to total poundage. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll hold on my... Because I believe we got some numbers. Go ahead. Yeah, it, they, they're averaging seven and a half pounds of fish. So 37 and a half pounds for a five fish bag. So what is that total? So, so what are you asking for in terms of the total? The last three years average. The last three years. Whatever, whatever they had on total recreational capture. 
Say that times three and a half, then times five. We charge extra for on the moment math. <laughs> well, if you'll give me the numbers, I'll do it in my head, but I mean. So currently the average for the last three years, because they did have that one high year in um, 2020 is 300,000 pounds for the recreational fishery. It would be the average of the landings. 300, okay, and they're divided by what? But that's based off of one fish, correct? Is what y'all are telling us, that's less than one fish. I'm, I'm so, not done yet. So if you're asking for what the reduction would be? No, I'm asking, you're, you're saying it's roughly 300,000 pound average a year? Uh, yes, sir. Based, and that's based off of one fish, which it's not really because there's no limit, but you're basing that off of a less than one fish average. Right. Well, and that's just for the last three years. If you look historically at the data for the 25 years that we looked at and what I think Commissioner Roller was basing his cap off of in his motion, the average is, um, hold on, one second. It's a little less than that, but the maximum landings have been uh, 594,000. 793 pounds but you're but that's on poundage correct that is on poundage. Right, but 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 we're basing that on less than one fish per trip uh yes yeah, yes sir though it can range from zero to 12 fish so trip. if you if you say that times five then you're you're getting into an enormous number which i'm not arguing either way is bad or good but if you're basing that number there off of one fish per trip, and you say that on a proposed five trip per fi um, five fish per trip basis, you're up to a million five a year just like that. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, in, re in retrospect to that, I don't I don't see where this is such a horrible number. Okay, I'm calling a ten minute break. Like. Cat, need to talk to you, you, you. Yeah, you. Yeah, you're part of
Okay, break time's over. Everybody get your seats. All right. First off, Commissioner Blanton, I believe you have a bit of business to do. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to um, withdraw my motion. Okay, and uh, uh, Commissioner Cross, you're, going, you're okay with that since you second it, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Commissioner Roller, I believe you got a little business. Um, first of all, I would like to withdraw my motion. Okay. And Commissioner McNeil, you second it, so you are you're good with that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, good. All right, now, Commissioner Roller, you have a motion. Um, I have a motion, and we can do some wordsmithing here. Um, I move that we ask the staff to come forward with rulemaking language with management options for false albacore, starting with status quo and allowing for various percentage increases. Okay. Tom. With management you... options to allow for growth at various percentage points. What? Uh -huh. Get rid of that. That was. Okay. So, well, I, I got something different here. Wait. Okay. All right. So that's your motion as you made it. Yes. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by Commissioner Blanton. Further discussion. Roll call vote. Commissioner Cross. Aye. Commissioner Huggins. Um, Commissioner Roller? Aye. Commissioner Shellum? Oh, aye. <laughs> Commissioner Gardner? Aye. Commissioner Blanton? Aye. Uh. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Commissioner Rader? Aye. Chairman Bizzle? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. All right. Yes. Mr. Chairman, can I make a, a comment to my second earlier point, which is I would appreciate it if staff could um, bring forward to us more information about what uh, research and scientific research, scientific and information priorities uh, m must be um, uh, identified and met in order to begin adequately managing this fishery. I think they would do that as a footnote, but I don't know if they have any. We don't care to address that yeah. directly. Yeah, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to move. It's not a motion. It's just a request. Just to a request. Okay. Can, you, can he repeat that, please? I'm sorry. Yeah, re re repeat what you're asking, uh, Commissioner Ray. Yeah, well, well uh, the rationale, as I said before, is, is that until there is an obligation to do so, the scarce resources almost never are committed to understanding uh, fish, fishery species that are not yet in crisis. And so I, what I want to know is, based on what we uh, heard today, what additional information is necessary and what are the priorities among the, those information points that must be satisfied in order to begin successfully managing false albacore and similar species. She's not here, uh, so yes. Yeah, I just don't want to yeah. hear that we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah, that, that's, that's an inadequate excuse, even given the resource problems in the future. It's on us to help you get the resources. Okay. So, right. so I just will make a comment. I mean, we, we don't have the false albacore data that we need, and just our conversation over there in the corner just alluded to potentially being years before we do. And one thing we would have to have is some dedicated resources to do that. Um, we struggle to keep the lights on around this place. So resources and what we have and what we have prioritized is, is a, it is a serious uh, issue for us to prioritize things and be able to go and take care of them. And we, we really are, uh, our resources do limit what we can and cannot do. I just want to make that clear, but absolutely we can look at what it would take to be able to answer some of these questions for this species and, and bring that back to the commission just so they know where, where are we and what, what would that look like for this, for this issue. Okay, great. All right.
hold on. Yeah. Commissioner Rolo. Um, a couple quick things. Yeah, I mean, again, that's why I've been going down this road because I just, I, it's hard to keep the lights on here. Resources are stretched really thin, and at some point, we just, you've got to make decisions trying to be proactive, right? Um, I had asked the director, um, given all our discussion here and the discussion at the ASMSC, would it be helpful for the commission to say, pass a motion to write a letter supporting the, the, uh, the, 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 the supporting the ASMFC and looking to manage false albacore and Benito to give Chris some room at the table. I see some funny face back there. He's shaking his head back there. I mean, and if, if the commission wants to write a letter, I'm not opposed to that, but certainly Chris can carry that, that message to, um, to the board, you know, when he goes to the next meeting to let them know that we are interested, uh, very interested in the management of false albacore. Let them know the commission is interested in that. Chris, what would serve you better, a letter or are you just taking the message? It's a letter from the commission. If you thought this was important to do at a coastwide level, would be fine. Uh, I mean, personally, from my perspective, sitting there as a policy board member, uh, would have to look at what the options paper shows in terms of what kind of resources ASMFC has. Because, uh, you know, they have the same issues that every other agency has. Uh, it's, you know, so, I mean, if not at a minimum, if none of that happened, we would certainly inform ASMFC's policy board about the action that was taken today and, and potential next steps in North Carolina. Uh, that could even be something that we could share with, uh, with ASMFC in advance while they develop the issue paper. It might be actually the, the best way to do that while they develop this options paper, they can at least see what, what else could be at play. Um, so e either works. I mean, I just I guess I just want to set expectations to the commission as far as um, how, how we would handle this at the table for the policy board. Um, <clears throat> you know, really, I, I, I don't know how I would, I need to read the options paper. We all need to read the options paper that they present as far as what how appropriate it is for them at that level, but at a minimum, we could at least uh, inform them of what's being done here in North Carolina. Could go in the options paper that way. All right, we'll go either way. If all of a sudden you think the letter would, would serve more strength to forward the calls, tell Laura, and she can write one and put my signature on it after I approve it. Mr. Chairman, a related comment, if I could. Yes, sir. Uh, Com Commissioner Rader, uh, with respect, again, the same problem exists at the ASMSC level where, where their authority is limited to the uh, inshore waters. And you all saw the distribution map here. So without the questions being answered about stock uh, um, uh, structure, it's very, it would be very e easy for the ASMSC to say, well, 90, 80 or 90% of this happening is happening outside of our authority. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that a parallel letter or maybe the same letter uh, being copied to or directed to also uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, AA uh, might, uh, with an eye towards getting the consolidated Atlantic high migratory people on that same question, would, would anticipate that response from the ASMFC. So ultimately, that's probably where things are going to have to get decided and so it might we might miss we might skip a few steps if we go ahead and send the same letter to those two recipients okay we'll take that under advisement with staff okay all right thank you so much okay mr chairman really quick sorry i hate to do that uh, I, I just wanted to um follow up with some discussion about how when we may be back to the commission with this, because I think we can get the numbers and the and the um, that information together in time enough for the next meeting. We're not going to have a full flushed out issue paper with associated rule language. We may be able to have some uh, connective pieces in there, but I think we'll kind of do this in phases. Commissioner Roller. But we could have those options to look at, and if we wanted to pursue them, we could we could make a motion to pursue them at that time. Is that what you're saying? Yes, okay. absolutely. We will have the numbers there for you, but we may not just ha we may not have a flushed out issue paper that would contain exactly how the rules might look. And depending on what options you pick, then we would go back and develop the associated rules. That sound good? Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay. Let's see. We're now on to status of ongoing plans, core and flora. Y'all were scared I wasn't finished with all, weren't y'all? Okay, thank you. Uh, I am Corinne Flora, the Fisheries Management Plan Coordinator for the Division, and today I am giving an overview of our Fisheries Management Plans, which are currently under review. There is a corresponding memo in your briefing materials under Fisheries Management Plans, and this presentation is for information purposes only, and staff will get into more details following in the following presentations for action items. So the species I'm reviewing today include our striped mullet, spotted sea trout, eastern oyster, hard clam, estuarine striped bass, southern flounder, and blue crab. So I'm going to start with the FMPs, which are under development first. So the striped mullet peer-reviewed stock assessment indicates that the stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring. So based on that stock assessment result, the DEQ secretary determined it is in the long-term viability of the stock to implement temporary management. This management is meant to address the overfishing status of the stock and will remain in place until Amendment 2 is adopted. At the November 2022 commission meeting, you selected your preferred management. The public comment period on the supplement took place from December 19th through January 19th, and that included opportunities for our advisory committee members to also comment on Supplement A. Uh, staff will provide an overview today, and you all will have an action item um, at that time to vote on final approval of the supplement. Amendment 2 of the Striped Mellet Fisheries Management Plan is under development. The Fisheries Reform Act requires management address the overfished and overfishing status of the stock. Uh, prior to the division developing management in Amendment 2 to the FMP, we held a scoping period from September 26th through October 7th. Uh, during that time, we discussed management strategies with stakeholders. Stakeholder input is imperative to our plans and is best when we have it at the beginning of the process um, so that we, when we're drafting the amendment and writing that draft amendment, um, we can take those into consideration. Um, a scoping document was developed by staff to guide conversation. <clears throat> and at your November business meeting, staff presented an overview of that scoping and uh, the commission gave comment. Uh, additionally, the commission approved the goal and objectives at that meeting. And um, with consideration of scoping, um, and the goal and objectives, staff are currently drafting Amendment 2 to the plan, um, and that will continue through 2023 um, when we will, um, and during that time, we'll have uh, our advisory committee workshop, um, and you will all get more on that later this year. So next we have um, spotted sea trout. Uh, the spotted sea trout stock assessment um, includes the stock of fish for North Carolina and Virginia, and it indicated that stock is not overfished, uh, but overfishing is occurring. This means the stock is healthy, uh, but there is too much pressure currently on the stock. Uh, before the division begins development of Amendment 1 to the North Carolina plan, a scoping period will be held from March 13th through the 24th. 
Uh, scoping will, con um, will focus on conservation measures that stakeholders are interested in in order to reduce pressure on this stock. Um, we will have four in-person meetings, uh, the first of which um, is in Raleigh and will be a hybrid meeting. So anyone who cannot attend an in-person meeting but would like to contribute to these um, town hall style conversations that we have um, is welcome to join us uh, virtually for that meeting on March 14th. Um, and then uh, during those two weeks, we also have meetings in the northern part of the state in Barco, uh, one here in New Bern, and um, one in Wilmington. Um, during those two weeks, stakeholders also um, can inform the division through a online questionnaire or written comment. Um, as I stated before with Mullet, um, scoping is our best time for the public to inform our management strategies that go into our fisheries management plans. Um, the division encourages everyone interested in spotted sea trout to participate in the conservation conversation. Um, moving forward to eastern oyster and hard clam fisheries management plans. Um, staff are working on both of these plans. Um, I list them together because we work on these with one plan development team since it's all of our shellfish people. We work on them kind of in unison and in a parallel um, since we have everybody in the room at the same time that like to talk about shellfish. Um, so that's why you'll see these often on the same um, slide until we move further in the process and decisions need to be made and then we'll start dividing these out. Uh, but currently, the division's uh, plan development team is working to identify available data and the management needs for both of these species. Um, scoping will occur for both of them in the fall. Um, so that is what's currently under development, and I'll be moving on to adaptive management, which we are um, moving forward towards. So the estuarine striped bass FMP Amendment 2 adaptive management, um, due to the juvenile abundance concerns, uh, staff have been working on a stock assessment update for the Albemarle Roanoke stock. The update includes data through 2022. Uh, Division and Wildlife Resources Commission staff continue to work together on this update. Uh, earlier this month, staff met with an external review panel to discuss the update. Uh, when the report is ready, the commission will receive an update on the results. And if necessary, adaptive management in Amendment 2 does allow for um, changes in management to address whatever those results indicate. Uh, as Ann talked about earlier today, uh, the S Southern East Coast Stock Assessment for Southern Flounder was completed in 2019 with data through 2017. The stock assessment staff are working to get data through 2022 from all of the states which are, are involved. Um, at that time, the stock assessment will be updated. Adaptive management through Amendment 3 allows management changes to address any, um, whatever results <clears throat> indicate at that time. And um, when that is completed, the commission will be presented with those results. Uh, and there are two adaptive management paths currently under consideration uh, for blue crab. At your November meeting, I updated you on Amendment 3 Diamondback Terrapin Management Area Criteria, uh, which allows for changes in the approved devices list. Uh, so the DTMAs require approved devices in POTS from March 1st through October 31st annually. Uh, in 2020, North Carolina crabbers proposed an innovative design for crab POTS, which uh, narrowed the funnel of the POTS to serve as the device. The plan, um, Amendment 3, 
requires new devices, uh, reduce the terrapin interactions similar or better than the currently approved devices. The division is working on modifying the approved device list um, based on cooperative research through um, work with UNCW. In January, uh, we consulted with the Shellfish Crustacean Advisory Committee. Uh, the advisory committee supported the changes to the approved list and gave um, some comment, uh, mainly which uh, revolved around enforcement. Um, therefore, staff are working with our Marine Patrol to address those advisory committee comments, and the commission will receive an update on that at your May meeting. Additionally, staff will begin a stock assessment update in 2023 for Blue Crab. Uh, Amendment 3, Sustainable Harvest Adaptive Management, indicated the stock assessment would be updated at least once between reviews of that plan. The 2018 stock assessment indicated the stock was overfished and overfishing was occurring in the terminal year of 2016. The assessment update will include data through 2022. Adaptive management in Amendment 3 allows for management to be tightened or loosened depending on the stock status. And the commission will be updated when that stock assessment update is complete. So I'll wrap up today with our FMP process graphic that we like to Go back to, um, this puts into perspective where we are with the plans in development. Um, as I said, spotted sea trout will be holding uh, public comment, or not public comment, public scoping, which is much like comment, <laughs> um, and striped mullet is drafting that current plan. Um, adaptive management falls into our final step uh, where the division and you all as the commission implement management strategies. Um, so that is where estuarine striped bass, southern flounder, and blue crab with their stock assessment updates um, and the diamondback terrapin birds um, fall into that final step. So that is why I give updates on adaptive management as well. So another way to look at our FMP process, and this is just looking at um, the year ahead for us, um, is the Marine Fisheries Commission work plan that Laura provides to you um, prior to each one of your meetings. Um, this is a great resource to refer back to when we're planning for anything fisheries management plan wise. I realize you can't read exactly what's here, but the importance is those color differences and those colors indicate when the different actions are happening for the plans, and each line is a plan. And so as you can see, there's this staggered nature right now to um, the schedules. So it's kind of nicely staggered for when the division, the advisory committees, and the commission's workload is required. Um, but as we know, Things don't always run smoothly. Um, things come up, things change. Um, so when we're moving forward with items and timelines are adjusting, um, it's always good to keep this work plan in mind. Um, and so that wraps up um, for me for the day. Um, one thing that I'm just gonna touch on real quick um, from conversations from this morning, um, we've had a lot of conversations on um, 2022 fisheries landings for um, many of our fisheries this morning with mullet and clams and um, everything, flounder. <clears throat> and I just want to remind you all that we always have our FMP annual updates that are available to you, and um, you will get those again in August. Um, the reason that you all get them in August is that our annual data is not completed until April and May. So then in June, we all get together, analyze all that data, and in July, we put out that report, and then usually Lee sits up here with me and tells you all about it in August. So um, anything we tell you between now and then is preliminary data, 
but in August, you, you will all get a full rundown of what happened in 2022. Questions or comments? Yes, Commissioner Bland. Uh, just one quick question. It was um, pertaining to the blue crab stock assessment update. Mm -hmm. um, did I see correctly that we would be able to see that by November of this year? That is currently the plan. Okay. <laughs> one of the yep, so um, all of the data should be ready, um, and um, the plan is for us to have that ready by, no, by the November meeting. Yeah. Commissioner Cross. That was mainly my question, too, because it's vital that we get a stock assessment plan in conjunction with the turtle uh, reduction devices because we're still on that red red light on Monterey Bay and MSC, and it's, it's, it's costing the industry and costing the crabbers a lot of money. We've got to get off of that, and I think we're, maybe if we get a good stock assessment, we can do that. Fingers crossed. And that was going to be my question, too, if we are still on red light, and we still are. You know, it's going to come down if they don't back off of that a little bit. These, I assume these devices and these new traps cost the crabbers more money. And if it's not improving their sellability of their product, why do it? Well, I mean, yeah. And, I mean, look at what the, uh, the lobstermen in Maine are having an issue with now. I mean, they got the same, just because they plucked something data-wise out that they think they can prove and they, they're arguing it back and forth. But, I mean... We've done, with these implementations of these changes, if we get a good stock assessment, we're in line with Maryland and everybody else, and we're going we're gonna to really have to push the end to make it happen. Yeah, and the good thing about the narrow funnel is um, that the reasons the crabbers proposed that is because it doesn't add an additional device. It's built into the pot. Okay. Um, so when they're building their new pots, they just build it with that funnel. And um, so then it's not an additional cost to them, and there will be a phase-in period for um, getting those okay. in. I just hope it's going to be worthwhile to crabbers. So. Well, okay. yeah. well, and this was part of the conjunction with the commercial resources grant money, but it actually has been shown to actually keep the larger jimmy crabs in better than the regular funnel. So it, it will be if it's implemented. All right, cool. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, now I believe we got a spotted sea trout fishery overview. Coming up, Lucas Pinsinger and Jason Rock. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Lucas Pensinger, and I am the uh, bi a biologist out of our Moorhead City office, uh, as well as the Spotted Sea Trout Species Lead and the co-lead for the Spotted Sea Trout Fisheries Management Plan. Uh, as the Chairman mentioned, up here with me is Jason Rock, who is a mentor for the Spotted Sea Trout Fishery Management Plan. Uh, David Berenger, who was up here with us <clears throat> at the November meeting, and is the co-lead for the fishery management plan, is actually in the middle of moving and uh, won't be able to join us today. I don't, I don't know who got the shorter end of that stick, but there we are. Uh, actually, November meeting, we gave a broad overview of the spotted sea trout fishery uh, in North Carolina and Virginia and the data that informed our most recent stock assessment. Uh, there were some questions in that meeting about the spotted sea trout fishery in just North Carolina uh, as well as how some of the gear types that have been used over the years have changed in that fishery. Uh, today, I'd like to give you a characterization of that fishery in just North Carolina and hopefully address some of those questions. <clears throat> we'll start today with a brief outline uh, of the presentation. First, we'll walk through an overview of the spotted sea trout fishery. Uh, then we'll look at a, at a breakdown by sector, starting with the commercial sector. Uh, data for that commercial breakdown are from our trip ticket program and our observer program. And then after that, we'll look at a similar breakdown for the recreational sector. 
data for the rec sector comes from the Marine Recreational Information Program, or MRIP. Uh, MRIP is a state, regional, and federal partnership compo uh, composed of several recreational fishing surveys that work together in order to try and get an estimate of uh, total recreational catch. Finally, we'll talk real briefly about the necessary reductions in the upcoming uh, Amendment 1, and then finish with the next steps in the process. There are two important notes that are going to carry through the whole presentation. Uh, all of the characterizations and breakdowns of the fishery today are exclusively from North Carolina data. Uh, and then everything that I will show you today is arranged on the biological year. The biological year is the same, uh, exactly the same as what we used in the stock assessment, which runs from March through February of the following year. So for example, uh, biological year 2021, is from March of 2021 through February of 2022. Over the next few slides, we're just gonna look at that broad overview of the spotted sea trout fishery in North Carolina. The first figure here shows total removals of spotted sea trout in North Carolina. Total removals are harvested fish combined with dead discards. Uh, in both panels, we're looking at removals on that biological year by sector, either commercial or recreational, and divide it into landings or dead discards. The top panel is removals in pounds of fish by sector and type of removal, and then the bottom panel is simply removals by sector and type, but as a percentage of total removals. <clears throat> in both panels, uh, recreational harvest is in dark purple, recreational dead discards are in light purple, commercial harvest is in orange, and commercial dead discards are in yellow. And I do recognize the commercial dead discards are hard to see in that figure, uh, but if you look on 1991, uh, you can probably see them the best there. It just shows in that little bit of a darker line um, at the top of the bar. The table on the left shows the average contribution percentage of each type of removal to the total since 2009. Uh, we're only able to estimate commercial dead discards from the anchored gillnet uh, portion of the commercial fishery, although we really don't expect dead discards uh, from the other main commercial gears to be all that much higher, but we do recognize that we don't have estimates for those gears. <clears throat> These percentages that you see in that table on the left do vary slightly uh, depending on how you cut the time frame, but in general, they do hover right around 90% of removals from the wreck fishery and 10% uh, from the commercial fishery. There are three big takeaways uh, that I'd like you to have from this slide. The first is that this fishery is predominantly a recreational fishery. Uh, the second is that dead discards from the recreational fishery have become an increasingly impactful source of spotted sea trout removals. And then the third is that we have seen a sizable increase in total removals uh, starting in 2019. Here we're just looking at annual trips or annual number of trips by sector. Uh, we consider a recreational trip any trip where a fisher states they were either targeting spotted sea trout as a primary or secondary target, as well as any trip where a uh, fisher harvested or reported releasing spotted sea trout. Uh, commercial trip is any trip where there's a spotted sea trout recorded on a trip ticket. Uh, recreational trips are in dark purple, commercial trips are in yellow. Uh, and the main point here is not only have landings increased in recent years, as shown on the previous slide, uh, but the effort in the fishery has also increased greatly in, uh, uh, in the more recent time frame. Effort in the recreational fishery started increasing around 2005, and it's currently almost six times higher than it was uh, in the earlier years. The effort in the commercial fishery is, is quite a bit less consistent year to year, uh, but has also seen a good deal of growth in landings and trips in the last three or four years. Uh, as we start characterizing each sector of this fishery individually, it's important to keep in mind the scale of trips and landings between each sector, uh, and that both landings and trips, as I just mentioned, have increased rapidly in recent years. So over the next few slides, we'll get into that uh, variety of breakdowns of landings and gear types within the uh, spotted sea trout commercial fishery in North Carolina. And again, just want to mention, um, you know, it's important to keep in mind the, the differences in scale that we're talking about here. The top panel here is showing annual commercial landings in pounds, and the bottom panel shows the annual number of trips. In both panels, the colors of the bar correspond to the type of gear used to land spotted sea trout, and the year is the biological year. Anchored gear nets are in dark purple, the beach seine is in light purple, long haul and swipe nets are in pink, 
and run around go, uh, run around go nets are in yellow and then all other gears are grouped into that uh, orange color. This color scheme uh, will actually continue over uh, the next, I think, three or so slides. <clears throat> Throughout the time series, anchored gill nets have uh, made up a major part of this fishery, with most of those anchored gear nets, la anchored gear net landings coming from uh, small mesh anchor anchored gill nets. Historically, the beach seine fishery and the long haul and swipe net fishery were also large sources of removals, or of uh, harvest, I should say. And we can see that in landings and number of trips for these gear types in the earlier gears of the time series. As we move along the graphs towards the end of the time series, we can see that while anchor small net mesh gill nets still make up a good portion of the fishery, runaround gill nets have, become an, uh, have made up an increasing proportion of both trips and landings. Here I'd like to highlight two main points. Uh, the first is just how the fishery has changed throughout the years. And then the second is that uh, variability in year-to-year -year landings. The black box that I've put up here just represents a time frame where spotted sea trout management was uh, changing. And we ended up at the, uh, so this is from 2009 through uh, the tail end of 2011 here. By the tail end of 2011, uh, we had our current 14 fish uh, minimum size limit and commercial trip limit of 75 fish. So these are the current spotted sea trout uh, size and trip limits. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna focus in on that time period forward uh, because that's really a bit more of the, of the modern fishery. So in this figure, we're also looking at landings and pounds on the top panel and number of trips on the bottom panel, except now these are average landings and average number of trips per month uh, from 2012 through 2021. And again, that's the biological year 2012 and 2021. The color of the bar still corresponds to gear type. In the late spring, summer, and early fall, uh, landings and the number of landings or number of trips stays relatively steady and landings are uh, remain relatively low. Starting in October though, we see the number of trips. We see landings increase in this time frame, but maybe not quite as much as we would expect based on the number of trips. This is probably due to more gear in the water, fishing for uh, things like flounder and mullet. Um, in other words, spotted sea trout are probably more of an incidental catch during this time of year. In November and December, we can see that the number of trips actually decreases from that October high. But in November, landings increase relative to October, and they stay higher than October uh, into December. In these months, we're likely seeing the impact of fishers targeting spotted sea trout as opposed to landing, landing spotted sea trout incidentally. I would highlight the number of uh, runaround gill net trips and landings during November, December, and honestly, even into January and February to illustrate that point. It makes sense that when fishers target a specific species, their success rate of landing that species increases. And that's kind of what we're looking at over those months. After January and February, trips and landings start settling back in toward uh, their spring and summer pattern in, uh, as we go into March. And this graph just shows that there's a distinct seasonality to the spotted sea trout commercial fishery. And we will see that same pattern again when we start looking at uh, the recreational fishery. Here we just focused in on the early portion of that graph, so it looks pretty similar to the other one. The time frame has changed though. Uh, we are looking at 2012 through 2016 here. And we still see that distinct seasonality, but anchored gill nets, which again are predominantly small mesh gill nets, are making up a larger portion of the fisheries in this time frame. If we bump forward to the more, uh, what I like to call the more modern time frame, uh, 2017 through 2021, this is really what the fishery looks like today. We'll see an, we see an increase in runaround gill net landings and trips, and especially during, the, uh, during that targeted harvest period from October through January or February. Uh, but we do see that small mesh anchored gill nets are still an important aspect of this commercial fishery. <coughs> So on this figure, we're kind of switching gears a little bit and looking at it regionally. Um, we're again focusing on that more current period from 2017 through uh, 2021. The top panel is showing the average of landings in pounds for each region, while the bottom panel is showing the average number of trips per region over that same time period. In both panels, the color of the bar still corresponds to gear type. Uh, that northern region is made up of the northern rivers, so the Chowan, the Pascatank, uh, Perquimans, and the Roanoke. 
and then the uh, as well as the northern sounds so like Albemarle, Currituck, Croton, and Roanoke. And then the central rivers are the Pamlico, Pongo, and Noose rivers. And then that southern region is just the southern rivers, rivers and southern sounds. I don't necessarily want to focus on the overall volume of landings on this figure uh, because, as we know, those those regions very uh, different. They're they're very different in size. Uh, instead, I'd like to focus in on the breakdown of how those landings are caught. So on the color of the bar, the gear type, uh, we can see some regional differences in this fishery with runaround gillnets making up a larger portion of landings in the uh, landings and trips in those central region, regions, so the central rivers and Bogan Core sounds, when you compare them to the other sounds, the ocean and the southern region. So really just so we're trying to get at the regionality of the fishery here. And then this final commercial figure is showing average monthly landings in pounds from 2017 through 2021. And again, that is the biological year. Uh, this time, the color of the bar is corresponding to region. Uh, so the northern region is in dark purple. Pamlico Sound is in light purple. Central rivers are in pink. Bogan Core Sounds are in red. And this, uh, the southern re region is in orange. And ocean landings are in yellow. What we can really see here is, again, the seasonality of the spotted sea trout fishery with those higher landings in late fall and early winter. But what I'd like to highlight is that even though the magnitude of that late fall, early winter seasonal bump isn't equal across the regions, so in some regions we see a bigger bump than we do others, we still see that same uh, seasonal increase in every single uh, region. So next we'll move on to the commercial fishery, or the uh, recreational fishery. Uh, and we'll look at a similar breakdown of the rec fishery in North Carolina. And as I mentioned previously, recreational data comes from the Marine Recreational Information Program, or MRIP. Uh, I'll be showing much of this characterization by MRIP WAVE, which is simply MRIP's bi-monthly sampling, sampling period. Uh, their sampling period starts with January and February as WAVE 1 in the calendar year. But as I've mentioned uh, maybe a couple times today, uh, we're looking at things on the biological year. So our first wave will be uh, that March and April wave, and then the January-February wave will be assigned to the previous biological year. Before we get to that, though, I would like to reiterate just one more time uh, that it's important to keep in mind the difference of, in, in scale of effort and landings between uh, the recreational fishing and commercial fishing in North Carolina. We'll start here with annual removals. Uh, this figure is showing removals on the y-axis and biological year on the x-axis, where the color of the bar corresponds to the type of removal. So landings are in purple, dead discards are in yellow. And the main point I'd like you to take away from this figure is that we see a sharp increase in landings in recent years, as well as an increase in dead discards around 2009. So this black box is simply highlighting that uh, same period of, of rule changes from uh, 2009 through the end of 2011. Um, by the time 2011 rolled around, we or the, uh, the end of 2011, I should say, we had our current 14-inch minimum size limit and four-fish recreational bag limit. <clears throat> so on this graph, we're showing the annual number of recreational trips each biological year from 1991 through 2021. Uh, as well as uh, annual landings over that same time period. The color of the bar corresponds to the monthly MRIP sampling wave. So as I mentioned, our biological year starts with the March-April wave in dark purple. The May-June wave is in light purple. The July-August wave is in pink. The September-October wave is in red. The November-December wave is in orange. And then finally, the January-February wave is on the top there in yellow. So just a reminder, a trip is any time an angler stated they were specifically targeting spotted sea trout or they caught a spotted sea trout. And what I'd like you to take away, especially from the bottom graph, which is the trips, uh, is, that, is just the trend over the entire time series. For about the first half of the time series, recreational trips hovered around uh, 500,000 trips a year. Starting around 2005, though, we can see that... Uh, the number of trips every year does vary a little bit, but the general trend is increasing. And we hit a high of just over 3 million trips in 2019 and 2020, and we came in just under 3 million trips in uh, 2021. And we see that increase in uh, trips and landings in all waves. 
So this portion of the box, uh, or this portion of the figure that is surrounded by the back black box now is 2017 through 2021, corresponds to the more recent time frame of the fishery, uh, same time frame that we looked at in the commercial section. In the next few years, we're going to, or the next few slides, hopefully it's not a few years, <laughs> uh, we're going to focus in on that set of years. So here we've just simply zoomed in on the, on the boxed section. Uh, what I'd like to emphasize is, again, the importance of that September, October, and November, December waves. Those are the waves that are in red and orange. So the size of that wave does vary year to year, but in almost every single year, those are the two uh, largest waves in both recreational landings and trips. So finally, for the commercial or the recreational side, we're looking at the average landings and average trips by wave from 2017 through 2021, where the color now corresponds to the mode of fishing or just how anglers were fishing. Uh, anglers fishing from shore are in dark purple. Anglers fishing from a private or rented boat are in pink, and charter trips are in yellow. And we recognize that we can't interview every single angler at every single access point every single time. Um, and we do also recognize this could uh, potentially lead to some underrepresentation of catch data, um, especially in uh, charter boat catches or when anglers are fishing from private access points. Uh, however, the, the mail and the phone effort surveys do catch or capture effort in those situations even if we're not catching all of that, or uh, we're not capturing all of that uh, catch. So this figure, again, just really shows the seasonality of the spotted sea trout fishery. Uh, you see a small vacationer bump in that May, uh, June timeframe, um, and then, but the, really the November and December wave dominates landing and trips. Uh, as I mentioned before, we do see this same seasonal pattern in both sectors of the fishery. And we do see some seasonal variation in fishing mode as well. We see a little bit of an increase in the summer, uh, folks fishing from shore. Uh, and we do see a bit of an increase in charter trips in the summer. But overall, this is really a uh, private boat fishery. Uh, we're almost to questions. But before I get there, I would like to take a few moments just to talk about the reductions that uh, are necessary to end overfishing and some of the steps in the next steps in the FMP process. Um, as Corinne mentioned, coming out of our most recent stock assessment, uh, the North Carolina and Virginia stock of spotted sea trout is not overfished. I'd like to emphasize that. We, it is not overfished. That's a good thing. Uh, but overfishing is occurring. The first part of that, the stock is not overfished, is shown in the bottom graph here. Uh, that's just simply a ratio of spawning stock biomass to the uh, threshold. So it means right now there's plenty of spotted sea trout to sustain the population. That's really good news, and it shows that our management efforts have been effective. The second part, though, overfishing is occurring. That's what's shown in the top graph. It just means too many fish are being removed from the population. Right now, the population is uh, doing okay, even with those high removals. Um, but these graphs show us that the number of fish we remove from the population and spawning stock biomass are related. In general, when we remove more fish, spawning stock biomass decreases, and when we remove less fish, spawning stock biomass increases. If we think of uh, the number of spotted sea trout, like a retirement account, say, uh, the value of that account, or spawning stock biomass, it can either grow or decline in two ways. Your investment can go up or down, uh, and this would be things like uh, increased natural mortality. Uh, the second way, is uh, if you take more or less out of that account. So this would be things like uh, fishing removals and uh, natural mortality. So right now, our investment is doing great. We have a big pile of money in our account, and that's shown in that bottom graph. But we're taking too much money out of the account, and that's shown in the top graph. And if you take too much money out of the account each year, or if your investment drops suddenly, you know, so that could be something like a cold stun or a few years of low recruitment, uh, you can eventually run out of money. And that would be the equivalent of an overfished stock. But like I mentioned, we are not there yet, and that's great news. Uh, but that does mean we need to take some conservation-minded steps uh, to avoid getting to that point, particularly in light of the increased effort and landings that have occurred in the spotted sea trout fishery in recent years. So in order to end overfishing, we need reductions in total removals of between 14.6 and 39.6%. 
This will reduce fishing mortality between the threshold and the target, respectively. So just a reminder that total removals are the combination of harvest and dead discards. We have a statutory requirement to end overfishing, but as I mentioned on the previous slide, we also want to enact conservation measures while the stock is still healthy to prevent bigger problems in the future. Uh, we do have some things working in our favor, though. Our current management has been successful, and we see that in that high spawning stock biomass. Additionally, spotted sea trout have rebounded quickly in the past from increased stressor stressors, such as high fishing pressure, low population levels, or increased mortality from cold stuns. And this is likely due to aspects of spotted sea trout biology and life history. They're highly fecund. They grow very quickly, which allows for rapid recruitment to the fishery under favorable environmental and mortality conditions. The spotted sea trout stock is not overfished, and by reducing overfishing through a conservation-minded approach, we should really be able to uh, ensure the current and future access to this fishery. So finally, I just wanted to give a real quick update on the next steps. I won't spend too much time on the top part here. Corinne covered that uh, uh, when she discussed our upcoming scoping meetings in her presentation. I've just listed those dates and locations here again. Uh, so each of these meetings should be from 6 to 8 p.m., and then after the scoping meeting, we will be back in front of you at your May business meeting to review considerations heard from the public during that scoping. And then you'll also have an opportunity to, opportunity to comment on management strategies for Amendment 1, and we'll be asking for approval of the goal and objectives for that mem Amendment 1. So I really appreciate the opportunity to come in front of you today and uh, share some information about the spotted sea trout fishery in North Carolina. Hopefully today's presentation helped uh, put that fishery into context as we're taking the results of the stock assessment in, um, forward into the fisheries management plan development with the public scoping period scheduled next month. And at this point, I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great. Questions, comments? Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chair. First of all, Lucas, thank you for the presentation. You're a very skilled presenter. It comes across very well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so are you, Jason. You're good. Um, <laughs> he makes you look better, too. Um, <laughs> this is all I'm candy. <laughs> so simple point of clarification here. When we went over the stock assessment at the last meeting, all the data included Virginia numbers. The data you provided here is just North Carolina data, correct? Just North Carolina. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Commissioner Cross. Mr. Chairman. Uh, hold on. got Commissioner Cross. I'll come go to ahead. you, Commissioner go Good. Commissioner Rader, go ahead. Lucas, I appreciated that, too. I, just on behalf of uh, Anna and myself and the Habitat and Water Quality Standing Advisory Committee, committee I'll ask you the same question that we've been asking uh, species experts as they come before us, which is to uh, give some uh, thought to the degree to which habitat and or water quality uh, issues or changing conditions might or might in the future uh, it shift the relations, biological relationships that you're presenting to us, including vulnerability in the future. So things like the, the likelihood of uh, recruitment success or the good year class development, those kinds of things, and, and the, the extent to which the, the uh, additional vulnerability from changing circumstances for estuarine dependent species particularly ends up uh, potentially falsifying some of the assumptions that we're making. I'm not really looking for a, an answer today, but I know that the, the Habitat and Water Quality Committee would be very, advisory committee would be very interested in staff's thoughts about those questions for, for any of the life history stages and thus for biological productivity of this stock in the future. Okay. All right. Commissioner Krauss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was in discussions with division over several things about the way we present these plans and the way they come with us with the initial information, it was it was pounded upon me to try to get as much information in front of the curve to to the necessary people involved on when we're forming these FMPs about points we'd like to see considered and stuff like that when we're going down the range. And, I, and this is no no way of means or a motion, but I've got a little paper here together of just some points of inclusion I'd like to see considered as we move along down the line. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and start reading through it in a 
First item is catch limits will be set by acquittal allocation, recreational 60%, commercial 40%. The commercial sector will only fish 20% of the total available quota that it is allowed and retain 20% in a conservation easement to be held in trust by the state and overseen by North Carolina Division Marine Fisheries can only be used to supplement commercial capture and only be used in a period of overabundance and financial hardship by the commercial sector. This will immediately 20% exceed the threshold that y'all just put before us. Uh, each sector will be managed through a season. The commercial sector will have a 10% of total quota season in the spring quarter, January to March, and a 10% of total quota season in the fall, winter, October, December. The recreational sector will have a season implemented by their representatives, will not exceed 60% of the total allowable catch on speckled trout. Dead discard mortality will be deducted from each sector prior to setting the allocation for the following year's total catch numbers. If those dead discards from the prior year overwhelm the allotment for the season to be set, the season will be closed for that sector for that year. When a quota is met by either sector, gear directed at speckled trout will not be allowed back in the water. This includes nets and hooking line for commercial sector, it includes hooks, and soft hard baits of any kind for the recreational sector. This over, the overwhelming amount of dead discards that we're seeing now in the recreational sector demands this no longer a catch and release fishery. For all sectors involved, it now becomes a catch and quit fishery. Area closures will be implemented in traditional areas that are normally fished by the corresponding sector that has reached its quota. This will prevent continued capture after quotas have been caught and eliminate the massive amounts of dead discards we're now experiencing in the recreational sector. A slot limit of 16 inches to 19 inches will be put in place to avoid the harvest of mature females. Any smaller and larger to be released. And this should help with the spawning numbers by increasing larger number of mature egged out females to spawn. And lastly, division would work closely with each sector's available catch windows far in advance of completion when each sector is approaching 80% of its quota to ensure little to no overages and catch quotas. Just some points I'd like y'all to consider as you're moving forward. So, Commissioner Cross, we definitely uh, uh, very much appreciate that. And I think this is a, a kind of exactly what, uh, <clears throat> you know, as we're going towards this public process, this, this is what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> um, and I think uh, since we are just at this point in developing the plan, and I, I recognize you're not asking for a motion or anything, uh, just consideration, um, I think it's the perfect timing for that, uh, you know, to consider things, uh, you know, ideas that uh, y'all might have um, and I think we can definitely uh, you know bring this up at our public sp scoping meetings uh, to gauge public input on that and how the public feels uh, and we can certainly uh, you know if, if it's something y'all be interested in come back and have a uh, more in-depth discussion uh, present a little more information and uh, go from there other questions or, or comments Commissioner Roller you know, this is, it's interesting. Um, I think, you know, when we look at changes to the makeup of the fishery, it's gonna be very important that we look at the economics of that, right? So let's say we were to go to a 60-40 split like Commissioner Cross, I think it's important for us to see how much our general economy would lose from going to a high value fishery allocation to a low value fishery allocation. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Well, we kind of considered the same thing on the flounder fishery, but we were driven in a corner to 50-50, so I think I'm being more than generous at 60-40. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I got a question, and I think I know the answer, but I won't ask it anyway. Um, let's just say we got, a, we got a broad range of percentage reductions to consider. And let's just say for simplicity we pick a 25% reduction. As far as the recreational sector is concerned, do you consider going from four fish to three fish, bag limit, a 25% reduction? So, Jason, I'll let you jump in if I don't answer this sufficiently. <laughs> um, at this point, I think it's just it's too early. Um, we haven't quite gotten to the point that we've, uh, you know, looked at uh, what a bag limit reduction uh, or would do, um, and whether that would get us where we need to be. Um, so at this point, I would say we, we could get back to you on that <laughs> once we've actually run some of those analyses and uh, can speak a little bit more uh, in, in a more informed manner. All right. 
Fair answer. Okay. All right. Nothing else? Great. Thank you all for your presentation. Do we need to take a short break or y'all want to play? We do. Uh, women, women nodding their heads. Okay, 10 minutes. Uh.
We got a couple of minutes, so start easing back in your seats, please. Okay, 10 minutes are up. <laughs> okay, we're on to the strike mullet FNP. Dan Zaff, Jeff Dobbins, and Willow Patton. Have at it. Thank you, Chairman and Commissioners. You thought you got rid of me, but I'm back now. Um, yep, I'm going to be talking about the striped mullet fishery characterization today. Um, next to me is Dan Zapp and Willow Patton, the two co-leads. So I'll move right into it. So in this presentation, we'll characterize the commercial fishery by landings, value, participation, effort, gear, and by region. The recreational fishery characterization will be much shorter and will be limited to MRIP statistics. With that, I'll move into the commercial fishery characterization. The first two figures show time periods that extend before the inception of the trip ticket program in 1994. While the landings prior to 1994 are assumed to be accurate, the data are missing more specific information. The more in-depth characterization of the fishery was constrained to the trip, tick er trip ticket era, 1994 to present, in order to get a more comprehensive look at the fishery. These first two figures are to provide historical perspective. The division has sporadic landings data back to 1880. These data illustrate the historical importance and magnitude of the mullet fishery. In 1903, landings hit their peak on record at just over 6.6 .6 million pounds. That is over three times the yearly average for the past decade. This figure shows commercial harvest of striped mullet from 1972 to 2021. Historically, the striped mullet commercial fishery landed greater than 3 million pounds of striped mullet, with landings of greater than 2.5 million pounds occurring as recently as 2002. Since 2003, landings have generally been around 1.5 million pounds, but declined to less than 1 million pounds in 2016, and were under 1.5 million pounds from 2015 to 2020. In 2021, landings increased back over 2 million pounds. Just to note, the dashed lines on this figure represent minimum and maximum commercial landings triggers established in Amendment 1 to the FMP that would trigger closer examination of the striped mullet data if exceeded. The open circles on this figure represent years with significant hurricanes since that can affect harvest levels. Throughout the rest of this presentation, two different time periods of reference will be used. The full time period, which includes data back to the inception of the trip ticket program in 1994, and the modern time period, which is the most recent five years of data, 2017 to 2021. The full time period will be used to show shifts over time, and the modern period will be used to look at snapshots of the current fishery. These two figures show average commercial landings by month on the left and percent of commercial landings by month and market grade on the right. Because the commercial fishery primarily targets striped mullet for row, the fishery is seasonal with the highest demand in landings occurring in October and November when large schools form during their spawning migration to the ocean and females are ripe with eggs. 
Commercial landings during October and November account for over 50% of commercial landings, and half of these landings are row mullet, as you can see in the red portion of the, the graph on the right. This figure shows the amount of striped mullet harvested by different gears. Particularly during the fall, this fishery is very targeted. Striped mullet are primarily targeted commercially using runaround gill nets in the estuarine ocean and ocean waters of North Carolina. And it's important to note that during the fall, this can be a very high volume fishery with thousands of pounds landed in a single trip. This figure shows percentage of bait harvest to the total harvest. The division realizes this is drastically underestimated due to the bait harvest importance in Dare County which accounts for 30% of annual landings alone. More than anything, this figure illustrates a data deficiency for the division. The disposition field, which allows dealers to denote whether harvest was for bait or food, was added to the trip ticket forms in 2017, but has not been adopted fully by the industry. The division is hoping for better reporting of this field moving forward. This figure shows annual X vessel value of the striped mullet fishery. X vessel value is a measure of the dollar value of commercial landings, usually calculated as the price per pound at first purchase of the commercial landings multiplied by the total pounds landed. This is not a comprehensive measure of economic impact. Recently, the X vessel value of striped mullet has been around $1 million annually. This figure shows mean X vessel value by month. The fall row fishery is the most valuable component of the striped mullet fishery. The value is highest in October through November when mullet become most available to the fishery. Landings are highest and the percentage of row mullet harvest is highest. This figure shows the yearly average price per pound for the row fishery and overall fishery in unadjusted value. Row price is typically higher than overall price, except in years when there are no buyers, known as cutters, for the row fishery. 2020 is a good example of this, and you can see it in the green circle there. There's no difference between the, the row price and the overall price because there were no cutters during the pandemic. Um, generally, the price for mullet has remained fairly steady since a decline in the mid-1990s. These figures show trends in participants, trips, and landings over time. The figure on the left shows annual trips and participants. Annual trips and participants have been declining since the mid-1990s when the price fell off, and their trends have followed each other closely until 2020 when trips made a sudden increase and participants stayed fairly level. This may be due to fishermen shifting their effort more toward mullet from the main point of the figure is to illustrate the disproportionately large amount of landings a few individuals make. Now this one, the, the x-axis is a little confusing. I'll try to describe it the best I can. But um, these figures show number of trips on the left and landings on the right. The x-axis of these figures are groups of trips that fall within given ranges, given ranges of pounds landed per trip called bins. For example, the first bin on the left figure, here we go. so down here, the 0 to 100, um, shows us how many trips were made that landed between 0 and 100 pounds of striped mullet. The next bin shows us how many trips landed between 101 and 500 pounds, and so on for the rest of the bins. The figure on the left shows how many trips fell into each bin of landing. The figure on the right shows how many total pounds were landed from each of the bins. We can see the striped mullet are commonly encountered on trips in low amounts, with 70% of trips catching less than 100 pounds, but accounting for just 12% of the total landings. In contrast, less than 4% of trips land over 1,000 pounds of mullet, but these trips capture nearly 40% of the landings. The purpose of this slide is to illustrate the disproportionately large percentage of annual landings that come from, from a few very large catches. This figure shows percentage of landings by year and gear. Since 1994, the fishery has shifted from a majority set net, set gill net fishery to a fishery that is strongly dominated by runaround gill nets. B 
Beach sayings were once the most important gear in the first half of last century, but have made up less than 5% in the last decade. This figure shows the percentage of commercial landings by month and gear. As expected, runaround gill nets are the dominant gear in every month, but reach their peak percentage in October and November during row season. We can also see that September is the peak month for cast nets, and November is the peak month for stop net beach seines. I'll now go into the characterization of the commercial fishery by region. The regions were investigated by County of Landing, which is the best regional resolution available from, tri from trip tickets. The counties were grouped into regions using distinct area boundaries or clear differences in fishing practices. The red region is the Albemarle Sound, blue is Pamlico Sound, yellow is the Noose and Pamlico Rivers, green is Carteret County, and purple is the Southern region. All other counties within the state with landings will be grouped into the other region. This figure shows the percent of landings by year and region. The percent of landings by region has gone from a much more equally split fishery to one dominated by Pamlico Sound and Carteret regions in recent years. Dare and Carteret counties alone make up 60% of average harvest since 1994 and over 70% in the past five years. This figure shows the percent of annual landings by month and region. These da data closely follow what we heard from fishermen during scoping for the FMP amendment. Areas in the north have an earlier row season than those in the south, and that the set net bycatch fishery in the Albemarle Sound is more important than the row fishery. Pamlico Sound and the rivers, which we can see um, in the orange here, these two, um, and the rivers have their, uh, their peak in October. Carteret also has its peak in October, but has a second slightly lower peak in November. The southern area does not have its peak until November. The Albemarle Sound has a peak in January when the white perch fishery is at its peak. This is the main fishery where mullet are landed as bycatch. Just to note, the full time series was used here as significant shifts in seasonality have not occurred within regions. This figure shows the percentage of annual landings by region and gear. As discussed before, runaround gill nets are the most important gear in the mullet fishery. They are the dominant gear in Pamlico Sound, the rivers, Carteret, and the south. The Albemarle Sound predominantly uses set gill nets as they are the gear used to target white perch where striped mullet are landed primarily as bycatch. Cast nets are mainly used in the Pamlico Sound for the bait fishery and stop net beach seines are limited to three permitted locations on Bogue Banks in Carteret County. These figures show the seasonality of participation in trips by region. The number of participants in trips by month follow the same pattern. Albemarle Sound has peak participation in trips in winter and early spring. The effort in the rivers is more evenly spread across the year with slightly less effort in the summer. The Pamlico and Carteret regions show spikes in participation and trips in October and November during the row fishery. I'll now give a brief characterization of the recreational striped mullet fishery based off of MRIP data. The recreational fishery primarily catches small juvenile mullet, often called finger mullet. These small mullet are used as live and dead bait in a variety of recreational fisheries. This figure shows the estimated number of striped mullet harvested by the recreational fishery by year. 2002 and 2003 were abnormally high due to high intercept rates and methodology changes in the survey. Though there seems to have been higher mullet abundance in those years as well. The rest of the time series stays around 1 million fish annually with a marked period of lower harvest in 2018 to 2020 before rebounding back to average in 2021. To make uh, direct comparisons to the commercial industry, assuming a nominal weight of 0.044 pounds per finger mullet, which was used in the most recent stock assessment, this equates to average landings of about 40,000 pounds recreationally, or about 2% of the commercial harvest by weight. This figure shows the average number of striped mullet harvested by recreational fishery by, by the recreational fishery by wave. Recreational harvest slowly increases during the summer and peaks in September 
in October when anglers are targeting flounder and red drum with live or cut bait. The landings quickly decline after that to their lows during winter. As a reminder, MRIP landings are only available by wave, which is, a, which is in two month periods. This is part of the reason we could not estimate reductions from the recreational fishery for the supplement. And with that, I'll take any questions. Questions? One quick one. Um, the MRAP data, did that separate out the white finger mullets from the striped finger mullets? Um, yeah, so they have, we have ones that are um, species specific. We have landings that are species specific. Um, those are what are actually landed and brought back to the dock and identified by our interviewers. Um, and then we have a mullet genus where people say we just caught some mullet and we group those together. And I, I can't remember the percentage split we used for the 29% striped mullet was used. 29% um, of the finger mullet you're calculating that were, striped mullet. Were, that were only ID'd to, that were only reported to genus level were okay. attributed to striped mullet. Gotcha. Okay. Based on a cast net survey. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Anybody? Commissioner Roller. Thank you all for your presentation. This is just more of a, a compliment to be offered. There's been a lot of criticism of the stock assessment through the process, and I'm, I'm not going to share in that criticism. I mean, one of the fortunate things about my involvement in fisheries is I get to talk to a lot of people across the East Coast and on the federal, and there's been a lot of discussion about the stock assessment. It's pretty good. So good job, guys. Thank you. We appreciate that. Anybody else? Okay. Let's um, move on then. Chairman I'm sorry. Commissioner Shelton. Thank you. Um, my concern with the stock assessment is those years that are heavily affected by hurricanes. And, I mean, for the 2017 to 2021, we haven't had hurricanes these past couple years, and I've seen a huge influx of mullet, specifically where I fish, um, and I hear from all the other commercial fishermen that I've spoken with um, that we're seeing an increase. And I'd love to get the data from 2022 and 2023 because I'm really confident that it will show that there is an increase. And um, I can, you probably can tell where I'm going that I'm, you know, with our next discussion with the supplement. I, I'm not for it because the data that what I've seen personally and what I've heard, we have to hold out for that 2022, 2023 information because it's going to show otherwise. We have to consider that weather. And we do have landings data. I, I did have a little pocket slide here to, to show the landings trends uh, through 2022. Those are just preliminary. But we do know that we're seeing an increase in landings, um, at least in 2020 and 2021, we did see an uptick of abundance in our survey. Um, but we really can't update the stock assessment until we get a couple more years of data um, for 915 because we lost 2020 mm -hmm. um, to the pandemic we weren't able to sample. So we, we do need to get more time before we can rerun the stock assessment. And there can be outstanding uh, reasons why the, right. the harvest might not match the rebuilding of the stock. Because of because of that, it's just the supplement feels like a knee jerk reaction to the specific years, and we got to be fair to our people that are bringing them in now. That's all. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Commissioner Ryder. So I do think that we have uh, through this process heard some really important issues identified from the industry, but also from others about systematic. Uh, challenges with information. And in effect, I'm going to make the same comment I made before, which is in considering uh, Amendment 2, it would be, I think, especially important to learn from that input and identify ways in which underrepresentation of information might bias the stock assessment and create uh, additional uncertainty in the likely performance of the management measures that we're being asked to adopt. So I think I think in that sense, given that we have said that the um, the the, uh, the next amendment can relate to, it can address those issues, that we ought to be formal about doing that and and pulling out those various factors that have been identified, including underrepresentation of you know, large 
large size class animals and and I'm not going to start the list but those are the things that we have heard again and again and so hopefully that can be part of the uh, amendment process yes if it was going to be part of this amendment process um, we don't the data that data has not been finalized yet so if that was important we would have to put off the discussion on this which to the next meeting which we could do now what i'm what i'm arguing mr chairman is that there are technical ways to address that, that kind of uncertainty in other words as you if one commits to running the stock assessments as uh, a sensitivity analysis that basically says if we're wrong about this or that or the other by this amount or that amount or the other amount then how does that change the output that comes from the model and so I, I think that there's a way to formally introduce the degree of uncertainty that exists in the way that that translates into likely future conditions and so I, I just think that's I feel pretty strongly that that's the case and so uh, I don't think it we have to, to me, that's input into the next amendment. Okay, and of course, keep in mind the next amendment is going to be, what, five years, I believe. So, no, well, when, well, I mean, I mean the one that's under, I'm, I'm not talking about a supplement, I'm talking about the one that's. The one for beginning. next year, excuse me, excuse me, the one for next year. Yes, yes, yes this one. Okay. So where there, again, I'll say it one more time. I, I believe that it, some, um, it's not that they're inadequacies, uh, but uncertainties have been surfaced during this the supplement process that ought to be being addressed directly in the in the amendment two process. And so uh, I'm I'm hoping that that is possible. Okay. And if, and if it's not, that would really be nice to know what those exceptions might be and what would be required in order to to provide adequate information to address those. Okay, I'm sure staff would be glad to entertain your, your concerns over those. Okay, Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no doubt that with the available information that division has that they've made the best recommendation possible with that data. I just have issues with data and that I don't believe may be as concise as it needs to be to help further their decision-making process. I don't believe that back, you know, we had the hurricanes in 16, and that probably bled over to 17, but starting in 18, 19, and 20, you know, we had an abundance of shrimp. And the capture data from those years, you know, is going to be way down because we had people shrimping. I mean, they were making a lot of money shrimping, and they weren't dedicating effort towards that. Uh, I've, I've had endless calls from uh, people who are actually out there on the water most of the time now, and they've seen just massive amounts of mullets. Uh, you know, we've closed down the Upper News River. We can't quantitate or quantify what that reduction right there alone is going to be towards the overall thing. But the thing that bothers me is, you know, everybody that I talk to, everybody that calls me is just screaming about how many mullets they're seeing. And, you know, I guess the final straw the other day I had two buddies of mine that were trout fishing up Slocum and uh, I think I must have been the shock crew or somebody was up there and they were actually shocking in the area and I mean they were they were just they saw the mullets they saw the small mullets the medium mullet I mean they just said there was mullets everywhere from that and I'm like well you know we, we didn't include that data to some extent and it's just it's just that there's a lot of what ifs and we're so close next year to having maybe all this data in place that we can go down this road at FMP, make sure all this, and make sure we're going in the right direction. I mean, if, if we're down, we're going to have to make a change. But it's just like there's so much peripheral data that I don't think has been quantified that actually should be included. And I think the division's done what they should do with what they've got. But I, I just, to start limiting uh, the fishermen back on data that I don't think is 100% concise with everything they could possibly lay into it. I just, I can't support the supplement as close as we are to the FMP. I mean, I'm willing to do anything I can to make that FMP right. But I mean, and if we're wrong and we have to go a little bit further on the FMP, we just got to go. But I just, I can't consider the cuts at the levels we're at now and where we're at now this close to the, 
to the um, end of the FMP process to warrant the supplement. Thank you. Other okay. comments? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for all those comments to Commissioner Cross and Commissioner Shellam. Um, I wanted to address uh, some of the, the thoughts about the landings and the, the hurricane years. Um, so we, we fully um, like acknowledge that, yes, hurricanes or poor weather might have an impact on the, the commercial landings. And so Jeff pulled up this figure here of the, of the commercial landings time series. And you know we do highlight that some of those low years were years that had um, significant weather events that occurred. Um, the thing to keep in mind, the way that those landings are input into the model, we don't use that as a measure of abundance. We use that as fishery removals. That's fishery mortality. That's fishing mortality that's occurring on the stock. So in those years when the commercial landings were decreased, um, that should be a lower fishing mortality. Um, depending on what the overall population size is. So in some ways, those decreases in landings might actually be a benefit to the stock moving forward. Um, we fully acknowledge that we've seen an uptick in abundance in our survey data in recent years, and we've also seen that in commercial landings data. That doesn't mean that fishing, uh, that fishing mortality has decreased. Overfishing could very well still be occurring in those years, just because the, the landings increase doesn't mean that everything might be fine here. Um, so we won't know that until we actually were, ab were able to update a stock assessment or whenever that might occur. Yes, Mr. Cross. Well, that's, that's my concern. The very words, we won't know that. And I, and I understand where you're coming from on the assessment where you're at. And the we won't know that is what's got me bothered because it's just like in your stock assessment. Uh, and I'm no biologist. I think I think I know where Commissioner Rader's coming from. But, I mean, when we're dealing with mullet, that's a totally different animal than most of these fish we're studying on stock assessments. Do, you, do we have or will we have a specific stock assessment tool directed at nothing but mullet rather than mixed in the future? And, I mean, is that something that we can break out or whatnot? Because the don't we, know, we don't know that is what's got me bothered. I'm not sure I understand that last comment. Um, this stock assessment that we did was specific to striped mullet. It's not a mixed assessment. Okay. Director. Well, Dan, Dan pretty much covered it. I, I, well, we do know that. We know the stock assessment results say they were overfished and overfishing. That's what we do know. And I think to Dan's point, what we don't know is how the landings that we that people keep pointing to because they have increased how that may impact stock abundance and we won't know that until we update the stock assessment but land increased landings does not and dan said this mean that abundance is going to increase it just simply does not mean that and so um you know we we may be holding out for something that just isn't going to happen uh, just because the landings go up. So I just need to make sure we're clear on that. Okay. Other questions and comments? Commissioner Roller. I just think it's pertinent to point out here in this debate that there's definitely been a, a trajectory towards these strike net fisheries by our commercial fisheries, right? I mean, I know we can say here, we can say there's less participants, but there's definitely more trips. We've also seen that in the speckled trout fishery, the red drum landings, as well as as well as well you know, Spanish mackerel. These are the more mobile gillnet fisheries, correct? So there's a lot more, I mean, the trips for the last couple years are, I don't wanna say historic highs, but they're really high, right? Yeah. yeah the, I uh, did include a figure here that is just uh, run around gillnet trips and participants from 1994 to 2021. Um, it's remained fairly level until we get to about 2020 and then uh, trips really spike. And, and in 2021, we saw a pretty significant spike in participation for that uh, gear. And it's not totally, and it's, we can't say why that is. We can only speculate. But it definitely seems to be the changing face of our North Carolina fisheries could potentially be pushing people into some of these more open fisheries. It's not really a question. It's more like just an open comment. So. <laughs> All right. Any more questions or comments? Mr. Shelton. Um, on that note, this is like an entry-level 
fishery that's feasible for younger people to go and start fishing and uh, be a part of this industry. I don't want to take that away from them. Okay. That might be why there are more more participants, is what I'm saying. And everybody was shuffling around for money after 2020, and maybe they're like, oh, my God, I wish I could fish, and they could buy a small boat and get out there. Okay, anything else? Any other questions of staff or comments? All right, thank you all for your presentation. We need to move into a um, fact. Y'all might not want to go anywhere just in case we have some questions. Okay. Uh, that would be a shock if we did. Um, so we're going to go into the um, supplement of Amendment 1 of the Stripe Muller FMP. Um, you want to take us through that? or Okay. Great. Wonderful. Better you than me. Yeah. So I'll introduce us again, but good afternoon. I'm Dan Zaff. I'm with the Fisheries Management Section based out of our Washington office um, and I'm one of the co-leads for Stripe Mullet. And with me today is Jeff Dobbs, who is based out of our Central District office, and Willow Patton, who's also based out of our Washington office. And so we've already started the discussion, but we're going to talk about Supplement A to Amendment 1 to the Stripe Mullet FMP, which would implement temporary management measures to end overfishing of the North Carolina Stripe Mullet stock. So here's a rundown of what this presentation is going to cover. We'll start by discussing results of the striped mullet stock assessment completed by the division in 2020, which prompted development of Supplement A. Then we'll discuss the need for temporary management measures, review the timeline of Supplement A, and then we'll summarize public comment. We'll end by reviewing the DMF recommendation and the preferred recommendation from the MFC in November 2020. So the division completed a benchmark stock assessment of the striped mullet stock in 2022. Results of the peer-reviewed assessment indicate overfishing is occurring and the stock is overfished. So the spawning stock, which is shown on this figure, is below the threshold in 2019, indicating the stock is overfished. There aren't enough mature females in the population to maintain the stock. And the stock has been overfished since 2002 and below the target since 1991. And so this figure shows fishing mortality rate calculated by the model. Fishing mortality in 2019 is above the threshold, indicating overfishing is occurring, which means the catch rate is too high. The stock has been experiencing overfishing since 2012, and fishing mortality has been above the target since 2000. So as statutorily required, management measures will be developed through Amendment 2 to end overfishing and rebuild spawning stock biomass. Development of Amendment 2 is underway, with final adoption and implementation tentatively scheduled for 2024. And because of the timeline for FMP development, there'll be a four-year gap between the terminal year of the stock assessment and implementation of management measures. A supplement allows for implementation of temporary management measures to supplement Amendment 1 until Amendment 2 is adopted if the DEQ Secretary determines it is in the interest of the long-term viability of the fishery. Given the stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring, ending overfishing immediately is in the long-term interest of the fishery because it begins rebuilding spawning stock biomass and meets the statutory requirement to end overfishing in two years. A 9.3% redu reduction in total removals is needed to reduce F to the fishing mortality threshold, which ends overfishing, and a 33% reduction in total removals is needed to reduce F to the fishing mortality target. Temporary management measures developed in the supplement will be implemented via the proclamation authority of the DMF director. So looking at the timeline of how we got where we are at now, in May 2022, the MFC reviewed results of the 2022 striped mullet stock assessment, indicating the striped mullet stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring. In August 2022, the DMF director requested approval from the MFC to request secretarial approval for a supplement to Amendment 1 to the Stripe Mullen FMP, and there were no objections. In September 2022, the DEQ Secretary determined it is in the interest of the long-term viability of the Stripe Mullet fishery to develop temporary management measures to supplement the Stripe Mullet FMP until Amendment 2 is adopted. Following this conclusion from the DEQ Secretary, division staff developed draft supplement A 
and presented the draft and recommendations to the MFC in November 2022. At that time, the MFC selected their preferred management option, which was a season closure from November 7th to December 31st to achieve a 2022.1% harvest reduction and end overfishing. The division received public comment through an online form and by mail from December 19th, uh, 2022 through January 19th, 2023. In addition to online public comment, the division also gave the standing and regional MFC advisory committees the opportunity to provide input on Supplement A when they met in January 2023. And that brings us to where we're at today. Uh, we'll, be, we'll present a summary of public comments received and the MFC will vote on final adoption of Supplement A. The division received 65 public comments via an online form very few comments indicated outright support for the supplement. Most comments expressed opposition to Supplement A, with the most cited reasons for opposition being skepticism of stock assessment results, the economic impact of the season closure would have on the commercial and recreational fisheries, and in particular, bait shops. Many comments in opposition also expressed an interest in excluding recreational harvest or use from the closure. Some comments did not indicate clear support for or in opposition to Supplement A. These comments included support for gillnet closures in the newsome Pamlico Rivers or complete removal of gillnets. Additional comments included support for allowing cast net harvest during the closure, and one comment proposed an alternate season closure from November 27th to December 31st. The DMF recommended a 20 to 33% reduction to exceed the threshold and either meet or approach the target. This reduction level increases the probability of, at a minimum, ending overfishing, even if there is variability in fishing effort, market demand, stripe mullet availability to the fishery, or recruitment. To achieve this reduction, the DMF rep recommended option one, a season closure from October 29th through December 31st, or option two, a season closure from Dece November 7th through December 31st. The MFC selected option two, a season closure from November 7th to December 31st as their preferred management option to achieve a 22.1% reduction and end overfishing. The MFC action today is to vote on adoption of Supplement A to the Stripe Mullet FMP. If Supplement A to the Stripe Mullet FMP is adopted, the season closure will be implemented in 2023 via proclamation authority of the DMF director and will remain in place until adoption of Amendment 2. The DMF will continue development of Amendment 2 to the Stripe Mullet FMP to fully explore all management options and address long-term sustainability and management of the Stripe Mullet stock. Amendment 2 is tentatively scheduled for adoption in 2024. And with that, we'll take any questions uh, about the supplements. Um, and we also have the contact information for the leads up on the screen now as well. Okay, um, we'll open it up for some discussions. I just want to remind everybody that we are statutorily bound to end overfishing. And at our last meeting, uh, we unanimously approved the 22.1% reduction. So from there, I'll take any sort of discussion or any sort of comments that might be want to be made. No comments, no discussion. Oh, I didn't see. Okay. Yes, sir. I mean, we had some good discussion um, about this last time. The November closure, would you say that impacts mostly the row fishery? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, this is, I mean, to really get into the weeds about it, I mean, this is a bizarre, this mullet fishery is a very bizarre fishery to me, right? And what do I mean by that? It's, it's still a row fishery, right? We're still harvesting a spawning fish for their row while they're on their spawning run. And furthermore, we're, it's like an Asian export market. It's not some local fresh seafood. So I'm surprised there isn't a little bit of outrage over that given all the concern I heard this commission have regarding fishing for striped bass while they're spawning, or, you know, anger about seafood exports and whatnot. This is not, like I said, not a local seafood. So I don't really know where I'm going with that. But um, I have less of a problem ending over fishing when we're capping off the end of the year, particularly as it impacts mostly this row market. 
Yeah. Any other comments? Somebody have no? I guess I Okay, the chair will entertain a motion. Somebody cares to make one. Nobody's gonna make a motion. I'm gonna make one. Okay, Commissioner Cross. I'm gonna make a motion we vote to supplement down and continue with the FMP process. Is there a second to this? Anna Shalom seconds it. Okay. Okay, so that's your motion as you made it. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, Councillor Reynolds, would you kind of give us a legal perspective on what we do next? Yes, Mr. Chairman. You, you have a duly made motion, a second, and I know most of you are, all, are already aware of this, but just as a quick reminder, because these are recommendations by the division director, uh, for ending overfishing, the statute requires that there be a supermajority to vote those recommendations down, a supermajority being six members. And so a simple majority is needed to approve, a supermajority needed to disapprove. Thanks, sir. Any further discussion on this motion? Commissioner Roller. I'm opposed to this motion. I'm opposed because it's going to potentially increase overfishing and I do not believe it's the best course of action for sustainability for the resource, right? And I do have great concern. I think, you know, closing it in November and preventing the allowance of bait for the recreational community for very little biological benefits gonna make a lot of people mad, but sometimes you have to make these sacrifices. You know, this reminds me a lot of the, the ancient, um, I, I, Council's not going to like me bringing this up, but it reminds me of the flounder supplement process, only in the fact that if we had been able to implement some of those measures earlier, maybe the decisions we made farther down the line wouldn't have had to be so drastic. So for that reason, I don't think this is a safe or precautionary approach, and I can't support it. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Commissioner Rader. So I, I want to say first that uh, obviously the stock assessment is flawed. But truthfully, all stock assessments are flawed. They always are going to be. And everyone that I've been part of, which is a lot over a lot of years, has had similar, even parallel arguments raised about it and including the lack of up to the moment uh, data. And that's just a, a nature of the beast. So the, I, you sh I think you should take and learn from those comments uh, about the special needs that the stock assessment continues and folds in going forward. But, but to me, the, uh, um, the pattern in both uh, stock abundance, biomass and fishing rate is nonetheless compelling. And so I would be very uh, uh, afraid to, uh, to choose not to act in row season this year and perhaps in row season next year, if in fact the, stock is in those, that, that condition. And I, I've got to say that I think we together uh, chose a, a less impactful option, maybe even one that was arguably not legal in the sense of not really comporting with the requirement to uh, eliminate overfishing and choosing an option that is in the low 20s percent reduction, which is above the threshold, but by no means above the, you know, the the target that's really needed to rebuild the stock. So even though I am conflicted about the uh, biases and some of the data that have been used in the stock assessment, nonetheless, I think it would be, we would be remiss not to act upon it, to delay for in effect for one or two years, meaning the fall row season on mature females, uh, given that input. In some ways it's almost a, 
a slap in the face of the science infrastructure. And, and as the scientist on the panel, I can't, I can't support that. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Chairman, I've, I've got something. Ah, yes, Commissioner McNeil. I'd like to make a substitute motion, if possible. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to accept the division's recommendations for Supplement A. Mean, you mean option two? Right. Okay. All right. There's a motion made and there's a second by second Commissioner Roller. By Commissioner Roller. Now, um, I want to turn it back over to council to tell us how this vote is different from the other vote. Well, and Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'm sure uh, to take a step back, I'm sure Commissioner Rader was using hyperbole when talking about doing something not legal. Uh, <laughs> always gets my attention. Uh, 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 well, I'll of course, it, 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 given my well-known JD degree that would, yeah, that's that right. would qualify me to give legal advice in the state of North Carolina right. to anybody. It's, that, or, that, JD, or, that, that, honorary, or lack thereof. that honorary JD degree is probably better than my not-so-honorable uh, biology degree, which I don't have. Uh, so uh, the substitute motion is to approve option two, which is what, what was, um, is to approve option two, which is what was sent out. It's a substitute. Uh, so you'll need to vote on this uh, and then return to the main question. But because it's in line with the recommendations, you only need uh, a regular majority to ultimately approve this. And of course, as a substitute, you only need a regular um, majority to vote to substitute, uh, to approve the substitute. To translate, this takes five votes to pass. The motion that uh, Commissioner Cross made would take six votes to pass. So we have a substitution motion, substitute motion on the floor, duly seconded. Any further discussion on this substitute point motion? Of point of clarification. Yes. Um, <clears throat> it, if this motion is voted on and accepted, it it is the it, it, do we vote on it again, or is this just the motion we're voting on? When do we vote on it again? So a vote on the substitute will return to the main, main question, okay, the main either question. as substituted or uh, uh, if this did not uh, prevail. Yeah. Then it would be back to the main motion. I'll say it's talking about in the future, but it's today. But today, so yes. Okay. So right. One yeah, vote yeah, on yeah. the motion to substitute, substitute and then motion. And vote whatever again action on happens at that, you'll be back to to the main question. Right. Okay. Which you'll need to to then address. Right. Which would take five votes also. Right. And that's because the parliamentary procedures allow for if a substitute motion passes, it can be further amended, but only such that it not be. It would be added to and not be conflicting with yeah. what, what was substituted. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yes, I, sir. I, I, I can make it more confusing if you No, want. no, no. I, thank you for the clarification. I, now I'm, I have a question for this. Um, for so during the presentation that we just got, we had two options that you showed. But in um, November, I'm trying to think of where I'm at in time here. We had three options, one of which had a smaller um, percentage reduction. However, it did bring us um, <clears throat> to it, it. I'm sorry if I, my language is not correct here. It uh, the 10 point. What is it? 10 point whatever percent on option three. 10 point this, nine. Yes, 10 point nine is in your decision documents. Uh, decision don't have a page but whatever page that is um, table six right um, but I was just wondering why it was taken out of that presentation um, um, we have the slide up now okay uh, yeah that's what a more more or less what I was looking for so the 10.9 percent will bring us to the threshold that we're looking for um, of any point of reduction which essentially will add a week to the <clears throat> fishing season. Um, 
and I just wanted to point that out that we did have an option three and that it was sort of misleading to seem that the option three had gone away and and, and I just wanted to point that out to the rest of the commission here that um, we particularly might not have been bound to options one and two. Well, option three never really went away. It was at our last meeting that this commission voted unanimously for option two. That's what we chose. Just, just as your preferred, what, what you're saying is what you yeah. wanted to do, but not that it rolls out, yeah. uh, rolls, uh, rules out other things. Just this is other three options. This is what we would prefer to do. Yeah. Okay. Another point of Commissioner. clarification, yes. if I may. Going back to the last meeting, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't option one or two the division's recommendation? No? I mean, like, so it would take in a supermajority to do three, is that correct? That's what I'm going to. No. Mr. Chairman, if I may. I, I don't see it that way um, because the, recommend, the, the stated need is to end overfishing. And what the division said was 10.9 will end overfishing, but in order to address the further uncertainty and to ensure that we get the reductions needed, they are recommending their, their sort of, in par, the commission's parlance, they would prefer you to go with number two, but if option three didn't end overfishing, then it wouldn't really have been a valid option in the first instance. So option three still gives you an end to overfishing but not at the same levels. And the way it was described to me mm -hmm. is option two gets you between the target and the threshold, but three still meets the threshold. Yeah. And you see it says that there are season closure options. So this is a division document. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so I suppose it, it would not require a supermajority. Uh, to go to with three. To three. Yeah. Because it still ends over fishing, which is what the group director says has to be addressed right. okay any other questions or comments on the substitute motion if you'll put that back up please okay there we go all right, there being no other questions, uh, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Cross? Nay. Commissioner Blanton? No. Commissioner Gardner? Commissioner Huggins? No. Commissioner McNeil? Yes. Commissioner Rader? Yes. Commissioner Roller? Yes. Commissioner Shellum? No. Commissioner Bizzle? Yes. Oh, Chairman Bizzle, pardon That's me. That's all right, I'm both. Yes. So this motion fails um, four to five, which takes us back to the previous motion. Is there any questions or comments on this? All right. Roll call vote. And we have to have set, uh, six to pass this. Commissioner Cross? Aye. Commissioner Blanton? Aye. Uh. Commissioner Gardner? Aye. Commissioner Huggins? Aye. Uh. Commissioner McNeil? No. Commissioner Rader? No. Commissioner Roller? No. Commissioner Shellum? Aye. And Chairman Bizzle? No. So this motion uh, fails by a lack of a supermajority. So where does that leave us? Well, we still have option three that is, could be considered and passed with just five votes. And if anybody cares to uh, make a motion on this, if not, like I said, we're statutorily uh, charged with uh, ending overfishing, and we'll uh, take this up, try to come up with something for the next meeting. But we do have option three. I'll make a motion. Okay. Okay, to, to do what your motion is to approve option three. Is that what it is? Yes, yes, sir. All approve right. option three. All right. Is there a second to that? I'll second it. Second, Commissioner Roller. Any discussion? This gets us, we had to have nine, I believe it's 9.1% reduction to end overfishing. Is that correct? And this gets us to 
10.9, so little little wiggle room, not a bunch, not, not enough. Okay, Commissioner Roller. I, I know I seconded this. I'm, I'm not crazy about it. I just feel that we're now kind of pigeonholed here to do something, yeah. and we should be doing more for the resource, and I don't think this is enough. Just want to state that on the record. Fair enough. Commissioner Bland. Uh, while I'm not absolutely in favor of any option at the moment because of various reasons, I'd like to remind the commission that we took action within another FMP that potentially benefits the mullets more so than any other fish by not allowing the continued use of gill nets in a certain two areas of the state. Where the mullets seem, seem to gather during the summertime, hang out, grow, do what they do before they make their long run. Um, and I think, not to quote um, Commissioner Rader, but even he brought the point at the last meeting that um, paired with option two could be quite a bit more of a reduction. Um, and that was a large concern to me as I thought about it in coming into this meeting. Um, while I do share some sentiment about southern flounder and how that process went years um, back and forth of um, delayed management and it got to the point that it is today to where uh, essentially the commercial fishery has been decimated um, I would hate to see that again. As a commercial uh, fisherman and a representative of the, of the industry, I do not want to see uh, striped mullet go by way of southern flounder. Um, this fishery is very unique. It, it's When I look at the landing sheet, and, and the various weather events, um, looking from 2016, you had Hurricane Matthew. 2018, there was uh, Hurricane Florence. 2019, Hurricane Dorian. 2020, COVID. These were huge and, and very impactful events to the mullet fishery, undoubtedly. Paired with shrimp abundance between 18 and 20, um, you can see participation continuously moving downward. Um, and then with the southern flounder action that was taken, I believe that's what has um, elevated the level of trips in 2021 and 22. So I just wanted to point out that it's not absolutely a bad thing to um, look at it as, oh, this is the lowest option, because this, this commission did take action, which I reluctantly say now that could possibly benefit the mullets through another M FMP. So I, I, I don't encourage the commissioners to look at um, the 10 point whatever percent um, negatively because of actions that we took in peripheral. Um, so to not be feeling like um, we're backed into a corner, we have arrived at option three. And um, while I hate to say it, you know, I, I, I do feel like some action should be required at the moment to avoid what we have learned in the past in history of avoiding action. So with that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my comment. Thank you. Anybody else? Commissioner Krauss. Um, Unasked Division, is there any other information they can bring us to help clarify some of these points, maybe between now and our next meeting? I'm just asking, is there further data Further information. I mean, I, I got a question now for uh, Dan that, you know, it just popped in my mind. How did the, 
How did the beach sampling crew do this year? What kind of data did we get off of that? Uh, you mean like what our samplers were able to get from right. the beach sand fishery? Uh, I know they were able to get some samples from the catches, but I, I'm not aware of uh, at this point because those landings haven't been completely finalized what the landings from the beach sand fishery were, but we were able to get some samples. From right, them. but I'm just saying what were you able to, because this and it's the fifth, fifth largest capture in history down our shore. And, I mean, you would think you'd have a multitude of data from the beach crew especially down through there. And I'm just saying, you know, is there anything else that can be brought to us before the next meeting that will perhaps clarify any of these points? I'm just, I'm just making that question. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I completely understand your, your, your question. Um, so... I'll give an example. Uh, in 2018, we brought pieces of data to the commission based on our commercial landings trigger triggering. Um, we brought them pieces of data, each, each survey broken down individually to look at the trends. We looked at trends in the commercial fishery, the commercial landings. Uh, we looked at the size structure. We looked at the egg structure. But really, that only gives us like, a, a, like bits and pieces of information the stock assessment is what puts all of those pieces of information together and gives us a stock status. So we could bring you additional information in May. We could break all of the, these inputs to the stock assessment down piece by piece and present those to you, but that's not going to tell us has the stock status of striped mullet changed. It's not going to tell us if overfishing has ended. It's not going to tell us is overfishing continued, and it's not even going to tell us the uh, spawning stock biomass if that's increased at all. It'll give us trends, which are great to look at, but those are all just pieces of that go into a stock assessment and give us that actual complete picture of what the population is. Yeah, director. And, and just to remind the commission, this these stock assessment results are the same stock assessment results that you're going to be developing the amendment on. Yes. Nothing is going to change. It's still going to be overfished, and it's still going to be overfishing okay. as you go into the amendment development process. Okay. All right. Commissioner Roller, did you have something else? No, never mind. Okay. Anything else from anybody? Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Rader. Yeah. So just, and again, for the record, and I will vote to support this measure, but I am skeptical that it will actually comply, and that has to do with the the way that effort re, uh, responds to um, to regulations of this type, you know, we've heard abundantly that that uh, location, uh, uh, longitude, uh, latitudinal effort you know, is tied to season, and so I think it's it's likely, especially with the influence of aggregated and large scale operations, that we may not come close to achieving the 10% reduction that is. Uh, estimated associated with this. So I'll just say that it's risky and it's also risky based on the fact that we've used uh, targeting for um, spawning stock biomass that is in, also inherently risky given the uncertainties associated with climate. So I, I'll, I'll vote for it, but I do think that it is uh, would, would then behoove us to move on expeditiously through uh, the next amendment, because I, I really don't think we're going to have done uh, enough. And hopefully people will not capitalize or plan their fishing efforts for future years based on a pattern that in my scientific view is unlikely to persist uh, automatically. I mean, it might be that, the, that things are changing in ways that work the other way and we're lucky, but I sure wouldn't bank on it. I wouldn't invest in it. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Commissioner Roller. Just real quick, I just want to reiterate again Commissioner Rader's comments. I really appreciate it, and I'm on the same boat as him. I'm very skeptical that this is going to do enough to rebuild this fishery, and I'm concerned that we're going to pay for it down the line. And I feel I feel like I've been forced into this position, unfortunately. So okay. that's it. Commissioner Blanton. Oh, just to clarify more, um, we're working on two separate things here. We have this supplement, which is going to be – what the director has mentioned multiple times, and correct me if I'm wrong, a one-year, hopefully one-year item here that we can um, just put in place. We're, we're going to work on the amendment and all the intricacies that come along with that. 
it may be hopefully not as painful to deal with it for a year before we can get to some more reasonable um, management options, hopefully, that would uh, mitigate some of this um, argument that we're having about what this supplement is going to do to impact. This is not in my eyes what I see as a permanent measure or doing not enough. I think this is doing something um, which in the history is probably pretty proactive of a MFC commission of not kicking the can so much. So um, my argument would be against that it's not enough. I think it's a start is what I would call it. Not doing not enough. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anything <laughs> else? Okay, if not, roll one call. More, one more. One more. One more. I, okay. Yes, sir. I would just like to say that the the reduction is a start, but again, it doesn't address some of the unintended consequences that came up because this was a supplement. And and so it's still putting people in a really tough position throughout the state. And I go with what my fellow commissioners are, are, are voting on, but I still feel like there's an impact here that was unintended that is, is not going to be reduced that much. I mean, we are, we are again, 10% reduction. We know that that's not, that's not where we want to be with this. But I wished that with the entire, if I had known about a supplement, I think I would have been a little more active or proactive in making suggestions that would make this a little more pal palatable across the board. And the biggest piece of input that I got from the people that I've talked to is that it came as a surprise that one of the biggest problems with the supplement was that they didn't, un they, they felt blindsided. And, and I, I, I just have a hard time with that. I, I'm going with the commission. I'm just, I'm just saying what I've picked up on from from both Carteret County and Dare County. Director. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman and <clears throat> Commissioner Gardner. I certainly appreciate your comments, and I'll, I'll refer to what Laura says quite frequently. This is a blunt tool. We talk about this uh, quite a bit, and that the supplement is a blunt tool to immediately address overfishing instead of waiting until the amendment is, is done. So we feel like it is the best um, way to go. As far as the stakeholders being blindsided by this, the supplement uh, has been something that we have been talking about for months now because of the meetings. And as well, we have advertised it as best we can. It went out for public comments, which we don't have to do, but we did that anyway. And we're even able to take it uh, in front of our um, advisory committees uh, for review and comment as well. So. We feel like we have definitely done our part on that end, um, although it's hard to reach everybody, and we certainly understand that. And again, this is just a tool for us and for you to be able to address overfishing right away instead of waiting until an amendment is, is completed. But it is a blunt, a blunt tool. We, we said all along, staff was very clear that this just impacts the road mullet fishery, and we've heard the comments that it impacts mostly uh, the southern part of the state potentially in, in some situations. So we understand that there are other fisheries and other needs and other approaches to be able to manage this fishery, and those will be looked at in the amendment. So thank you. Thank you. If there's no other discussion, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Cross? Nay. Commissioner Blanton? No. Commissioner Gardner? No. Commissioner Huggins? No. Commissioner McNeil? Yes. Commissioner Rader? Yes. Commissioner Roller? Yes. Commissioner Shellum? No. And Chairman Bissell? Yes. This fails four to five. Now, I don't know what that means since we're not doing our statutory duty. Chairman, Please comment. In, in my view, it means that uh, the matter stays in front of the commission because you don't have a majority to take action to end overfishing. 
Um, it would seem to me that in the absence of that majority, um, the commission it would continue to be in front of the commission uh, and perhaps be considered again, continue to be considered at your next meeting. This will be on our agenda at the next meeting. Um, I do want to remind everybody, I'm, I'm not scared of being sued or, you know, honestly, it's not a heck of a lot that scares me. Uh, not even the boogeyman at night. But we're not doing our job. And we should be ashamed of ourselves. And this will not help out the lawsuit that we are currently facing in court right now. No, never mind. Okay, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> but this is not a good thing to do. We need to do our jobs, and we're putting it back on the agenda for our next meeting. We'll see where that takes us. Okay, um, that brings us to the end of the day. I'll see you all back here at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning.